Die het sitas tivets and CET. Can you check if your colleagues are within the mist? If you're missing somebody who's supposed to be here, can I give you five minutes just to grab him or her inside? Yeah. I'm giving you just five minutes to make a call, WhatsApp, and check how far are you. Okay, from our side, we're missing Honorable Litsy. Uh, can Ashas assist us? There's a guy outside with olive green suit uh, and beige. From our side, while you're still checking your side, here we just shot Honorable Litsy. Okay, President of AMA 2000, he, he's in now. Not the ANC Youth League, but 2000. Uh, okay. Honorable uh, Bafuze, he's wearing the Tupan. Check. A suit check outside there. Uh, can we be assisted to get one of our members here? Bafuze Yabo. So, can we get security to assist us? At least I have given you identification. He's wearing a two-piece, check two-piece. Uh, I'm doing this so that you are able to check your colleagues as well. Can you call Bafuz? Uh, you know this arts a life thing can mess up. So we must be safe. Um, all right. Uh, good morning, colleagues, honorable members, uh, D and all stakeholders present today. My name is Honorable Jane Mananeso. I've been tasked today to do just two items. One in terms of our program would be opening by myself, and the other one would be on apologies because uh, we are in the parliamentary program and parliament sittings rules applies. So I only have two items that one has been tasked. And one is the one that I would start with in terms of checking if people who are supposed to be here are here. So that if there's somebody who has just got in by excitement of penis can excuse us. So I'm just going to check by the show of hands in terms of different sectors that we are expecting here today. And then, as I indicate, which sector one would want to check if they are inside, you would just raise your hand, uh, regardless of the authority that one has in the sector or institution. So now I would want to check if our 21 sitters are here. If you come from the sitters, can you raise your hand so that we can see you face to face? Yeah, I can see you are not even coming close to 20. Uh, as I'm doing this, check other members from your sector. Where are they? How far are they? Oh, all right. Uh, you know, it's election time. So, Zivese, it is important. Uh, I think these two gentlemen are saying that to me. Let people Zivese. Let us see face to face, eye to eye. 
so that we know that people that we are paying, they are not ghosts, but they are here. Uh, as I said, let me start again. People from CITAS, can you rise and then greet? Thank you. Can we have Tivet Branch? <laughs> you, now, Honorable Lydia wants me to embarrass you. I don't want to call numbers. I'm calling branches. Yeah. So it's Tivet, right? Okay, you can sit. Uh, CET colleges. Okay. Yeah, I see uh, the guy there with Calvin Klein brand. Uh, I think you didn't get the memo, right? That this is a parliamentary sitting and we've got rules in terms of how we wear. Unless you are EFF, you will wear a red overall. But if you are from other stakeholders and sectors, we are expecting to look honorable. We'll just pardon you because I know that you are from CETs. Uh, but I'm just sharing, you know, this is our last day seeing your face. So we need the parliament. We are able to know how to dress when you go to parliament. Um, I want to check now um, the PSET stakeholders, SAWUS, SAFETA, TVET CGC, SABCO, USAF, Higher Health. any from those branches, you must rise and just greet. Ah, hmm? uh, Let me check as well. Uh, now, NSFAS Abastrupayo. Chair. QCTO. Sakwa. NSF, NHISS. I think, colleagues, you must all rise. And you'll sit after the last stakeholder. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Good driver, Mina. Bulisani, Bulisani. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm doing uh, roll call. I, I can hear on this side, time chair. I, you have written here, Honorable Jane Mananis. Uh, you, you can be seated. Uh, colleagues, that is my task for now, and I would want to give you an opportunity to see those who are in charge in terms of the office of the minister, DG. Oh, okay, no, no, yeah. Oh, I forgot, yay, the, one of the biggest branch universities. Stalani <laughs> Yeah, at least people can see that we have those that are, that are thinking that parliament is not serious. Ne? Yeah, uh, you can see in terms of our ages here, you can undermine if you want to. But we want to thank you for uh, coming into this meeting, as this meeting is our last meeting. You may be seated. Uh, now let me get to those who are making things to happen by weeping from the minister's office. DG and your people, may you rise so that they see you that you've been there from 2019 till now. <laughs> yeah, at, le at least this session gives you time to see Abba Patibe. We know some of you, you haven't seen them for years uh, because of COVID, but these are your people who are in church when we whip them, they whip you. So when, uh, when you are at that level, you must check who do you whip. 
Uh, you, may, you may be seated. Thank you. Um, I think I'm done in terms of my roll call. Uh, I want to hand over to Anele now for apologies. As I indicated, we are in a parliament sitting. So as usual, our committee secretary would give us announcement so that you can take stock in terms of who are the people who are undermining this youthful uh, portfolio committee. Uh, Anele, over to you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, uh, Honourable Members. Um, Chairperson, in terms of the apologies that we received, um, we received apologies from the Minister. Um, we also received apologies from the Deputy Minister. Um, in terms of our public entities, uh, Chairperson, we received apologies from SAQA, including the CHE, because they will be having a board meeting today. today. Uh, uh, so, uh, Chair, so, in terms of the in universities, of the universities the, there's, there's quite a number, a number of universities, of universities that, uh, that uh, submitted the, the apologies, apologies to the portfolio committee. committee. Other universities, Other universities uh, they will be uh, joining will be the joining meeting online. online. So, in, so terms in terms of the of universities, universities that have confirmed, that have confirmed to, to attend, attend the meeting physically today in the meeting, we do have the University of Zululand, the Vice Chancellor, we also do have the University, University of Cape Town representatives. We do have uh, CPUT. Uh, we do have um, so most of the universities in Cape Town. They confirm um, via attendance to the meeting. So, Chair, um, in terms of the numbers, Chair, of the universities that are, are joining online. Um, so, so, so the, the so universities that are here, Chair, is Unizulu, CPUT, University of Pretoria, UCT, UWC, University of Forte, NMU, they were joining online as well as the UNISA. So in terms of the colleges that have confirmed to be physically present here, it's North Link, College of Cape Town, West Coast, Orland, South Cape, Muteo, Obit, Moselela, Oldfields, Tashana, West Cole, Ehlanze, Isaid, Bembe, Machuba, Maluti, Mpulose, Tequin, Ikurulini East, Ikurulini West, Khat Sibande, Skukune, Nambiti. So those are the colleges that are physically present here. So the, the, the others uh, indicated that they will be joining virtually. So, Chair, so, Chair from, from our side, our those side, are the apologies that you got. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank Anne, you Anne, Anne, and let me pass my greetings as well to those who are joining us online. It really shows that there's no excuse why people didn't come to this session because we've got because others we've got online other and we've got yourselves uh, physically. physically. I want to I confirm, want to confirm that, that uh, the home the looks colorful and bright. And, bright, bright, bright. Uh, and I can see that we do have uh, females in numbers here. And as the committee, it's one of the things that we've been speaking about from 2019 till to date. Even though we know that in some spaces, it's it, uh, at a uh, snail pace, we acknowledge the fact that there's a will in terms of ensuring that we transform the space on issues of sex. Um, I would now hand over to the, our host, uh, because we want to feel free, Baba. Those who are wearing jacket, if they feel that they want to take them off, they can do so, but they would only do so after Mr. Stradom. Uh, Chair of Council, can you come before? And I want to thank you for Arts Alive outside there. At least you have bestly ushered Honorable Litsi. Thank you. Honorable Mananisu and Honorable Kachwa. Director General, Dr. Sishi, 
DDG, other important uh, officials, senior government officials, uh, college principals, uh, TVET college representatives, uh, CETA representatives, NSF, QCTO, uh, university representatives, honorable guests, good morning and welcome. On behalf of the Northlink College Council and the Northlink community, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you to this important occasion. An opportunity to reflect, evaluate, and celebrate. Without evaluation and reflection, we can hardly manage effectively, improve, and celebrate our realities and create a successful future for all. We would not be here today if we were not passionate about developing our youth to reach the full potential that they have been created for. Coming from industry, developing a world-class skills base is hugely important. One of our companies called me a few days ago to complain about the rate at which they are hemorrhaging skill. Their staff are leaving in their plane loads for pounds and dollars. This is not necessarily only bad news. It means our skills are in demand worldwide, but it also means that we have to increase the numbers whilst retaining the quality of our training and development. At Northlink, we remain committed to our vision from good to great to continue to play a leading role in meeting the demands for people development in South Africa. I wish you well with the deliberations of the day as we seek to learn lessons from having walked the road to help us build an improved road for a brighter tomorrow for everyone. Go well and enjoy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I think all of you now you can see that so if you want to take off your palms, stiletto, your head, or whatever, you can do so. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the message of hope. Because indeed, when we deal with issues that we deal with in this sector, the first thing that one needs to do is to liberate the mind. And you can only liberate the mind by sharing knowledge, experience, and expertise. So I am very pleased by your opening remarks, more especially when you speak about commitment, when you speak about us meeting the demands of our people. I think we can all agree that is our role as lawmakers and yourselves as implementers, is to meet the demands. As in your lazy as I think we must not do them because it's not about demand and supply yet and that what is it banela today so uh, with those opening remarks one believes that uh, this meeting will sail as usual you know most uh, the pisset uh, sector is one of the sectors where we all believe in sharing ideas and expertise in terms of bettering the lives of our people so i would call for the chairperson of the portfolio committee, our young, young, honorable Mkajwa. Uh, most of us, we call her gone girl. You know, most, uh, the slang, you gone girl. Uh, so uh, she's one of those that we define as gone girl. Uh, I would want to hand over to you, honorable Mkajwa. Uh, I hope all of you 
you got uh, presentations before you so that you get sense and reality that you are in the right space. Uh, we'll be engaging today on the legacy report. Uh, some of you could have been with us from 2019 till to date, and some of you can be before, or actually after uh, 2019, but at least one hopes that you all know and understand what we are capable of as this portfolio committee from different parties, uh, youthful as we are. We only have two young people, Honorable uh, Mkachwa and Khao Khao. Uh, and she, Rua. Uh, you know you are youthful, man. You are not youth. They look, uh, they look youth, but they are not youth. They are eldership, and we've got uh, one of our own uh, must be uh, uh, from 2019 till today, Masbia, she has been youthful because of the majority of youthful people. So I would want to hand over to you, Honorable uh, Mkachwa. Uh, I want to say to you, yeah, you must listen to this legacy report attentively so that you are able to take stock, use it as a mirror if, if Indeed, we did what we were supposed to do as lawmakers and yourself as implementers. So that come the seventh parliament, you are able to do just the best and justice to our people. So uh, I would want to hand over to you, Honorable Mkacha, so that those the seventh uh, administration will be able to know that we are no longer planning we are giving you umpako to say that when that seven administration come, what is it that you can prioritize and take this South Africa forward? Thank you. <laughs> can you please clap hand for Gone Girl? Honorable Mananiso. You know, Honorable Mananiso and Honorable Itia call me a gone girl. I, I don't know what that means, but often when I'm, can someone come and help me? I'm quite tall. Um, so I'm not certain what it means, but I'm their gone girl. Yesterday I declared myself as Honorable Tintualo uh, because in 1994, prior to 1994, yeah, the one who's also that camera, my my the top of my head is is cut out. So whoever's also managing that camera must adjust accordingly. <laughs> um, so so in, yesterday, Parliament debated um, Human Rights Day, and I declared myself Honourable Tintuan. Because Honorable Shikwambana, as a young member of parliament and a young black man under the age of 35, Honorable Chirwa, as a young black woman under the age of 35, she's 30, Honorable Kakao, a young black woman, she's 26, Honorable Mkadra, a young black woman who's 30, would never have been a member of parliament under the apartheid regime. We would have never seen ourselves where we are today, able to represent the millions of South Africans, able to represent millions of young black uh, South African women and men. So uh, it's really an honor for us to be here to present to the sector um, the work that we've done as a portfolio committee in the last five years. Thank you, Honorable Mananiso, for your opening remarks and welcoming us all here. Thank you very much to Mr. Stradom and Mr. Pika for hosting us. Um, parliament has burned, so colleagues would know, well, a part of parliament. You know, when we say parliament has burned, when you say to people, I'm going to parliament, they say, but isn't it bent? Parliament is an entire institution in its 
an entire precinct, and Parliament has not burnt. Only a building in Parliament has burnt. Um, so we, we don't have as much space as we usually have to do the work that we do. Um, therefore, we really appreciate the support we've received uh, from the North Link Tibet College to host us this morning. When we were, pre when we were uh, pre preparing our presentations for the legacy reports of the work the committee has done in the last five years, last week we presented the legacy report focusing on the portfolio on science, technology, and innovation. And the first thing I said was, uh, when I was preparing or when we were preparing, everything that we could think of is are all the issues we often complain about, about your presentations. The, the font is too small. The, uh, the, the writing is going off the page. Your slides are not numbered. Your slides are too long. No, they're too short. They're not comprehensive enough. No, they're not. Oh, we have really put you through a lot in the last five years on something as simple as just how your work is presented. Um, so this Kola Lebanda, it's our first time having to present to yourselves. So I, I have a sense of how you often feel when uh, we call you to the portfolio committee. So be easy on me. Um, Nasfus, we will not be easy with you anymore because, I mean, we've asked you how many times to come and present. NSF, same to you. Uh, and a number of other entities, right? But for us, it's our first time presenting to yourselves, so be a bit easy on us, right? Um, but yes, so um, I want to firstly, before I go into to the report, acknowledge the work that this portfolio committee of young, young vibrant, vibrant young people has done, including yourself, Mam Sibiya, including, including Honorable Bosho, very young, I mean, uh, I don't know if colleagues from Univen are here or maybe they're on the virtual platform. Um, Mam Sibia, Sanbonan, Sanbonan, my colleagues, so Univen. Mam Sibia, if we're doing oversight until 9 p.m. at night, will not say, Amatolo, Wakesep Shum, Oganye, Angaz, Nkinga, Zabantaba, Dala, Ta. O Mam Sibia, Zobakichi, Manati, Guneta, in the darkness that we would be in trying to make sure that we have a sense of the lived realities of young people in our institutions of higher learning. So I want to thank you, Honorable Pele, as you raise your hand. I want to thank you, Honorable Lidzie. I want to thank, Honorable Lidzie, as you, okay, he's blowing you a kiss. I want to thank you, Honorable Yabo. Those colleagues are all from the, uh, sorry, all from the African National Congress definitely would not align to those politics. Um, then I want to thank you, Honorable Shikwambana. I want to thank you, Mam si Honorable Shikwambana of the EFF. I think the, the attire is quite clear. Um, Honorable uh, uh, Sibia from the African National Congress. Honorable Chantal King from the Democratic Alliance, who also serves as, on this portfolio committee as the shadow minister of the Democratic Alliance to this committee. And lastly, I want to thank you, Honorable Mananiso, um, the whip of the African National Congress to this portfolio committee. Can we please give these members of uh, the committee a round of applause? <laughs> Often when we call you to come and account, uh, people will say, yeah, but you can't let them present for so long, Che. You know, I get, I get serious whipping behind the scenes, you know. Um, I'll get texts, they've been preparing for, they've been presenting for too long. And it's always very difficult for me because how do you limit a person to 30 minutes to present a full year, year's worth of work? Then all we say to you is present the, the entire annual report in, in 30 minutes. It's, it's impossible. So it's also going to be impossible for me to present five years of work in 30 minutes. So please feel comfortable. If you need to go to the restroom, go to the restroom. If you need to grab some water and some refreshments, North Link Tivet College has made sure that we have all of that. But do not be disruptive. Last week, uh, D Deputy Minister Putimela had joined, Puti Manamela had joined us physically, and he arrived and was very disruptive. Um, but uh, of course, it's in the nature of the DM to be youthful 
and that is why the TVET sector has been as vibrant as it has been under this uh, sixth administration. Sixth administration. So I think we can go to the slides. Um, Anele, I don't know where you are. I can't see Anele. Where? Okay, who, who's who's operating the slides? At the back. Where the, where's the operation of slides taking place from? Who, who's, say, who's doing the click? Oh, there's a thing here. Oh, okay. Found it. <laughs> okay, let's stay around. There we go. Okay, cool. So I'm in charge. Um, so the purpose of the report um, is that the report provides an overview of the activities the committee undertook in the sixth parliament, the outcome of key activities, as well as any challenges that emerged during the period under review. It summarizes the key issues for follow-up during the seventh parliament and concludes with recommendations to strengthen operational and procedural processes to enhance the committee's oversight and legislative roles in the future. Oh, this is so tricky. I'm trying to manage, <laughs> I'm trying to manage moving that for you guys and moving this for me, so bear with me. Right, so, sorry, okay, it's gone now, okay, remember I'm going to ask you to click this, because I think that's, the multitasking is a bit too much for me. All right. Um, so colleagues would be aware that before the sixth administration, in the fifth administration, we had two departments. The departments, well, we had two ministries. Um, but now the two departments, the Department of Science and Innovation and the Department of Higher Education are under one ministry. And therefore, we as a committee have also had to do our oversight work under one ministry on these two different departments. Um, our workload has been a lot because we have had to hold to account over 120 reporting and non-reporting entities, as well as more than 20 pieces of legislation governing our work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I want to also skip this one because I think we know what the functions of a committee are. So what has really driven um, our period of work between July 2019 and March 2024 um, is monitoring and evaluating the implementation of policy, legislation, and strategic programs, assessing the impact of strategic initiatives, scrutinizing the adherence to the prescripts of good governance, ensuring the broad and inclusive participation of relevant stakeholders, fostering cooperation across government and parliament on matters of common interest. Next slide, please. We can also skip um, you know, the work and what is intended for the department to do, because I think we should all do that. Uh, I think colleagues are also wary of the entities we have, so we can skip that. And again, and again. Right, so if we were to look into the work of the committee administratively, um, next slide please. These are the members that we've had in the committee since uh, 2019. I think many of us may have encountered the leadership of Honorable Mapulani, who was the first chairperson of this committee, and uh, then I would take over in, in 2021. 20, um, so these are all the members that we've had in the committee in the last five years, and really it has been an honor leading with all these members from the different political parties, and I really want to emphasize the fact that regardless of our party lines, we have tried our utmost best to put the interests of citizens at heart, you know, given, of course, that we all have different manifestos coming into Parliament, but really there has been a level of honesty, objectivity, and objectivity in the work that we've done. Next slide, please. We have also sadly lost two members, Honorable Bozoli from the Democratic Alliance and Honorable Jaisa from the AIC, and we really appreciate the work that they did in their lifetime. Next slide, please. So that slide just generally, and those of you who are following on your devices, um, we'll probably see better, but that slide just generally shows you at what point which members came in and left the committee. Next slide, please. Again. So just to bring into context um, 
you know, as we do our work as a portfolio committee, where do we come from as a sector? What, is, what are our current realities as a sector? So when we look at 1994, the head count of students in the sector was sitting at about 495,000. In 2020, we had over 1 million students registered in, in the sector. And I think, DG, um, when you come later, you colleagues can give us what our stats are sitting at, at in 2024 in terms of um, student headcount enrollment. Now, racially, in 94, we had 212 uh, Africans in the system. We had 27,000, sorry, 212,000 Africans in the system. We had 27,000 colored uh, people in the system, 34,000 Indians, and 221 uh, uh, white folk in the system. In 2020, we were sitting at about 800,000 in terms of Africans, uh, 61,000 in terms of uh, colored, uh, uh, colored uh, uh, citizens, 41,000 in terms of Indians, and 118,000 in terms of white folk, and there's a 10,000 that can't be accounted for there. In terms of gender, uh, 94, we had 224,000 women in the system. In 2020, we have uh, 665,000 odd women in the system. And that for us is really uh, what we speak about when we speak about, uh, or what we mean when we speak about gender transformation and the inclusivity of women in the sector. But DG, you will give us Amastetska 2024. I'm putting you on the spot there, but you have all your people in the room to WhatsApp you the most recent stats while I'm saying all of this to you. Um, TVETS, 1998, we're sitting at 302,000 um, odd. And then in 2022, 2023, we're sitting at 589. And this could really be bigger or greater if we had adequate funding for the TVET program. And the committee has been very deliberate about advocating for increased funding for TVET. I don't think there's a single principal, a single chair. I don't think Diriji Zumu can dispute the fact that the committee has been very vocal about us needing to invest in the TVET sector and invest in artisanal training um, to ensure that our economy can have the requisite skills um, to take this country forward. Now, in CETs, again, Diriji Fuchane, uh, another area where you can absolutely attest to the fact that the committee has really made great strides in advocating for, 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 for better, greater focus on CETs. Um, in 1995, we had 258 uh, odd uh, thousand citizens registered in the system for CETs. In 2022, 2023, we're sitting at 266. And this, again, if colleagues can remember, if colleagues who were with us uh, at Invembe, we really took a moment to truly understand why the CET program is not growing. One element of it could be that, well, people are matriculating, right? So they is to some extent a lesser need for what you used to call up abets, you know, a night school and so forth. Because yesterday, actually, when we were debating, one listed uh, the stats on how many, how, how much we've grown in terms of matriculation as a country since 1994. So that there is that relationship. But we do know that there are many young people who are not in education, employment, or training. Therefore, there will be a continued need for CETs to exist. We, we pro problematized the the, the, the mandate of CETs and what CETs should be trying to accomplish or what the mandate uh, of CETs should be to address directly the need that we're seeing uh, uh, in society and so that CETs and what they, what the, what they strive to do is more relevant and, 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 and meets that direct need. Now with NASFAS, and in 1991, DG, you know I was born in 93, right? So in 1991, I was not there, but uh, I, uh, and, and I'm also exposing myself because I've not had time to really delve into this matter. But in 1991, I don't think NASFAS was there, so it would have been like a TEFS, TEFS, yeah, more or less. 
Bengekwa ngitimi. Mama mbe anga ngaba ngu ngaba ngu 91. So, um, those students who were funded by the states in 1991 were only 7,000, and the budget for that was 21.4 million. In 2023, we have over 1.1 million students funded by government using a budget of 47.6 billion. In fact, the recent budget, um, budget of government will indicate that we're spending 53.6 billion rand in 2024-2025 to fund students through NASFAS. Now, other matters we need to consider as we reflect on the work we have done in the last five years is that in 2004 and 2005, there were mergers and incorporations of universities resulting in 24 universities. In 2001, there was a merger of 152 technical colleges, now giving us 50 TVET colleges. Um, in 2009, there was a split of between uh, the split of the Department of Education into the Department of Basic Education and Higher Education. In 2009, we also had CETAs migrated from the Department of Labor towards DHET. In 2012, FET colleges were migrated to DHET and renamed TVETs. And there's so many people, and Abandubai has exposed Amaba Tignina, Chair, you know, uh, what's happening with the uh, council appointment of FETs? How do you want to be a council member of a TVET if you're still calling it an FET? Nani uh, Capricorn, you need to rebrand. I've been seeing too much, uh, when we were in Limpopo, I saw too much branding that was saying FET. Am I FET, our circle colleagues? Uh, I'm a TVET. In 2015, we had uh, the adult education and, and training, uh, or we had adult education and training migrated to DHET and established as CET colleges. And we know we've been really trying to work, you know, in, in shaping what the CET college should be looking like. Um, and then in 1994, we had 109 million, um, or our budget moved from 109 million <laughs> to 113 billion as we stand. And that's massive, and that excludes uh, skills levies. Next slide, please. Now, um, between 2019 and 2024, the focus areas of the committee um, have been as follows. So we started our work in July 2019. 2019-2020 um, was the last financial year of the medium-term strategic framework, 2014-2019. The oversight activities of the committee were informed by Parliament's strategic outcomes as set out in the strategic plan 2019-2024. The strategic outcomes were as follows, deepened democracy, accountable government, strengthened oversight and accountability, enhanced public involvement, deepened engagement um, in international forum, um, strengthened cooperative government, and strengthened legislative capacity. The committee had a capacity building workshop with the department um, in July of 2022, I think. Yeah, somewhere there. Um, for new members to gain an understanding of the uh, post-school education and training sector uh, and on the broader policies of the sector. After the workshop, the committee received sector-specific overviews. Next slide, please. A new MTSF 2019-2024 was tabled. In 2020, the department and its entities tabled new five strategic plans. Informed by the above, the committee identified areas of focus for its oversight. Other areas of focus were also identified from the following. When we considered the strategic plans, budget votes, APPs, quarterly reports, um, the budget uh, review and recommendations reports, oversight reports, ministerial interventions, and the various reports from the various MTTs that are in the sector. We, our work was also informed by the impact of COVID-19, so we worked hard in seeing how COVID-19 was impacting the sector and how we were going to make sure that we save the 2020 academic year and the various budget cuts uh, in the system. Um, we, we, our work was further uh, informed by the Ministerial Community Education and Training Summit that was held. We attended it, we were there, we listened, we get, got a better understanding of 
what is happening in the CET uh, sector. We also attended the TVET College's Strategic Industrial Partnership Summit, where we also advanced some of our interest as, as a committee, but got to understand you know, what some of the challenges around partnership in, in TVETs are, but also so that we're able to make further recommendations moving forward. We've received numerous submissions from stakeholders, whistleblowers in this sector, like are a thing. Um, you know, last week we were reflecting and we're saying, look, we haven't really received submissions from society uh, in terms of, you know, whistleblowing, but in our sector, I mean, just on NASFAS, there was a year where every week someone was getting something in their, in their inbox to say, can you, you know, zoom into this? Can you zoom into that? Um, and so, so we've received a lot of submissions from stakeholders and that really has guided how we've done our work as a committee. Student protests, um, I think it's, you know, sometimes the department, or in fact, the minister in particular would say, I'll give you two weeks, one week, uh, you know, and then we, when you see that, no, that, that, like we don't know what's going on, and you're also receiving pressure from students, you're receiving pressure from citizens saying, what are you doing about that as a committee? But also we've had to work with an understanding of the fact that we need to give the department and stakeholders some time and room to respond before we come in summoning them to, to parliament. But that fine balance between at what point do we call you in, at what point do we allow you to do your work, um, it's really been difficult given the fact that we have societal pressure. You know, sometimes King sends you something, says, we must go to 410 now. <laughs> and you're like, oh, wait, you know, let me, give the, let me give them a little bit of space. And the balance of also not seeing like you're coddling anyone, you know, um, that, that balance has also been very difficult. But I really think we've been as, as responsive as we can be in terms of uh, inter or trying to ma uh, intervene on, on student protests and, and, and absolutely not interfere. Our intention has never been to interfere in any um, program of the department. Ours has always been to, to intervene. Um, we've, our work has also been informed by the midterm review workshop that we had that was greatly supported by yourselves, DG, as a department, and we really appreciate that. And of course, some of the matters that will be referred to us by the Speaker of the National Assembly. Um, in terms of policy and legislation, um, we've had to monitor the enactment of the white paper for post-school education and training through the National Plan for PSET and National Skills Development Plan. We've had to look into the finalization and implementation of policy framework to address gender-based violence in the post-school education and training system and the implementation thereof. We have had to look into the finalization of the policy on internationalization of higher education in South Africa and its implementation plan, monitor the implementation of international agreements, and monitor the progress in the implementation of articulation and recognition of prior learning. And I think we really, I mean, Honorable Litsi, Honorable Mananiso, Honorable, uh, uh, um, sorry, Yabo and Honorable Mananiso, right at the beginning of our term, we did a lot of that, of trying to see how we can better the synergies between, for example, TVET colleges and universities. And that matter continues to persist. We still have students who are saying, I, according to what I've qualified in, in a TVET college, I should be able to receive entrance into a university. And I genuinely think that I'm being judged because I come from a TVET. That, though, that, is a, that is a reflection from a student. That is what a student is saying. They're saying, I, I think I'm anxiety because I'm from a good TVET. My marks are good. Um, I've, you know, I've finished this, this, this qualification. So we really also need to work around, because this is not now a policy matter. This is a it's favoritism. It's what I always say, DG, this catch system. Will it really work? How certain are we that there is an honest deposit of space available in a university to inform how catch operates? How sure are we that there isn't a deliberate fixing of enrollments? Well, Stella and Bosch University, we know colleagues, when we went and we saw, uh, and we met with yourselves in 20, oh, these years, but when we went to Stella and Bosch, we said, your, your applications versus your enrollments, when you look at the racial demographics, it doesn't correlate. 
any, any, any person who looks at those numbers will say how, but this doesn't make sense, right? So we also need to strengthen issues of cooperative governance, which need lots of dialogue, which need honest dialogue, so that our policies can really uh, 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 bear fruit to what they're intended to. Because it's not a policy matter, the policies are clear. It's um, planning and financial governance, We've looked into the MTTs, as I said, for example, as well on students, on the comprehensive student funding model. Um, and the work of the next parliament would be to, to look into its implementation. We've uh, looked into the reprioritization of the one billion surpluses generated by universities on infrastructure efficiency grants to the community education and training sector for infrastructure development. And that's one of our greatest successes in the CETs for us as a committee, as well as other matters that we'll get to at a later stage. And then we've also, of course, considered the budget allocation and expenditures of, depart of the department and its entities. Um, we've looked into the feasibility studies in the establishment of the two universities, and we recently got an, uh, a briefing on that, so in Amanskral and Nikuruleni. Um, and we've made our recommendations. We've monitored progress in the conceptualizing of the master skills plan, and we really hope that the seventh parliament will be able to interact with the, with the finalized plan and look into the implementation thereof. We have monitored progress in the implementation of the economic recovery and reconstruction program skills strategy, so the alignment of our skills planning and our skills strategy to the ERRP program of the, or the ERRR program of the president. We've interacted with uh, agricultural and nursing, nursing colleges from provincial competence, for them to be moved from provincial competence to higher education. There's been a great call by the students in that sector, by even, uh, you know, labor in that sector to say, hey, really we think the future is for these colleges to be migrated and we're taking too long and we need to expedite that. Um, we've, we've looked into the staffing of South African universities, um, the repurposing of unutilized or underutilized public buildings for uh, teaching and learning, especially in the CET sector. And then we've also monitored the rational, rationalization of the higher education management information system, the TVET MIS, the SD MIS, and the CET uh, MIS and potential savings to be realized from this exercise. With NASPAS, we've looked into governance and management, um, monitoring all the way from when we still had an, an administrator. We've looked into all its audit action plans. We've tweaked them, taken it back and fixed them. You know, if there's one entity we have been so committed to, it is NASPAS, and that is because it plays such a crucial role in ensuring access to education for young people who come from uh, homes of the proletariat. In terms of um, implementation of recommendations of the report of the Ministerial Committee of Inquiry on the review of NASFAS, we also looked into that. We've checked the turnaround strategies, the disbursement of funding, uh, asked a lot about, you know, or looked a lot into issues of how we respond and resolve student appeals. Um, we have inter interrogated the ICT-related systems of, of NASFAS. We have looked into NASFAS organizational structure. Uh, we've looked into the accommodation fee cap and the pilot project, which is being rejected by students. You know, and I'm saying it like that because that's how they speak. You know, when we were at Buffalo City College, students said, we reject this pilot project, you know, like Honorable Chirwa, when she speaks in the chambers, just before she says anything, after she's greeted the CIC, the first word after, the first sentence after that, we reject, you know, so students reject the pilot project, DG, they don't want it, and we need to solve that issue. Um, we have interacted with the direct payment system, of which we were very excited about. We were very excited about the direct payment system, or maybe not excited, maybe I'm being too dramatic. We were open to what we were made to understand the direct payment system would achieve. The direct payment system was supposed to make sure we'd see the money goes through fewer hands. The direct payment system was supposed to ensure that we don't have another situation where a student is given a lump sum of money by a service provider appointed by a university. 
that sounded good to us. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. But what has unfolded with the direct payment system and the service providers and the capacity of the service providers to do their work and how long students did not have allowances because of this system is really unfortunate. And it's testament to this situation, this case is testament to the fact that this government has great ideas. And this government is the, is, is, it's the people of South Africa, you know. Before you are CEOs and chairpersons and you are citizens of this country. So citizens of this country have an idea of what this country needs. We have great plans, we can put together great policies, but when it comes to implementation, I say back, I can get a little bit of detail and I say back, I say and so we need to also reflect on that uh, as a sector, that how do we really bring some of the great ideas that are brought forth into fruition so that the sector can benefit from them. We've interacted with the Vaxman's report and on the new loan uh, scheme that's informed by the comprehensive student funding model and continuously interacted with NASFIS on uh, the state of readiness for each academic year and we've always made sure that when we go and do our oversight as a committee, NASFAS is also there so that we can troubleshoot issues as and when they take place. We've interacted with uh, CHE where we've looked into the monitoring, well, we've monitored the work on institutional audits of institutions of higher learning, uh, received reports on institutional audits of institutions of higher learning, uh, looked into the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the budget and operations of the entity, uh, looked into funding requirements, the role of council in improving articulation in the PSET system, and uh, performance and audit outcomes. With SACWA, we've looked into the role of SACWA in managing and maintaining the national qualifications framework and advancing its objectives, monitoring SACWA's work on verification and evaluation of qualifications and part qualifications qualifications, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the budget and operations of the entity, um, and the repositioning of the organization taking into account its financial difficulties, monitoring the retrenchment process and the implementation of the new SACWA organizational structure, monitoring progress in the implementation of the automation project Phoenix. Um, I think there's also a project in uh, I also wanted a project in Katra, but um, then we also looked into the SACWA performance and audit outcomes. Um, QCTO, we looked into the role of the QCTO in managing and maintaining the occupational qualifications framework, progress made in the accreditation of occupational skills programs and qualifications, monitoring the development of occupational qualifications, support provided by the QCTO to TVET colleges, progress made with the approval of the QCTO business case, quality assurance, progress with the purchasing of premises, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the budget and operations of the entity, including funding requirements. And then lastly, we looked into the performance and audit outcomes of the QCTO. Um, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, um, we looked into the funding of postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellowships, as well as the funding of the entity. NSF, NSF once gave me, almost gave me a heart attack at my tender age. Um, it was the briefing we received where there was, what was it, six billion? Five billion. That like no one knew, no one, to her eye, loyal moon to see the gullet address a corner, Sangam Tolly. Hi, man, is this person not a citizen of this country? Like, what do you mean? I remember chairing that meeting from home, and you know, now uh, colleagues are done presenting, and now I must say, okay, thank you very much, uh, CEO. Uh, I'd like to now hand over to members, and I literally couldn't speak for a good 30 seconds. I was so discombobulated, my head was cloudy. You know, you could not even, Try and see, Wuti, how do you manage this thing? I manage Gilento, it's a mess. It's an embarrassment. It just, it goes against what we are trying to fight for in this democracy. 
And I hope we never find ourselves in that situation again at the NSF. And based on the, the, the recent engagement we had with the NSF, definitely we believe that the tide is turning at the NSF. And that for us again becomes a victory for us as a committee. Um, so we've looked into the ministerial task team of the strategic review of the NSF and the implementation of the report recommendations. The forensic investigative report into the NSF and the implementation of the recommendations. The implementation of consequence management against officials and service providers implicated in the forensic report. Updates on the implementation of the audit action plans. Progress in the establishment of a suitable organizational structure relative to the mandate of the entity. Progress in positioning the NSF as a fully fledged standalone entity. Funding of skills development programs to benefit young and unemployed people. Funding of infrastructure development projects and other cross cutting priorities in the PSET system. Filling of vacancies um, and the NSF's performance and audit outcomes. And I think really. As we go to the successes, we're going to look into how all this work that we did and focused on has yielded some fruit in the NSF. In terms of our CETAs, when, when we came into office, Honorable Mananiso, and you said you, you sit in the Committee on Higher Education and Training, the first thing people ask, well, okay, besides the universities and NASFAS, they also really ask you about CETAs. Yeah, Chan. Uh, yeah, you see that CETA there. Oh my, like, I'm, I'm, as an CEO, as yes, Mina, I'm just the chairperson of a committee, mine is to hold people to accounts. Um, but there also was a bad cloud on CETAs. Um, it, yeah, there was just a really bad cloud on CETAs. But I have to say that through the five years and holding CETAs to account, one has had a better understanding of the work of CETAs. And I really think, DG, and you'll see how there's been progress in terms of the governance and management of CETAs in terms of even um, just the audit outcomes. That can give us an opportunity to then truly focus on the mandate in terms of skill governance, instability. Now we can focus on the crux of the matter. Are citizens being skilled, upskilled, and reskilled with the adequate skills that speak to the different sectors so that they can be active participants of our economy? We can focus on the curriculum. And someone once said to me, no, Che, you know, Tina, I'll never forget it, I'm gonna keep on saying it because it's problematic. There was a chair who said, when we asked about um, construction skills and, and skills su to support infrastructure development as a country, given the fact that we had experienced some of the difficulties we experienced um, during the floods in KZN and uh, Free State and the Eastern Cape, we then as a committee asked ourselves that, you know, do we actually have a good uh, skills base in terms of infrastructure that can withstand, in terms of establishing infrastructure that can withstand some of the uh, climate changes and environmental changes that are going to come with, um, with, with, with global warming and all of this, right? So are our skills going to match that demand from an infrastructure perspective? So, you know, as a CETA, that's your Chair, you know we don't do the actual. After four years of us being, three, four years of asking in a committee, you think I still don't know that you're not the one that actually trains. But you are the one who gives someone money to do the training. So, like, how do you, are you so Zomu Panje, you need to be sure what this person can do what you need, what we as a committee, as a sector, as a country, what we need to be done that these people are skilling young people with the requisite skills, because we're tired also of industry telling us that we don't have the right skills. Which skills do you want as industry? Tell us. So you as a chair, you as a, as a, as a board, you as a CEO must go out there and interact with industry and formulate a framework around which you will give people the opportunity to train our citizens. So you can't say, you must shape the training that takes place under your CETA. So, yeah, we looked into governance and management issues. We looked into audit outcomes and annual performances of CETAs. We assessed the impact of the four-month skills levy payment holiday on the budget 
of CETA and skills development programs. We assess the response of CETAs to government priorities. We assess the specific CETA program for rural communities. We monitored the implementation of each CETA sector skills plan. We monitored progress towards the standardization of the stipends paid by CETAs to students on skills programs. And we know the views of, 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 of HE in terms of um, double dipping uh, and, and those sort of things. And I think we've been working hard in the last couple of months to try and resolve that particular challenge, right? Um, and we've also looked into partnerships and collaborations between CETAs and other PSET institutions, such as TVETs and CETs. And I really must say that we do see a great presence of CETAs in our TVETs. And we've seen from the oversight we've done, we've also seen presence of CETAs in the CET colleges. And really that is, that is we support that. Colleagues must continue to do that, particularly CET colleges, they do need the support. Um, we've also looked into the placement of learners, graduates, and graduates in work integrated learning, and we've seen a lot of work you've done there, and the role of CETAs in artisanal development. With universities, we've monitored achievements of the MTSF outcomes in relation to access to universities, improved success and efficiency, improved quality, quality and responsiveness, funding and st student debt, governance and management related challenges. We've monitored progress in the implementation of infrastructure development projects, including SHIP. Um, we have looked into the audit outcomes of various institutions. In we've had a colloquium, an entire colloquium, on institutional autonomy of universities versus public accountability and cooperative governance. We've monitored transformation and gender equality in higher education, looked into the development and implementation of policies in response to GBV in higher education institutions, monitored the payment of NASFIS allowances by universities to students, um, looked into the response of universities to COVID, and uh, also interacted on safety and security related challenges and mitigation strategies. With TVETs, we've monitored achievements of the MTSF outcomes in relation to access to TVET colleges, improved success and efficiency, improved quality and responsiveness. We've assessed the state of readiness of colleges for academic year, uh, assessed the funding of the sector, government related challenges, monitored the utilization, um, the capital structure efficiency grants, including progress in the implementation of infrastructure development projects. We have um, done oversight on the construction of two new, T of 12 new TVET college campuses um, and looked into plans to improve student performance and certification and report 191 programs. We have also looked into the implementation of the post provisioning norms as well as audit outcomes. We further monitored GBV, um, the payment of NASFIS allowances, uh, the phasing out of unresponsive programs and, and introduction of new programs, um, the response to COVID, education or certification back. And we're going to have a whole segment on that because that's really also been a key highlight of the work of this committee. Aksiz Wutsi Ngane's harm is funde, Zingatoli certificate so that they can be employed or so that they can assure whoever they're providing services to that they are indeed qualified artisans. Um, and lastly, we've looked into the implementation of TVET industry partnership. Well, we've yeah, sorry. We've looked into the implementation of the TVET Industry Partnership Summit resolutions. With CETs, we have um, monitored achievements of the MTSF outcomes in relation to access to, C, uh, to sorry, just pardon that typo, access to CET colleges, improved success and efficiency, improved quality and responsiveness. We've assessed the readiness of the sector, MTSF uh, outcomes in relation to the sector, eradication of GTC level four certificates, funding for the CET sector, harmonization of conditions of CET learners, very important, infrastructure challenges, curriculum review, and the introduction of QCTO accredited occupational programs, partnerships between the NSF, CETAs, and CETs, and the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of CET programs, and lastly, monitored the implementation of the CET summit resolutions. So, the committee we meet, uh, meets two, on two days per week, so we meet on a Wednesday and we meet on a Friday. 
And meeting on the Wednesday has really been a great challenge in terms of the presence of the executive. So in essence, the presence of the minister in particular, because cabinet also sits on Wednesdays. And um, this has really affected the work of the committee um, in terms of its relationship with the ministry. Um, another factor is Fridays. On Fridays, uh, we usually have science and innovation. And because Fridays are often repurposed by programming committee of parliament for virtual sittings, that has really impacted us in terms of the work we've been able to do with science and innovation. Because Shane, even if we put science and innovation on a Wednesday, if students start protesting and SG here says, hey, John, uh, what are you doing as a committee? Uh, on this matter, we have to prioritize that Wednesday or reprioritize that Wednesday for the university or for, for the PSET system. And that really has had a great impact on, and colleagues will see this later, how many meetings we've had, those of us who were, you know, members of, members of the committee, we dealt with the legacy report of science and innovation last week, and it brought us to about just over 80 committee meetings. As you go through the slides, you will see how many committee meetings we've had um, for higher education. So that imbalance between the attention we're able to give um, higher education vis-a-vis -vis that of which we're able to give to science and innovation um, is it, really problematic. And it's something that we really hope the president will look into or that uh, you know the speaker of the seventh um, administration will look into or the chair of chairs because I don't think we've done justice to science and we've done as, the, as best as we can, but uh, we could be doing more. Because I mean, when you look at it, colleagues, we have 26 universities, 50 TVET colleges, nine CET colleges. The CET colleges have learning centers across the country. Uh, how many centers do we have? 100 and? Oh, 1,000? 1,791. Um, CET learning centers across the country. So, it's not nine, you know, it's just nine because they exist provincially. But uh, if you're talking about physical oversight, you're actually trying to do oversight on many uh, uh, colleges. We have uh, uh, the CETAs, the 21 CETAs, we have NSF, NHISS, NASFAS, SAQA, uh, the two quality councils. Um, and then NASFAS is going to take a lot of time. NSF also took a lot of our time. Miss CETA, Services CETA, Construction CETA. We've seen you so many times. It's not because of Sintandi. Um, it's just that there were others that we needed to zoom into. Because also, you know, you know there's, a, there's a decision you need to make. And we would, we would discuss this a lot. Do you cover space, you know, meet with all the entities, and tick that you've met with all these entities? Or do you say, okay, there's a real big problem here. We might not be able to see all these entities, but we can zoom into this one and close on on that matter, or close in on this matter. Then we know that at the end of our term, we've resolved something <laughs> tangible in a particular institution, right? So that has also what has led to us not being able to go to all the TVETs, all the universities. Students will often send us texts and say, why haven't you come here? Why haven't you come here, you know? You go to a province, you don't go to all universities or TVETs in a province. It's also because of how parliament is programmed. We used to be able to um, visit so, so colleagues, I hope, are aware that Parliament sort of operates like a school. We have four terms, and then, so at the beginning of each term, you, we used to have committee week or committee oversight, which then would afford us to cover a lot of ground. But now, we've literally been reduced to having one committee oversight week at the beginning of the year. And at the beginning of the year, it's bound to focus on higher education because that's where our focus should be. And therefore, science and innovation would be affected. So I, I, if recommendations that we have is that really parliament, in terms of how it's programmed, needs to revisit um, how it is structured so that it does truly allow for an activist parliament. Um, 
Colleagues are aware that we either met physically and we did more of those physical meetings when Parliament, before the fire um, uh, in the National Assembly, and then we've also moved on to the virtual meetings, which have been uh, helpful in terms of, you know, I guess, certain logistics. But uh, sometimes we're not sure if I want to get better, so we're going to get better, so we're going to get better, so we're going to get better. But uh, work was done nonetheless. Um, you know, in the private sector, they don't care. They just care about outcomes, 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 outcomes. So we worked nonetheless. Whether, whether or not Mr. Mabusela and some track pants underneath, we don't know. But what we know is that we worked. Um, we've had a number of on-site meetings, which was also something we tried to explore, where instead of having the meeting um, in Parliament, let's go to the institution and have the meeting, even if we can't do a walkabout. Um, and, and I think we've had that with Northlink. Um, we've also had various oversights and colloquia colloquiums. Um, I think I've spoken to that, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so. Overall, we've had 132 meetings in the last five years. And this number excludes meetings on site and meetings for the adoption of committee reports and colloquium. So if we were to add those meetings, this number would be sitting a bit higher. Um, we've also had joint committee meetings, which have, which have really been a great initiative of this committee. Um, the ones on the, with the select committee have really been about the fact that we COVID had just started, so it made more sense given the fact that Parliament had not had an established IT system to respond to the demand on you know, uh, online meetings. So it just made sense to have joint committee meetings on something like, a, like strategic plans or an annual performance plans or something like that, right? And then, but the other, other joint committee meetings were more strategic. For example, our joint committee meeting with police that was based on looking into management of student protests in universities and colleges. We wanted to understand, we'd say, okay, at what point do you call police onto campus? What, uh, what, 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 what framework should there be? What policy uh, should be there? So that you know, it's not haphazard, that Northling calls police uh, just as students are holding a placard and then the other one only calls police when something has burnt. Let's, let's, let's have a framework with which we work with. And also let's speak about how, how, how do we manage protests in a democratic dispensation. Um, we, we had a joint committee meeting with the Committee on Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities to look into gender transformation in higher education and TVET colleges. We also had, actually we've met with them quite a lot um, because we also, then met with them when the CGE was presenting their investigations in TVET as well as in universities and the updates of that, as well as the Maputo Protocol. Um, and then we had a meeting with Public Works and Infrastructure, uh, and we had, that, we had two meetings last year because during our oversight last year, we saw that infrastructure is of huge demand to our sector. We need SIRAS infrastructure for us to respond to the demand on our sector. So then, you know, as a committee, we felt that, okay, so why don't we repurpose some of the infrastructure that we have as government? And that, that meeting was really fruitful because there we had the joint task team between Public Works and DHEAD being resuscitated. Um, and we've been following through on that. So we've done a number of oversight, physical oversight visits in the last five years. If you wanted to show off uh, some of the infrastructure you have, we are so sorry, but we did as best as we could in the last five years. So in 2020, um, we went to Twana University of Technology, Harangoa campus. We went to Val University of Technology. Um, we zoomed into Val University again in 2021. Um, in May, we went to NASFAS physically, but Funokwana, every single thing. Even this new building. No, that was before they moved to the new building. But uh, we eventually to see the new building, but also made the building and we had understood the frustrations from the old. We understood that it was going to be more, more control. And we thought that that will, you know, instead, you know, like a lot of, a lot of 
you uh, that you have there want to go to work every day at least to go to work but nonetheless in to so Plaiki University Northern Cape Rural Tibet and Northern Cape CET uh, Plaiki University is one of our prides and joys um, as a committee or as as this democratic government um, really exciting or really excited about the possible opportunities that could come about for that university as it continues to grow and really want to implore on colleagues there to try and protect you know the idea of it remaining an open university so that it is part of the community so that what it seeks to do in terms of skilling young people and giving them requisite knowledge it's informed by their daily interactions with the community we also went to Stellenbosch Bosch University and we had working sessions with NASFIS um, just as a portfolio of evidence, you know, sometimes you say you can write all these things. Yeah, there's lots of words, but we can't see if Ngempela, that building has been uh, uh, built, you know. So this is a portfolio of evidence as well that, you know, when we say we went to some of these places, we really did uh, go to them. I mean, I'm just looking at that one picture there. That's literally at 123 Fansos Bart. I used to toy toy outside that building. I never thought I'd end up being inside the building holding the department to, to account. Um, uh, and, and there's an image there when we were at uh, TUT, I think that was the president at that time, Honorable Itzie and Honorable Yabo. I deliberately put that picture there of Honorable Itzie and Honorable Yabo looking very stressed at CETA. We were at SITA trying to resolve the issues of certification backlog. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then there we are at, no, yeah, please go back. There we are, no, okay, there we go. There we are at um, Salt Lake University um, on, on those grounds, uh, really exciting work being done. There a lot of great infrastructure, you know, and you can see it was during COVID, so nothing stopped us from working. Not even COVID could stop this committee from working. Next slide, please. That's us at uh, that's that's uh, Northern Cape Rural Tivet College, um, and then next slide, please. All right. So we've also been to KZN uh, and covered quite a few institutions in KZN: University of Zululand, Durban University of Technology, Mangosuthu University of Technology, the University of KwaZulu Natal, Coastal Tivet College. Universities in Limpopo or institutions in Limpopo that we visited was the University of Limpopo and mine that duplication there. Um, uh, Capricorn TVET, Vembe TVET, highlights for me, okay. Onkumtu Yazband, Yamba, Tetange Vembe TVET, the dusty red uh, village of Toyando, and young people there are dreaming about robot, not even dreaming. They, those kids, they tell you that don't tell us about Tokyo, Japan. Here we have robotics that can take us to the world. Those kids, those young people, my peers in Tangazam, they are so confident in the curriculum that they are receiving. Um, it's so inspiring. If you, if you have a, you know, it's a paradigm shift. If you think that, yeah, hey, TVET colleges, and then you, you think even worse about TVET colleges in rural communities, yeah, you need to go to Bembe so that you can see how young people are given a skill. After being given a skill, they are given space to go and, uh, and, and integrate um, their learning into the work environment. They come back, they are put in, into an incubation hub, entrepreneurship hub, they are taught skills on how to start a business, they are plugged into someone who can give them a little bit of capital, they are given a, a billboard, not a billboard, but branding. To go and be an active participant participant of our economy. And I will not stop up, even when I am not a member of anymore, I will speak up, and I'll speak about the many uh, colleges that are really doing beautiful things uh, in, 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 in our country. Then um, we also went to Limpopo City. In Pumalanga, we went to the University of Mpumalanga, another pride and joy of our democracy. Such beautiful infrastructure at that institution. We didn't spend enough time, but from what we saw in that short period of time, it really inspired a lot of confidence. And all we need to do now is maintain, maintain, and maintain. We went to Etlanzeni TVET College, as well as Mpumalanga CET. 
Those are again images. Next slide, please. Images, portfolio of evidence. Uh, colleagues from, from, from Umlozi Tivet and young women who are artisans. Uh, I don't know what was stressing us there at UniZulu. I think the top one there with Honorable Yabo Mananiso and Memudi we were at UniZulu. But at least they were laughing, Honorable Mananiso and uh, Lizzie, at, uh, at DUT, sitting comfortably on a student's bed. Uh, I think they don't mind sleeping in this res. And that's what we want when we go into our oversight. We want to feel like if I, Nompendulo, at the age of 30 were to go back to campus, would I be excited to be at this campus, right? So clearly they were sitting comfortably there at DUT and this us at Coastal TVET as well, looking at one of the workshops, I think, that are with Toyota, if I'm not mistaken, in partnership with Toyota, if I'm not mistaken. Next slide, please. Um, that's us at uh, Capricorn. I think we were looking at Megatronics. Um, and then smiling, uh, if, I, if my hair was not braided already at Vembe Tivet, I could have stayed there, they would have washed my hair, they would have braided my hair uh, in one of their workshops that they have there for, 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 for beauty th uh, therapy training. Um, that's us at a CET in Limpopo, and that's us uh, uh, at, uh, what is this institution? At the University of Limpopo, where the former president was called Lion of the Vi Vamp Viper, or Lion, Viper, something like that. Yeah, you, 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 when you do this oversight and you go from one end to the country, of the country to the other, you hear a lot of things, you see a lot of things, and they become part of the memoirs that you have of the five years you've spent in the sector. Next slide, please. Um, that's us at Etlan Zeni Tivet. Um, and I deliberately took this slide because if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if the principal of Etlan Zeni is here. He's here. Salbana principal. If, if, if I'm not mistaken, I want to believe that the matter of the grounds was resolved. Um, and that was through our intervention of troubleshooting a misunderstanding between uh, the municipality and the institution. And then this ground was not the sports, it was a sports ground. It was not moving. The you know, development was not moving. Um, but through our presence and our intervention, um, I want to believe that those matters have been resolved. It's very important that we also focus into sporting in TVET colleges. We're not going to have a situation where the best, the ones who become national players and play for Chiefs and play for Pirates and uh, become uh, Sia Colises are those who come from universities only. We're not going to have that reality, and we can't accept that as TVETs. We want all young people to be given an equal opportunity at representing this country. So we must invest in sporting in our TVET colleges, and I know that there's been some work we've been doing, but I think we can do more, and of course that's just based on budgets as well. Um, and that's also us at the, at the University of Vembe, sorry, of Venda, uh, and you can see that the night lights were already on which goes to show you at what time we were there. Um, because you really try and do as much as you can in the limited time that you have. And it's the night I say, Mam Sibia was with us till 9 p.m. Guneta, uh, us trying to make sure that we get a sense of the infrastructure there because there were also a lot of complaints that we had received from students about the state of the institution. But I want to say that we left the institution quite inspired and it really is a maintenance issue, colleagues. We need to invest in maintenance. We have to have proper maintenance plans and we need to have a budget for maintenance. And we know that also speaks to a broader budget for the entire sector. Next slide, please. We went to the Western Cape and had an on-site meeting uh, with Northlink, uh, TVET College, Lidaba, and Lidaba as well. And that's where we also spoke about some of the governance issues relating to uh, TVET's DG. And that's where we really implored on yourselves to say, can you make sure that our councils are appointed on time for the next um, uh, period and that they are more inclusive and intersectional. We want to see more women on council boards. We want to see more women principals in the TVET sector. And that was part of the, the discussions that we had when we, we were at that meeting. Um, then we went to uh, the University of Cape Town to look into the issues relating to the former VC. 
um, um, Prof. Pakeng. And then earlier this year, we went to the Eastern Cape where we visited Walter Sisulu University, the University of Forte, Rhodes, King Sabata, Dalingyabo, TVET College, and Buffalo City TVET College. Oh, thank you, Honorable King. Um, so that's just, a, again, a portfolio of evidence. Next slide, please. Um, I think I've greatly spoken to this in part of my uh, deliberations earlier, so we can skip this slide. Okay, the one, the one thing that I'm not going to move from, perhaps, is the issue around the committee not being well resourced when we did our in inquiry. Um, and uh, this is one thing that we believe as a committee, Parliament must strengthen. Parliament must strengthen its ability to support committees to do their work. I often say that entities in the department run faster than we can, DG. From the advice in terms of legal advice, uh, we don't have, I mean, the colleagues in legal, they, they do a, a splendid job. But if you're doing a commission of inquiry and you're meeting almost every week, they are stretched and we really need to uh, uh, capacitate parliament so that we're able to uh, conduct our oversight and therefore play the important role we need to play in the accountability ecosystem. Um, I'm not sure which slide this is on. Okay, next slide. Okay, can you go back, please? Okay. Um, we also want to advocate for an additional day uh, for the committee in a week. And I know, DG, you're probably like, Yo, you feel sorry for yourself because, you know, that means you guys have to come more. Um, but we, we, we don't think we've had enough, we have enough time in a week to do the work that we need to do on all these entities that one listed. I mean, that's over 100 um, uh, bodies to do oversight on. So we, we want an additional week, an additional day in a week to do our oversight. Um, yeah, I think we can move to the next slide. So some of the key observations, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, I'm gonna try and pick up on you know, the key ones, um, but, I, but I know you're, because I know you're also following hopefully on your devices, on you or on the slides. So the committee interacted with 22 out of 26 universities. Um, so we weren't able to interact with Nelson Mandela University, Northwest University, Free State, and UJ. Um, the committee, lamented on safety and security challenges for students and staff within PSET institutions. We welcome the implementation of recommendations by DHET. Um, we saw a new output indicator and target, namely the implementation plan for the phased in rollout of the safety and security minimum norms and standards at universities, were and we saw that they were included in the department's 2023-2024 annual performance. The committee successfully convened two colloquiums on um, auto institutional autonomy as well as the 4IR. The readiness of the new academic year was something we really spent a lot of time on and I really think that it has bared fruit. We're seeing more stability in our institutions at the beginning of each year. Um, we emphasized greatly on stakeholder relations and I think that um, colleagues in the sector have really taken this advice from the committee and we've seen the fruits of that through lesser uh, protests. Next slide, please. The committee recommended that the minister institute an investigation into the salaries of universities, of university vice chancellors and senior executives. This has been done. Um, a part of the report was presented to us, um, but the uh, minister felt that maybe he should go speak to VCs and chairs before he makes it public. I think that was decency. So, um, we, so we've got the report, but we've not engaged um, on it as a committee. So the next administration will then have to engage on it, but it really was part of our recommendations and we're glad that um, it was adhered to. We recommended that the minister put the MUT under administration um, due to governance and management challenges, and that has been done. Um, next slide, please. Th 
three universities were placed, so th then there are continued challenges, right? Which are that three universities were placed under administration during our term, VUT, uh, Forte, and MUT. Independent assessors were appointed for UNISA and uh, CUT. UNISA made a court application to review and set aside the IA report. The minister and the department are considering further action given the positive response by the council to the listed corrective measures. The committee has had several engagements with VUT and Forte to monitor the administration progress of the two institutions and has followed up on the administration progress at MUT. Um, next slide, please. The delays in disbursement of student allowances and delays in the processing of appeals by NASFIS um, has fueled student protests. We have a shortage of student accommodation. We have historic debt. There are funding challenges for the missing middle. Um, and there has also been delays in the finalization of disciplinary cases um, at TUT and suspended officials paid for more than two years for sitting at home. And this has since been addressed. Conflicts between university councils and management, which has contributed to the instability of institutions through engagements with institutions and AI reports. The committee observed that some of the councils, inter in the, that some councils interfere in the operations, hence this is a source of conflict. Slow implementation of transformation policies has also been a challenge. Construction mafias are a challenge. Student safety has been a challenge at some institutions. Interruption of water supply and challenges of wastewater management due to inadequate capacity or inefficiencies of municipalities has also been acknowledged. I mean, even recently when we were at Rhodes, um, I think even when we were at Entlanzeni College, we, we came across that. The impact of load shedding on teaching and learning has also been a challenge. Regression and audit outcomes of universities for the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, four universities have outstanding audits, namely Forte, UNISA, uh, Limpopo, and VUT. Mismanagement of infrastructure development projects, abandoned and shoddy workmanship. Um, and we've seen that on, on a with a number of institutions. Strained relations between management and university stakeholders. The committee has since seen improvements in some institutions, and I really want to lift Forte as an institution where we've seen great uh, progress made in terms of stakeholder relations. Delays by universities in responding to student grievances and vandalism of property during protests and allegations of third party involvement, like in the case of UniZulu, for example. Poor governance and management, including corruption. Um, sorry for this slide being off the page. If, uh, if you were presenting in, in, in the committee, I would have been so, I'm like, well, don't they pay attention to detail? Um, so, um, through the committee's dedicated oversight over the certification backlog, the department together with Umalusi and the State in Information Technology Agency achieved a 0% certification backlog in technical and vocational education and a GTC, um, NCV, and Report 191 and Native Diploma. So there's a 0% backlog. There, there's no backlog on certification. And that's, again, another success of this committee. Um, the committee has lamented on safety, security challenges of students and staff within the system. Um, and we welcome the implementation of our recommendations um, as there are new output indicators um, for safety and security. Uh, as well as uh, 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 explained in the 2023-24 APP. Um, more observed successes is that uh, we've seen increased partnerships with industry and funders. We've seen improved audit outcomes of TVET colleges. Of course, not at the desired rate, but we, so we can do better. Um, the ANC. Uh, saying do better, do more, and do it together. So we really can do better as this government uh, in terms of uh, our audit outcomes in the TVET colleges. The committee has constantly raised concerns regarding the curriculum and how it's not responsive to the needs of industry. And um, now we can, we can report that the department is phasing out 
the N1 N to N3 engineering programs, new programs such as NCV IT and computing are being streamed into the sector. Challenges um, would be around the implementation of the post-provisioning norms, as well as on the filling of TVET college principals and other senior executive positions. And we recently had a meeting, DG, where we spoke about this, where we lamented on the need for us to stabilize the leadership of the sector, making sure that we have councils in place, making sure that we have principals in place, making sure that all the vacancies of the senior management are in place. We know what the impact of unstable leadership is. We've, we saw how, for example, at BCC, I mean, BCC was so scary. The first time they came to, well, we interacted with them. Um, we were in parliament. I've never seen Abandaba Dala behave like that. Like, I was so shocked, you know. Leaders, because the people who come to our meetings are leaders. They lead, they, if you are the chair of council, you're a leader. If you're the principal you're, or the VC, you're a leader. If you're there representing labor, you are a leader. If you're SRC, you are a leader. If you're IF, you are a leader. So these people, these people are leadership. But could not, you know, we're not saying don't be honest. Be honest. Be frank. We, we are a space in which Abantu must be given the opportunity, Baba Bodley, you know. Don't know how to say it in English, to vent, you know, and be relieved when they leave us. But it was so scary to see such a, you know, extreme fragmentation of stakeholder relations like we saw at BCC. Um, and so it's important, DG, because the thing is, if the leadership is unstable, then everything we're trying to achieve <laughs> in the academic program is going to be affected because people don't want to go to work, people don't want to sign off certain things, you know, so stagnation within uh, the institution. So. We really need, um, if we are saying that we are serious about the decade of the artisan and we're serious about TVETs being the future and the now, we really need to make sure that we stabilize um, our, our TVETs. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I've spoken about uh, uh, appointment of council, so I'm gonna leave that. I've spoken about the need for funding for TVETs. Um, so actually, I can pass the slide completely. Uh, okay, I want to focus here perhaps on the issues around underqualified lecturers. And we know that different institutions have different programs and some of them are in partnerships. I know the University of Pretoria is um, contributing to the upskilling of TVET lecturers amongst other institutions or other universities. So, you know, but we really need to do more work in terms of ensuring that we have, uh, you know, qualified lecturers in our TVETs. Let's skill, upskill do whatever we need to do to make sure that um, they have the capacity that is needed for them to do that job. Um, they are, we acknowledge that there are delays in the purchasing and distribution of PPEs to staff and students that affects the academic program. You know, I mean, we saw at BCC, Boktiwa, Asaz, and you know, the lecturer doesn't understand when the person in procurement, how long it, yeah. That affects the academic program. Um, perhaps to also indicate that our inability to perform well um, in terms of our financial management and our governance also has a great impact on how we're able to get partnerships um, from, from industry. So if we are not able to get our house in order from a governance and management perspective, no one is going to want to partner with us. No one wants to be associated with a brand that is not doing well, right? So if we're also wanting to increase uh, partnerships, we really need to get our house in order um, for that. Uh, okay, I think we can skip the slide. Um, then CET observe successes. This one always makes me so happy, you know. Um, the committee interacted with four out of nine community colleges, Northern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, Limpopo, and Bomalanga, through virtual meetings and physical oversight. Recently, we went to Eastern Cape CET College, uh, the, the one in, the learning center we went to is in and around Makanda. 
and a young lady was given the responsibility of just saying something to the committee. I, I, can, I can't repeat it, DDG Fuchani, what that young lady said, but I could not hold my, my tears back. I, 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 I was very weak. <laughs> Uh, I'm just glad I was wearing Amazon class and also that not really too much. But when she shared what being able to go to a CET college means for her, um, it, it just confirmed how important our commitment as a committee in advocating for an increased budget for CETs is. It's literally giving a, 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 a young person, there are young people whose circumstances we cannot begin to imagine. We all think that every young person went to school, went to crash, went to school, a matriculator, and you know, there are serious realities, um, dire realities that young people in this country are going through. And for them to have an opportunity to upskill themselves, to you know, learn how to read and write. I, 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 I was shocked because this, this, the learner there looks like me. I am tramping him shiang at five years, but she looks like me. I, you know, maybe yeah. And this was her reality, and our realities were ex completely extreme. She was struggling to read, but she wanted to read it because her to read it in the language she was reading it in was a. a a, a display of what she had been taught in the CET college. To give them these particular literacy skills. And, you know, she even further went to express, DG, the need for uh, allowances. And I will speak for myself. I've never really thought of allowances for for CET students, um, because we assume it's okay, they live at home, so they just walk to the, the, the center, and then that's that. But she says, I can't, like, how do I get to school? Or how do I college to the center? How do I, why do I eat when I get to the center? My sanitary dignity, I'm not going to go to the center if I don't have a adequate dignity support rather than Kalekaya for four days. Ningzoya, Yabo. I've never really thought about have, us having that support for CET students, but that young lady, because they're not working. She's not working, she's at home, but she's trying to upskill herself. Ekaya, they don't, they're probably not even prioritizing her. They're prioritizing the ones who are in grade one, grade two, but when I you know, but she has made a decision to say, I'm going to go and be in the space to better myself. So, um, yeah, that, that was a key highlight for me in our research. Um, I've spoken about the, the one billion that was uh, repurposed towards uh, CETs in 2023, 2024. Um, the, the minister has allocated 200 million to CETs towards initiatives and benefit out of school youth and adults who require various forms of skin. The committee initiated an engagement between public works. We mentioned that. Um, we've reported that, okay, yeah, yeah, I think all of this has been reported besides the fact that the QCTO has reported that it has accredited some CET colleges to offer occupational skills programs. So those are some of as the parliament of the, as the committee of the sixth administration. Challenges. Next slide, please. Um, I've mentioned the one on infrastructure, but also we have inadequate staffing at the head office. We have low enrollment of enrollment numbers, and that was also shared. A very low student uh, lecturer ratio and high absenteeism because they probably have so many other issues that they need to attend to um, that really, even that little bit of effort they're making to just focus on themselves is a sacrifice amongst making sure Wutsugia Pilega on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Mm, okay, 
there's poor public awareness regarding the role of CETs. The curriculum offered is not responsive to local economic needs. There are double parkers. Um, there are double parkers in terms of CET lecturers appointed by DHET in the CET and those by basic education, as well as a lack of libraries and other recreational facilities to support CET students. Next slide, please. Um, CETAs, in terms of our successes there, the committee has in previous engagements with the department and its entities highlighted the need to have an integrated management information system um, for, the, for the sector to address challenges relating to learners in multiple CETAs, so the issue of double dipping. Um, learners funded by both CETAs and NASFIS, etc. The committee welcomed the inclusion of a new output indicator and target by the department to have a plan for the uh, integration of information management systems used in the PSET sector, which will be approved by the DG on the 31st of March. The committee considered annual performance plans um, and quarterly reports and all of that. And uh, the committee working with SACWA have, uh, has identified services CETA senior managers, managers who were employed without meeting requirements as per the advert. The committee monitored the implementation of forensic investigations. Um, the committee requested ETDP CETA to fund the training of financial managers at TVET colleges to improve their financial management skills and audit outcomes. Um, continued challenges would then be, and I just want to say, and I guess I'll get there later, but I, I really think our persistence on the audit outcomes and the performance of CETAs um, has, has really had great impact. And some of the cases in which we've said, come back with the audit action plan, then we take you, so Sinbui said, the audit action plan, I see, so I got to give us in writing a revised one. You're going to see the positive impact of that work um, in a couple of slides. So, as I was saying, the, the challenges, irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure, um, inadequate qualification skills and capacity of some of the members, unjustifiable remuneration benefits to some of the CEOs and senior management officials, poor governance and management by certain CETAs, um, employment of underqualified employees, mandates that overlap between CETAs, the NSF, um, and then as well as uh, inability of CETAs to implement adequate project management and monitoring, and consequently this contributes to irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure, including the double dipping that we spoke of. Um, and then we also noted that there's a high concentration of CETAs in one province, Gauteng in particular, and there's a poor spread in other provinces making them inaccessible. So the next slide please. So this is the slide where I say, you know, you can see the impact of our work. You can see the impact of Honorable Litsie asking questions for 20 minutes. Um, when you look at how CETAs were performing in 2021, 22, in terms of the audit outcomes and 2022, 2023, we see an improvement. The number of CETAs with clean audits has increased in 2022, 23. Notwithstanding the increased clean audits, the audit outcomes have regressed from the unqualified audits in 2021, 22 to being four and then to, qualif to qualified audit opinion, opinions in 2022, 23 being eight. Of great concern are the services CETA and construction CETAs that remained qualified. In terms of the NSF, our successes there, the committee has had several engagements with the NSF um, and we've really focused on the implementation of the audit action plans to address the audit findings on the MTT as well as on the Nexus report. Um, we've ensured that the NSF and the department develop a turnaround strategy and we've literally seen the outcomes of that in the recent engagement we've had. Um, the committee noted in terms of challenges, the work done by SCOPA on holding the NSF accountable for the, uh, for the um, I think the Nexus report. And there was agreement that it would work closely with um, the SIU and the DPCI uh, to ensure those impacted, implicated in the report are held accountable. Pardon the, the, the typo there. Um, in terms of further challenges, there are delays in the NSF 
uh, filling vacancies, poor performance of the NSF for several audit cycles, delays in the implementation of forensic investigation reports. The AG found that some of the reported performances by entities did not agree with the evidence provided. Mandates overlap, uh, as mentioned, and, and, and so it's the same as the CETAs to some extent. Um, key successes in relation to, 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 to NASFIS is that uh, we considered the APP of NASFIS, all APPs of NASFIS and their budget. Um, we've also considered their reports. Of course, we are, well, it's not our doing, but we are waiting for the 2021, 22, 22, 23 reports. And um, we, we really, colleagues, this for us is a great concern that we are sitting here and we still are at a point where we don't fully understand what the budget of 2021-22 did. Um, and so for we're going to have try and find a way through Parliament to have a meeting with NASFAS to try and at least resolve the 2021-22 annual report. This is an outstanding matter. And I don't think it's one that we can leave this term without addressing. Committee meetings will cease to sit after next week, but I really think they should, we should try and look into a way as a committee to apply uh, for some special intervention so that we can try and close this one of 2021-2022. I personally will probe into that as the chair of the committee on the possibility of us being given time to just deal with that one. Um, and and I'll rev we'll revert to members of the committee on any possible successes with that request. The committee has monitored the work of the administrator, as mentioned. We've gone to NASFIS and, and, and. Okay, next slide, please. So these matters, colleagues, were covered earlier on, so I'm not going to, under the focus areas, so I'm not going to cover, um, I'm not going to repeat them. Um, I'm just trying to pick up on matters that have not been covered. Um, the issues around student appeals, closeout projects, and filling of vacant posts is something perhaps that we need to note as an ongoing challenge. Um, and then we've also noted as a committee the displeasure uh, by institutions, stakeholders, of, by the institution stakeholders with the implementation of the accommodation pilot project. Um, some have called for the project to be suspended and students have submitted signed petitions to the committee particularly from BCC. Um, the committee expressed as well concerns regarding the inadequate communication by NASFAS to institutions regarding the implementation of the project. Okay, I think we can go on. Um, the appointment of Prof. Van Staden as acting chairperson of the board um, is, 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 is uh, while the investigation against the NASFAS chairperson is underway is welcomed. Of course, we have expressed that we don't want the, the chairperson, the acting chairperson to be there in, you know, indefinitely. Um, we really need to have proper commitments on when we see um, the investigation concluding. Next slide, please. Um, the CHE has been an entity that is fairly stable under good governance and management during the period under view. The entity celebrated its 25th anniversary in 2023 and established a booklet which offers a comprehensive overview of the entity's rich history and trajectories since, the, since its establishment. Notwithstanding its financial limitations, the CHE has been able to utilize its limited funding for the execution of core mandates and its performance against predetermined objectives has been good during the period under review. The entity received good audit outcomes which matched performance. The entity responded to the committee's recommendation of instituting an investigation into the remuneration of vice chancellors. Unfortunately, the final report could not be considered by the committee, but we said, see, he says in the next administration, we'll look into it. The entity was able to take swift action against officials responsible for incurring irregular expenditures and recouping the funds lost, which was commendable. The entity was able to provide advice to the minister during the period under review on areas which were critical for the functioning of higher education. Challenges? 
The funding model for the entity has hindered its ability to fulfill its mandate and execute additional mandates conferred upon it. The funding constraints in the entity has resulted in a situation where it was not able to fill all outstanding vacancies and employ staff in permanent positions. This situation led to the entity having to rely on the use of service level contracts, employment of staff on short term contracts and use of peer academics on core work. SACWA, the entity in terms of successes has been able to manage and maintain the NQF, which is, to, which is its core mandate. The entity also celebrated its 25th anniversary in 2022. The entity was under good management and good, demonstrated good performance against its predetermined objectives. The entity received good audit outcomes which matched performance. The committee supported SACWA during COVID-19. Uh, when its generated revenue dwindled due to the lockdown. The committee recommended that additional funding be allocated to, um, we need a, we think that the stick, the, the, yeah, the, what do you call it? Le um, it just, yeah, it shows, but in Gagas, because of Kazum Sevens, wait, won't get away five years, and it's cut us nine. But we, I'm pushing colleagues, I'm pushing, bear with me, I'm trying to get towards the end. Um, in 2021-2022, as I said, the committee supported SACWA during COVID-19 when its generated revenue dwindled due to the lockdown. The committee recommended that additional funding be allocated to the entity for digitization. The committee's intervention resulted in the department absorbing the budget cuts amounting to 41 million that were to be effected on the SACWA baseline over the MTEF period, including the additional allocation of 5 million to address its funding shortfall. SACWA has been commended by the committee for having women occupying most of the organization's senior positions, such as the board chair, um, the CEO, the deputy CEO, and the CFO, and other key management positions. The entity has played a significant role in the development of recognition of prior learning policy. More successes, the entity has had three CEOs during the period under review, and two previous CEOs, Mr. Samuels and Dr. Reddy, have retired. Ms. Starr took over in a smooth transition period. The SACWA board chairperson, unfortunately, passed away, um, Prof. Lolana, and uh, you know she she really did a lot of great work for the sector, and may her soul rest in peace. Um, Sakwa experienced a very difficult. Oh, this is probably supposed to be. I don't know if uh, success is the right uh, heading, but let me continue reading and then I'll tell you. SACWA experienced a very difficult moment in the history when the organization had to implement Section 198 of the Labor Relations Act by retrenching its staff due to its inability to keep them as part of the organizational structure. This resulted in a process where the organizational structure went from 194 to 82 staff members and the committee was greatly concerned by this. SACWA's ability to generate its revenue was severely impacted by COVID-19, which saw the entity losing millions of revenues from its verification of qualifications during the pandemic. Consequently, the organization was not able to fully recover from the financial losses, and it had, and, and it had found ways of repositioning itself post-COVID-19. The retrenchments have hampered the ability of the entity to speedily process the verifications of qualifications. Nonetheless, the automation project is being implemented, which will assist the entity to speed the process of verifying qualifications, and this will improve the revenue streams of the entity. Repositioning SACWA in light of its reduced organizational structure project has been ongoing and closely monitored by the committee. The QCTO has been the best performing DHEAD entity in terms of producing good audit outcomes during the period under review. Since 2019, the entity has managed to achieve clean audits. The management and governance of the entity has been stable during this period. However, there were slight delays with the appointment of a permanent council chairperson, but this did not cause instability at governance level. The performance of the entity during the period under review has been excellent, and it's also developed measures to counter areas of underperformance. The finalization and publication of the OQSF in 2021 has been a game changer for the QCTO and cemented its role as a leading 
Quality Council. That has an important mandate in the PSET system. The minister has since approved the QCTO application to purchase its premises. This will, among other things, reduce rental fees and improve its fi uh, future financial position. The entity was able to respond to the recommendation of the committee for providing more support to TVET colleges during this period. Consequently, the committee welcomed the reported steady increase in the uptake of the QCTO occupational qualifications, especially by the public sector, including the accreditation of TVET and CET colleges to offer occupational qualifications and skills programs. The entity experienced delays in the finalization and approval of, of its business case by the department. This has resulted in a situation where the entity was not able to fully implement its revised organogram that is fit for purpose. Furthermore, the entity could not fill all all its outstanding vacancies since there is no funding for such an exercise. The underfunding of the QCTO and its unstable funding model impact uh, impacts its ability to realize its full potential in the PSET system. The committee welcomed the CET grant regulations review process underway, which will enable the entity to receive 1% as opposed to 0.5% from the CETA levy grant. In terms of the NIHSS, the support provided to over 500 doctoral students by the entity was commended. Um, uh, postgraduate and postdoctoral scholarship beneficiaries were women, and it is also hoped that this will contribute to transforming senior academic and research positions, including executive management. Delays in the NSF, uh, delays by the NSF in transferring the 2023-2024 funding to the entity to support the special projects were noted as a concern. Declining, over, declining funding over the past years to support postgraduate students was a concern. Declining funding and the reported budget cuts for uh, the entity and the adverse impact on its uh, operations and support to postgraduate students is also of concern. And we've also noted that the minister has plans to shift the entity's function from DHEAD to the Department of Science and Innovation. Colleagues, we've done a lot of work in, in relation to gender-based violence and framework, and I think um, in some of the focus areas that we've, we've highlighted and some of the successes uh, we've highlighted or, 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 or challenges we've highlighted under the various programs of the department, we've already kind of spoken to it. But we interacted with the CGE and the investigation, um, in, the reports of the investigations they did in universities and in TVET colleges. And what we then did is had follow-up meetings with various universities that they had gone to or with various TVETs that they had gone to. Um, and we've been able to monitor some of the progress that these institutions have done. I then want to also highlight the fact that we, inter we held an inquiry, uh, the Mbati inquiry looking into uh, some of the challenges that were existed at the University of Venda. And really the work we were trying to do there was to find key lessons that can shape how we deal with gender-based violence um, in our institutions, to, for us to be able to establish a, a strengthened GBV framework, for us to be able to have policies on sexual harassment um, that really enable a conducive environment for women to exist within, be them as uh, professors or lecturers, be them staff members or students. Um, and then we also met with the University of Pretoria to look into the issues of transformation, and this also included our engagement with Stellenbosch University. Um, and what we're now seeing is that in July 2020, the department published a policy framework to address GBV in the post-school education and training system. The committee monitored the DHEAD implementation of uh, the National Strategic Plan and uh, in November 2021, we interacted with this as well. Um, really great outputs from all of, this engage all of these engagements we've been having on gender-based violence um, and, and just general patriarchy in our, in our communities is that the department now has a civic education 
uh, element within the curriculums of TVET colleges. The department has also launched Transforming Mentalities, and I really believe the committee has played a great role in, 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 in driving the department to come up with these uh, interventions. Um, I'm going to skip this slide as well because I think I've spoken to a number of these matters. And then we can go to public involvement. The committee convened a colloquium as mentioned, and this is really in us trying to make sure that according to Parliament's um, guidelines on the functions of Parliament, we bring in uh, citizens in various forms. So we asked, for example, for written submissions before we had our colloquium on institutional autonomy. And we've really tried to, to have as many, or to, or to interact with as many stakeholders as possible in some of these colloquiums that we've had. Next slide, please. There are some key issues that emanated from the colloquium on institutional autonomy. And the, the one important one is that the cooperative governance structures and mechanisms of university, um, of universities, is where we really need to focus on. The Higher Education Act is one thing, um, and I don't think that the Act DG is confusing. I think it's quite clear, I don't think it's vague when it speaks about the relationship we ought to have or the relationship between institutional autonomy, cooperative governance and academic freedom. They, we should not be having the animosity that we have between universities and government, between universities and stakeholders. The Higher Education Act really gives us a framework for us to work within. Deputy Minister Putima Namela says, the biggest challenge is that we're all going to interpret the act to our own interests. And I don't know what we can then therefore recommend to the seventh parliament to zoom into in terms of that. Um, but, I mean, if you look at attendance, DG, it's already a clear indication of a limping, I'm trying to use a very diplomatic word, so limping is the most diplomatic I can get right now, but a limping relation, or, yeah, between ourselves and universities. I don't think we should have the animosity that we have, but it is what is making it difficult for us to use the university program to advance what is explained and articulated in the NDP. I don't think that we want to interfere like the apartheid government did. I think we've learned our lessons and we know very well why academic freedom is important. We know very well, I mean, if you look at what some TVET colleges, councils in particular and management are advocating for, they're advocating for a little bit more autonomy, DG, right? So we know that we also don't want to have a situation where we strip institutions of autonomy, but they are public institutions and there should be a good relationship between that autonomy and cooperative governance. Um, I'm going to skip that slide as well, okay. Then I want to move towards some of our successes in terms of our stakeholders. So we've, at every point in which we've dealt with annual performance plans and annual reports, we have interacted with the AG and we have taken the recommendations that have come to us from the AG. Um, we've also improved conferral with the Parliament, uh, National Assembly, and the NCOP committees. Um, we've had good relationships with uh, TVET CGC. Well, we've had to better our relationship with TVET CGC because they gave us a bit of a lashing and said, you never invite us to, your, to meetings, you never get our input on you know, what's happening in the sector, so can you please try and get, can we please better our relationships, our relationship as the committee and as governors of the TVET program. And I think recently we had a whole meeting dedicated just for an engagement with themselves um, when we were trying to get a sense of, get their sense of, of how they feel 
we are ready or not ready for the academic year 2024. I want to believe, um, Prof, that we've had a good relationship with SAPCO, even when it was still led by Mlodwa. Uh, I think we've had a decent relationship with SALS. I see the SG has walked out, but I want to believe we've, we've had a very cordial relationship with SALS and always ensured that they are present when we discuss cross-sector issues. Um, and Sadfeta should be able to say the same. Um, with Labour, we have at every point invited Labour to our meetings, um, particularly if we're, if we're dealing with an institution. Some of the challenges we've had is that we get to an institution, like in the case of North Link, in fact, we get to an institution and upper structure wants to present the issues of the campus or of the institution. And we don't work like that. But a shortfall in how we work is the fact that we don't have a space for the upper structure to engage the same way we have for South, Sabco, Satfeta, governors. So we should find a way in the seventh administration to organize labor so that they can have a consolidated view when we're dealing with broader sectoral issues. Um, I think I'm going to skip this slide uh, and then I'll go to our study tour. So we went abroad, uh, Parliament only allowed us to go and learn from other countries once, uh, but we learned a lot and I think the one thing that we can bring back to yourselves today is that we really need to focus on applied sciences. We really need to work on increased partnerships. We really need to focus on science and innovation, but also working towards the commercialization of it. We really need to find a way to move the theory into something more practical and technical and find a way to then put it into industry. Um, so those for me are the sort of key lessons that we learned um, when we were in, 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 in Switzerland. Um, but also, really, we, we, we're doing quite well, colleagues. You know, when, when you, it takes you to go out of the country to realize that, hey, but we are already thinking this, or we are already doing that. And I think another area where, from our, our, our international study tour, where we saw that we're doing really well is in terms of the uptake of women, young women, in more technical fields, in engineering. We're not struggling with that as a country. Young women, they are entering unapologetically. The problem, of course, is where that goes afterwards. For example, when we look at um, the space, uh, space industry, the rocket, rocketry in particular, we don't have enough young women who are continuing with their training for us to have engineers that can support women, young women engineers black young women engineers that can support the rocketry um, intentions of our government. So we, we, don't, we, we don't have capacity as yet as, as, a, as a country to build rockets. We build satellites. And then we ask another country like Russia to, you know, orbit it for us, um, but uh, to launch it for us. But we, don't, but we can have that capacity. And young black women must understand that there is a demand for them to come into, or a need for them to come into that space. So really, I think that uh, there's a lot that um, we're doing right um, as a country. Um, and this was, in, this was very clear when we went and did our, our international study tour. There's a number of suggestions that we gave to, 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 to the department when we were doing our oversight. Um, so I'm gonna list one. Um, we, we, we suggest that the seventh parliament engages with the University of Venda and the energy and water sector education and training authority to revive the solar GDM system, including the energy supply for the mobile phones project. This project failed due to lack of funding and there's a need for both DH, Univen, and EWCTA to find solutions for funding the project so that it can be expanded for the benefit of the Univen community. Um, we also are recommending that uh, DHET's TVET branch approaches the EPFL, so that was one of the, 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 the institutions in Switzerland, um, 
and has a webinar to gain insight into its successful model for preparing graduates for workplaces. More than 90% of the EPFL graduates receive employment after completing their studies. The department can learn about the mechanisms used by the EPFL to implement the successful work integrated learning program. We also implore on the department to replicate the Swiss VET system in TVET colleges by distributing the training content of colleges across two learning locations, so training on campus and training by host companies. And I know DDG Zoom, this is part of the thinking that he has for um, how we can strengthen the TVET program. This will assist in developing quality graduates who are ready for the world of work. Um, we have considered one international agreement, which is the Global Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education, and this has been enforced as of the 5th of March, 2023. Next slide, please. So the budget of the department has been on the increase since 2019-2020, from 107 billion rand in 2019-2020 to 137 uh, billion rand in 2024-2025. Significant increases over the years were observed in program three, which is the universities, um, to mainly to, for NASFAS to fund students from poor and working class families studying at universities and colleges. In 2020-2021, the allocation was significantly reduced by 9.8 billion. Um, and then the four month skills levy payment holiday resulted in the loss of revenue to CETAs and the NSF consequently impacting the skills development interventions by entities. The budget of the department has been on the increase. Oh, sorry, Ooh, that was me trying to, okay, that's just a copy and paste, so that's just the wording down there made bigger. Um, delays in the, uh, so the impact of COVID-19 on the sector um, I think I don't have to oh, like outline those because we all lived it, but I think there's a lot that we can learn and I think what would be really important is for us to look at some of the conversations we were having during COVID. We really spoke about expanding access, we really spoke about creative ways of ensuring that teaching and learning continues, we spoke about using uh, infrastructure in communities to have a hybrid sort of teaching and learning continue. Let those ideas not disappear now that we're back here. Because the demand for access to education is increasing. It's so painful to say to a parent, yeah, that university is full. It is. Yes, that TVET actually can't, that has no capacity to take more. I would say they're being unfair. I would say they're being discriminatory. They actually don't have the capacity. The system is full. So those ideas, colleagues, that we were having during COVID of how we can expand access, let us not then, you know, now that things are the way they are, and then wait for another pending for us to go and review those particular ideas. And we know that there are colleges that have, TVET colleges in particular, and some universities that have been thinking creatively and innovatively about how to expand access through online learning. And I, I think also the conversations we've had in terms of UNISA being our, our model of how uh, um, you know, hybrid learning should look like, how remote uh, learning should look like, those con conversations must continue. But we also need UNISA to fix the challenges it has as per the ministerial, the work of the ministerial task team at UNISA, because UNISA is the model that we ought to be using, right? You are the catalyst. So you need to get it right and, and be the, not perfect, Tim, that's too much, but you need to fix whatever challenges that have come up so that when we're saying UNISA is, our, uh, is the model we want to follow, we know that um, you know, we're following the right path. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Oh, we're on recommendations. Yes, there we go. Um, the seventh parliament. Okay, <laughs> this is a very administrative one. Should make sure that uh, entities submit presentations timelessly. Colleagues, 
we, we collectively as a sector do a lot of work. It's inevitable or impossible rather that in three hours we can get through the crux of the issues in one entity. So what we then do is allow you and afford you the space to go home and respond to questions or comments or recommendations by members in writing. And we really take great offense when colleagues are unable to then send us responses within seven working days because you would have had to respond on the spot. So in, in our thinking, we're actually giving you a little bit more time. So when we don't receive um, those responses on time, we, we really think it's of great disrespect, not to ourselves, but to citizens of this country. You also need to understand that when citizens hear that we are having um, I'm going to pick on you, Mr. Mabusef. We are having NSF coming to the committee. And then, yeah, they, 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 they expect that when we are done with that meeting, we can go and brief them on, oh, so what actually are they saying about one, two, three? Now you say to them, no, just give me seven working days. I, we ask that they, they respond to us in seven working days. I'll give you an update in seven working days. Then, Mr. Mabusela and his team doesn't send the, respon the responses, pardon. Then you can't send a response to the citizen. So you look like you are the one who's not honest. You look like you're an unreliable member of parliament. I have a problem, I need an answer. You said you're going to meet with them. You've met with them, you still don't have the answer. So colleagues, we really, it, 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 it could be a logistical matter, but it affects how we are able to do um, our work as a committee. Um, I think also we, we, we want to recommend that the, the PC of the seventh administration continues to have conversations um, with uh, the PC on agriculture, land reform and rural development on the issue of the migration, migration of the agriculture and nursing colleges. We need the next committee to really uh, monitor the implementation of the comprehensive student funding model and to follow up on some of the concerns that we had raised around <clears throat> the time frame of how long will this loan system will be? At what point do we think the missing middle can actually be funded at no fee by government? Um, what time frames are we looking? What is the classification of missing middle at this point in time? What do we think it will look like, the missing middle, in a couple of years' time? So we need the next committee to really look into those issues as well. Um, next slide, please. And of course, to continue the work we're doing with public works, uh, we are at least already know that DDG Fuchani, there's been a few infrastructure, public-owned, state-owned infrastructure that has moved towards the CET program for repurposing. Um, we, we really need to, well, we recommend that the seventh parliament lobbies um, the standing committee on appropriation towards the consideration of allocation of voted funds to the loan scheme for the missing middle and its sustainability, given that the current funding from the NSF and CETAS can only fund 47% of the missing middle students for a duration of four years. The ministerial task team on the National Skills Fund has recommended the review of the Skills Development Act to address the governance challenges by affecting, uh, by affecting the appointment of the board as the accounting authority. Cheers. At least Nina Nia 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 on the NSF recommended the review of the Skills Development Act to address the governance challenges by affecting the appointment of the board as the accounting authority. So they need to follow up on that. Um, we need them to monitor the development and implementation of the PSET uh, integrated management information system, so all the systems. And this is really important for us. And again, this is where we saw as a committee that the department is listening to us. 
um, when we saw the annual performance plans of 2023-24. And the first couple of slides spoke to increased coordination within government and within the department in particular. Uh, I remember Memo Diba, the content advisor of the committee, coming to me after that you presented that APP DG and saying, Che, did you, were you sitting with minister? And you know, did you give him like direct points to say, add this to the APP, add this to the APP? And I said, no, you know. Um, but what it showed, DG, is that the department has been listening to us. Um, Part of the frustrations of being an honorable Tinsualo, honorable Shikwamban, is that we are impatient, as, as we should be as young people. As young people, we should be impatient. We should be impatient with injustice. We should be impatient with inequality. We should be impatient with mediocrity. We should not be accepting it. So when the people we represent, young people, are frustrated, Nazis are frustrated, because everything you can think of under the sun about how we've changed. Um, but it is moments like that, DG, where you say, oh, there we go. <laughs> it took some time, but there we go. We finally see the work, the, the fruits of the work we've been doing for the past five years. So we definitely do see, you can clap for yourselves as a department and for us as a community. Let's clap for each other in fact. <laughs> so, so we are seeing the plans um, of the department to have a more integrated um, management information system because it has an impact on everything. It has an impact on funding um, and, and many other matters. Um, the next recommendation, you see, this is the problem of not having a presentation that has page numbers. You, you need to continuously be, uh, you know, checking on the other side. But the next, um, and that's something I would have complained about uh, if it had come from you, Mr. Mabusela. Um, so we need to monitor the finalization of the phase two feasibility studies to establish the two new universities in Nakurleni and Amanskral. And we received the briefings recently and we've made our, our recommendations. So they will continue with that work. Um, they need to monitor the function shift of um, the NHISS to the Human Sciences Research, Research Council as announced by the minister. They need to monitor the development and implementation of gender transformation policies. Um, they need to ensure that the department reports on the implementation of the policy framework to address GBV uh, in the PSET system. Um, given that Council on Higher Education was requested by the Minister to incorporate sectoral oversight transformation as an additional mandate, Following the end of the term of the Transformation Oversight Committee, the seventh parliament should monitor this area of work and ensure that the CHE can perform this function. They need to monitor um, developments around the court review of the independent assessor report on UNISA and monitor progress in the implementation of the recommendations of the MTT there. Um, MUT was placed under administration in September 2022 the administration period is for two years. The seventh parliament should monitor progress made by the administrator in addressing governance management challenges as per the appointment terms of re appointment terms of reference. They must monitor administration. Um, oh, they must they must monitor post administration uh, as well, so that the university does not regress. They must monitor the utilization of capital infrastructure efficiency grants and the implementation of infrastructure development projects. They must follow up on recommendations to the minister to consider appointing an IA um, to investigate governance challenges at UCT. That's very important. Uh, the department's university branch should ensure that universities develop processes that will prevent employees from doing business with universities without declaring their interests. Mm -hmm. They must follow up on the implementation of the recommendations of the Colloquium on Institutional Autonomy, and they should blacklist all service, 
and universities should blacklist all service providers that have left incomplete infrastructure projects and continue. Uh, you see my slides are off the page, but yeah. Uh, our universities must give us that list and we must ensure that um, they are not given opportunities to do more work. Um, TVET colleges, the department and stakeholders maintain a, must maintain a 0% certification backlog, so seventh administration must look into that. They must, all issued certificates are handed over to the graduates. Um, that the terms of the TVET college councils that are coming to an end um, are supported by the appointment of TVET, the immediate appointment of TVET college councils. The department must expedite the appointment of all principals and uh, that the seventh parliament must look into that as well as issues around funding, issues around the audit action plans of the colleges, issues related to GBV um, and the expansion of centers of specialization. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, they must also continue to do the work we've started with public works uh, and to facilitate conversations that will strengthen collaboration between NSF CETAs and, uh, and CETs as well as TVETs. Um, continue the work that we've been doing around identifying land for construction of CETs ensure that the civic education programs and curriculum that the department has recently launched do really achieve that of which we want them to achieve, um, put in measures to professionalize the CET sector, uh, yeah, and the rest is the same. Next slide, please. So a lot of the recommendations, colleagues, will be cross-cutting from one program to the other, and that's why I'm not reading all of them. I'm just trying to see the ones that I, I, I think are specific to a particular program. Um, the department must expedite uh, the development of an integrated database for CETAs so that they can have data of all beneficiaries of skills development projects so that also speaks to an integrated management system. Um, they must improve regional presence. They should take serious action against CETAs that are struggling in terms of achieving good audit outcomes, uh, for example, services CETA. They should expedite the process of completing outstanding disciplinary cases against employees implicated in wrongdoings, and make sure that CETAs are pursuing the necessary cr cr criminal cases against employees found guilty for misconduct. CETAs should blacklist all service providers that have received funding for skills development projects and are not able to complete the project or provide evidence that supports the spending of these projects. Um, they should also, CETAs should not conduct any business with service providers that are not tax compliant or do not meet all the requirements for a registered company. The department should have a database of employees who have been found guilty of misconduct in CETAs so that they are not recycled to other CETAs. You know, if we see uh, chess in this sector, uh, not only in CETAs, but like in the whole sector, where umdu utoya lana pesa simbega la. And mina intengi ya ziku tima utoyi ilekti wa shalala ekelen ubabu ugabanga bantu anabazal. And gupsu, um, but you must be put aside. Um, CETAs should contribute towards the implementation of the district development model. Um, and then CETAs should have specific programs aimed at uplifting rural communities in light of their locality. The department should expedite the process of reviewing the Skills Development Act, taking into consideration the changes that are required for the NSF for the NSF to, to the CETA grant regulation and related matters thereof. The department should expedite um, the implementation of the recommendations of the MTT on the NSF. The department should monitor the implementation of audit action plans of the NSF and CETAs. The department should um, follow up on progress made by the NSF and construction CETA. The department should follow up with relevant law enforcement authorities to ensure that those who are implicated in the NSF forensic report are convicted. Um, the department should ensure that the companies and their directors that are 
The companies and directors that are fingered in the forensic report are blacklisted from doing business with the state. The department should ensure that the NSF expedites the process of procuring an ICT system that will, fit, that will be fit for purpose in terms of its organizational operations. Um, the minister, in terms of CHE, must expedite the stakeholder consultation of the CHE, CHE report of the inquiry into the remuneration of VCs and executive management. It should ex expedite the finalization of outstanding institutional audits. It should improve its internal human resource capacity to reduce its spending on consultants. It should the funding model of the CHE should be reviewed, taking into account its increased scope and resources of the additional transformation oversight function and to have a fit for purpose organizational structure that matches the work that needs to be done, especially as it introduces the new quality assurance framework. The entity should play its role towards the improvement of articulation within the PSET system. The entity should maintain its good governance and management and achieve clean audit. So the seventh administration must ensure that uh, CHE does all of that. They should also ensure that DHET expedites the approval of the QC2O business case model, um, that DHET expedites the process of purchasing build, uh, its building to eliminate rental costs. This has been a matter we've raised for years now. Um, a fit for purpose funding model for the entity should be finalized so that it can realize its full potential in the PSET system and cater for its expanded mandate, mandate regarding supporting TVET and CET colleges. The entity should improve the automation systems in relation to skills program applications. The entity must put measures in place for further development and management of the OQSF. It should increase advocacy and com campaigns and public awareness programs about the role of the QCTO in the PSET system and should maintain its good governance and management and achieve consecutive clean audits. The committee of the seventh parliament must ensure that SACWA uh, receives additional funding and that, uh, uh, and that it expedites the implementation of the phase and approach of the automation project, Project Phoenix. Phoenix not Litsia. You were out when I was complaining about the fact that I, there's no project in Katra. Um, but the entity should continue with its excellent work of managing and maintaining the NQF despite its financial difficulties. The appointment of the SACWA board chairperson should be expedited. The newly approved organization structure should be supported with requisite funding. SACWA should prioritize the, the recruitment of its previously retrenched employees in new posts. There is a need for more public awareness campaigns and SACWA should strengthen its external income generated streams in light of the declining funds from the fiscus. The entity should play its role towards improving articulation in the PSET system. Um, with, in terms of the NHISS, uh, the committee of the seventh parliament must ensure that DHET expedites the payment of the committed funding to implement its projects. The appointment of the board should be expedited and uh, the committee should monitor the, the function shift from to, 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 to DSI under the HSRC and there is a need for more advocacy programs to inform the public about the role of the NHISS. In terms of our stakeholders, um, yeah, universities, of course, institutional autonomy, cooperative governance, and you know the likes. Uh, we should better communication channels with stakeholders, um, and we should also, or, or USAF working with SAUS, should consider developing guidelines for financial concessions for students without with outstanding debt. Um, and the guidelines should be updated annually because we've seen, particularly in this registration period, how different universities have uh, interacted differently with students in terms of, you know, whatever concessions are made at the beginning of the year for you to register if you have outstanding debt. And this creates a huge problem for us as a sector, um, <clears throat> particularly also if it's NASFAS students, so we need to find a way to resolve that. Um, principals, we need to work on how, in certain cases, labor is intimida intimidated and student leaders are intimidated with interdicts and so forth, and that also goes for universities. Um, 
but also we should, we should look into how councils can be supported to fulfill their duties. Um, and I, I hope, DG, with the new cohort of councils that we have, we have really looked at trying to find, like, you know, creme de la creme. There was um, a, a day, I don't know what, which way we were, but there were professors and doctors and there were council chairs and there were of CETs and TVETs. And I remember Honorable Mananiso saying, this is what we want to see because these institutions or colleges can only be as strong as the leadership we invest to lead them. Um, so, so that is the uh, 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 recommendation we have in terms of uh, councils, and maybe that shouldn't, should not have actually been given to SAPCOR, but should have been given to C TVET CGC. Uh, South and um, I we, we recommend that we really afford student leadership the requisite support and capacitation that is needed. You know, SALS will come and present and they have a presentation and we can all follow the presentation. And you know, you can see from this presentation that the students understand that they need to articulate their challenges but also appreciate the fact that they are in themselves a governance structure so they must come up with solutions. They must be able to say what they have tried. Um, but it's not the same across, across the board. So we need uh, student leadership to be supported in that regard. Maui Mpini, you must be geared. Uh, so the department is going to be geared. They're going to have all the stats and all the facts of why they took this decision. Principals are going to be geared with many presentations that are going to show us as members that, oh, but it makes sense that they took this route. VCs even wear scabona, but sometimes Guma University, I, I'm, I must raise this, members. So we're trying to figure out if the student accommodation cap makes sense or not. And then we say to Nesfus, go and give us, go, go and give us the research that you did that informed why you put the cap at this amount. And then we say to, well, the university say, we don't want this, 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 um, this cap, this cap, well, you know, okay, then we say the same thing to universities. Go and do the research that informs why you don't want this cap or how, you know, your argument. Because then the same thing, and last corner, I'm going to say that I'm AK-47. I'm going to say that I'm going to research and, you know. Then you say, no, 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 it's not our responsibility to do that research, the department must do it. So how do we understand your perspective? Because the department is going to support NESFAS's research because the department is NESFAS, or NESFAS is the department. Now, we can't be expecting students to understand that, that if you are saying the university or the college is making the wrong decisions, you need to be able to give us facts on why and what you did to try and solve the problem. And, and then we have leaders of a program as big and as important as the university program posturing in that manner. I think we need to reflect on how we can do better in terms of our outlook on lobbying, because it's a lobby process. And in the committee, that's how we lobby. We lobby through research, through data, through stats, and so forth. Um, so in conclusion, colleagues, uh, despite the inadequate time allocated to the committee and the constant changes in the parliamentary program impacting the oversight work, the committee was able to interact with 22 universities, 19 TVET colleges, 17 CETAs, five CET colleges, NSF, Quality Councils, SACWA, and the NIHSS. And, and colleagues understand that when we say 22 universities, it doesn't mean 22 meetings, because with one university, it could be three, four, five meetings, right? Um, there has been an improved response from the department and its entities on the recommendations of the committee, and we do acknowledge that, and we do really appreciate the fact that um, we've been able to achieve that collectively, colleagues. Through its intervention, the committee has observed improved stakeholder relations in universities and TVET colleges. We've seen improved stakeholder engagements between DHET and PSET stakeholders. Um, of course, 
last year at DGU, you'd recall, um, we called colleagues, so it was Saus, Satfetsa, Yusuf, Sabko, Nesfas, and the department. And every single stakeholder said, we met with Nesfas, and we met with the department, and we met with, so everyone's agreeing that they've met. So on one hand, that's a positive for us because that is one thing that we really wanted to resolve. Because we said, look, you can differ when you get there, but at least meet. So that when you walk out, you say, no, these ones were saying this and we were saying this and we don't agree. Oh, but on this one we agree and this one we don't agree. Then you know why students are protesting, right? Then the new challenge, you know, they say with every uh, milestone, then the goalpost sort of shifts. We were then saying, okay, okay, okay. So since all of you are saying you've met, we can't still be having protests. So why are we still having protests if you're meeting? So let your meetings and your strength and stakeholder engagements now become impactful and meaningful. So that is uh, another reflection that we have made. We've done a lot of work, colleagues, in terms of uh, readiness for the new academic year. Um, and of course, I've mentioned the issue around the information management system that is integrated and dedication towards the CT sector. Um, I want to just from here lift the issue around shoddy infrastructure and maintenance that needs to really be zoomed into, better coordination with NASFAS, um, really aligning our funds and the, the, the curriculum that we have. Um, we need to zoom into the issue of the student debt and disparities in the concession given by institutions. Um, we need to zoom into the issues of transformation at certain institutions along the lines of gender and along the lines of race. Um, I really am not going to repeat those ones, so you can literally go to the last slide because some of them have been captured under, each prog under the recommendations that we did under each program. Honorable members and colleagues, that is the legacy report of the portfolio committee of the parliament of the Republic of South Africa in the sixth administration. The work that we've done here, you can clap for us. The work that we've done here as this committee, we are only 11 people. It's not, we can't do it alone. We can't oversight on the air, <laughs> on ghosts. We oversight on yourselves. You did not adhere to come and brief us. But we would not have been able to do our work. If you dug, ducked and dived and you know, you would have made our work really difficult. I think there was only, there's only a few times, you know, when people, hey, I'm going to go to Balega. But, you know, you must call us through the minister. Honorable Mapulade, once, when he was still chair, once told us how a VC said, why, why, why is he, as the chairperson of the committee, calling them as the VC to come and account? They must tell the minister to tell him. It's a big problem. I guess Lomundo would say we hold the minister to account for himself. Very weird, right? But those are one or two, three occasions really where you can tell what Lomundo was ducking and diving, doesn't want to come to us. But generally, colleagues have been cooperative. I really want to appreciate the support that we've received from the department in particular, under your leadership, Dr. Ngosnati Sish. Please let's clap for teaching. I think if we had to do an attendance register for the DG's presence in the committee, he will be sitting very high. There are members who've not attended the committee as much as the DG has attended the committee. That's just truth. But DG, you can't do that work without your team. The, I, I can't imagine 
what it means to be an official in the Department of Higher Education. <laughs> Phew. It's a lot. Between accounting to us because we're angry, showing up at events, uh, running the planning of the of your unit itself, running the planning of the entities, and I can only but imagine what a nightmare it is. To all the DDGs, chief directors of the Department of Higher Education, we are absolutely grateful for your commitment to the work that we've done. I think I had a weird view of yourselves when I was a student. A student you know? I thought maybe they're lazy. These people, they don't work, you know. But colleagues, you do work. Um, reporting to us is difficult. Capturing the 100 questions Honorable Litsie can craft for one meeting uh, is a lot of work. And also being able to see those recommendations, those questions, translating into progress like we have today. I'm sorry, colleagues, I, I took long, but that is the work we have done in the last five years. That is it. It's a lot of work <laughs> that we have done in the last five years. And, and, and as I was saying, it, it's through your work as a collective, regional managers, um, DDGs, chief directors, CEOs, CFOs. Um, I know when we say, oh, did action plan? And then, we, and then you bring it, and then we say, take it back. Sometimes you might sit there and think to yourself, take it back, okay, all right. But you try and you commit yourself to that work. And we've seen how some of these CETAs, uh, some entities have, 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 have progressed because of that back and forth that we had. I also want to appreciate some of the CETAs that respond to our request for you to come to the ground and to join our civic, our career, uh, pro, career development programs, career guidance programs. But remember, I don't know if I make sense. I think I must say it again. A member who requested for NESFAS or for a CETA or for an institution to come and be part of its community programs, a member who requested received that support. If you didn't request, colleagues, Nico Creative, Nama in the constituency work programs in Ogwe Mulog. But Tina Banga Sigas Akela, who say, I need any land, I need a Western, I need a twine, I need a Sophia Town, Nafiga. And you exposed young people to the opportunities that are there within our sector. Um, principles, the future is bright for the TVET sector. We hope that the Seventh administration is going to fight for funds for yourselves the same way we did. Um, CETs, we, we, we are the light that needs to shine in some of the darkest areas of our communities. Um, Honorable Mananiso can literally own uh, the successes of the CET program through the committee because uh, together I think uh, we've really pushed there. Uh, Honorable King, yourself, as a lover of education, of basic education in particular. So we want to thank you, colleagues. I think you've noted all the recommendations that we have made. Um, there are other entities I've not mentioned, but Siaboma. Um, take, take the observations we've made, so the, 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 there's, there's successes. So package the successes and pat yourselves on the back and say, how do we better ourselves there? package the challenges that are continuing to exist, and say, how do we solve these ones? Um, you, are, Tina, we are going after May. Some of you will remain here. Don't act, start afresh, like, like, yeah, you don't know now what's happening, and you know. We are also trying to, we really have tried to have a comprehensive legacy report, so that the seventh administration doesn't start from scratch, that we just move. So, yeah, so thank you. Thank you to uh, our support, Memo Diba, 
our content advisor. Can you please stand, Mehmudi? I don't know if everyone knows you. Some colleagues know you because they, you know, of oversight, but not everyone knows you. That is Me Mampacho Mudiba. Can you please give her a round of applause? Um, Me Mudiba tells me, colleagues, that some chairpersons in the past used to ask to see the overview, that, that analysis document that we receive. Apparently, some chairpersons in the past used to ask to see it, and then it gets taken somewhere, and then it gets approved, and then it, it goes back to the committee. And Honorable King, you know what I mean when I say it gets taken somewhere. And what she has appreciated is the level of openness and the high level of democracy that this portfolio committee has conducted itself in. Facts are facts. Mudiba's responsibility is to bring forth facts, colleagues. Whether it hurts us, some of us, whether it is what it is, but we must be committed to wanting to solve whatever is coming through the analysis that is being made. So thank you, Memo Diba, for your support. Uh, can I please see Agnetha? Agnetha, Dr. Agnetha. Uh, Aransa, please stand up. Um, thank you, Doc, you may sit. She is the researcher to the portfolio committee. Um, and I can only imagine them with the amount of ever-changing realities in our sector, how much work you have so that, that uh, the analysis that comes out to guide our work is spot on, because we are in an ever-evolving sector. So I want to really appreciate the work that you've done in that regard. Can I please see Anele? Mr. Karinis. <laughs> Um, Mr. Anele Kavinisi, you may sit down. He calls himself the CEO. Um, when I took over as chair of the committee, I, I, I uh, had a, I don't know what to call it, like a boss parade type of meeting, where I shared what it means for me to be the chairperson of the committee. That this is what I want to achieve, you know. Um, so, What's your understanding of your work within the committee? So that I can see if we're aligned. Because if we're not aligned, I'm going to fail. And if I fail this committee, all these members are going to fail. So let's see if we are aligned. And when, when I then asked Anele, what do, you, what, like, what do you think you are in the committee? What, you know? He said, I think I'm the CEO chair. I said, oh, OK. He said, yes, I'm the CEO of the committee. So he is the CEO of the committee. He runs things in this committee. He keeps me in line as the chairperson of the committee. And you've been absolutely supportive. I don't know, I can't begin to imagine having to administer and manage a committee that does oversight on so many institutions. The, the issues we have to troubleshoot every second, like the emails that we get are oh, like, yeah, never ending. And we are planning for the week of the committee and someone can't come. And now we, then we must speak to, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of colleagues that goes behind what you then get on a Wednesday on the Zoom platform or in a physical meeting. And really the person who makes sure that we are able to achieve that for the higher education and training component of the committee is Mr. Kavinisi. Can we please give him a round of applause? <laughs> I then also want to appreciate Mr. Tandukolo Botoman. Oh, I'm <laughs> He's at the back there. Um, Mr. Potterman's we may sit, Mr. Potterman. Mr. Potterman's responsibility is to make sure good to see a figure, like Melis Figure Corner, that we have the venue that we have, that we all of those things. And we really appreciate the support that you've given us as administratively as the Sixth Parliament. Um, I want to believe and I hope, Mr. Machozi, for the statements that you write. Thank you very much, Mr. Machozi at the back, our media liaison. Um, Tanya is not here. She's 
Oh, no. I didn't know you were here. Yeah, that's a bit tricky because I don't want to get emotional. Um, we have two members of the team who are survivors of cancer. And that's Memu Diba and Ms. Clay Nance. Uh, Tanya is the executive secretary or the executive assistant to the chairperson of the committee. And both these ladies have survived cancer. And when Tanya told me two years ago, yes, let's clap for them. And when Tanya told me that she um, was diagnosed uh, two years ago, I didn't panic. I was like, oh, okay, just go get the treatment. And you know, like, yeah, okay. Yeah, chair, I'm not gonna be available. Okay, that's fine. Like, I'm, I think I'll cope. I don't think I'll die. You know, and she'll continue to say, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Like, Dude, like, just take care of yourself. But I know why I didn't panic. It's because of you, Memudiba. You made us believe that, okay, she's going to be, I'm to put her flu above for some long time, and then it's all right. You made us believe that she was going to be okay, and she is okay today. Um, and so, we, 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 that's why we must continue to invest in science and innovation, Renee, uh, because of you know, these uh, sort of uh, solutions that we have to many of the challenges in society. And so I want to thank you, Tanya, for the support you've given me in the past five, three years. In the past three years, um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. I want to thank colleagues generally across the sector. A lot of people ask me, how is it to chair as a young person? I don't, I'm not sure because I, I, really, I really feel, I re rarely feel like I'm experiencing ageism. It's very rare. I think in Limpopo I went somewhere and yo, I felt ageism, sexism, everything. Um, but generally, <laughs> I don't think uh, you know, I've experienced that. And so I really want to appreciate that progressiveness from all colleagues in the sector. There's been a great level of respect for ourselves as a committee. We are a very young committee. I mean, um, as the youngest we are is Honorable Boshoff and Honorable uh, uh, Sibiya. That is the youngest we are, right? The oldest we are is uh, Chirwa, or is, uh, what's her name? Chakao, Chirwa, Shikwambana, and Mukadra. So, um, you have afforded us that respect with an appreciation of the fact that we have very important work to do on behalf of the country. Um, so, continuing Olohlobo, the ANC is very committed to bringing young people to parliament, so the next chairperson might be even younger. So, and, and she might be gay, she might be you know, a member of the LGBTQIA community, so let, let us not even see a bit of homophobia when she's now standing here. She might be a young person living with a disability. Um, so the same level of uh, uh, inclusivity and open-mindedness that you've afforded us as a committee, we will request for you to continue with the next leadership to come. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairperson. I think all of you have noted our slides were 116. So this is the work that has been done by yourself and ourselves as the collective. So I would like you to all rise. Honorable Lizzy, Honorable Mkachwa, Honorable Pile, yes. Uh, as we are, yeah. Uh, can we observe a moment of silence for those that we have lost while we were working with them from 2019 till to date? Because you have seen on our slides, uh, we have lost uh, two members, one from AIC and one from DA. And I think that in your space as well, during COVID, some have lost some of their family members as well, but they had to wake up and come to virtuals meeting and as well make sure that they report. Um, as we observe the moment of silence, may their soul rest in peace. You may be seated. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, let me thank the chairperson for actually covering our road map from 2019 to date. As we are making, yeah, I'm coming to that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as she was presenting to us, I was making notes there and observing the room. One would want to acknowledge the number and the attendance that we are seeing on Baba Nganda, advisor of the minister. Yeah, no, order. Mandela. Yeah. So, since we are in the parliament, ANA, kuna nama rules. The government has about to video chu 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 when the chair was acknowledging Uanel. Uh, I don't want you to withdraw, but in future, for the seventh administration, if it's a book on INC, yeah. I get a consistency. I've been calling order in terms of uh, dressing and stuff, and I can see that uh, the member now is an honorable member of this house. Uh, you are noted, uh, say, and acknowledge that you have actually taken my sentiments, not at heart, but in terms of noting uh, what we do in this midst. Uh, I think Chairperson was saying to all of you that whatever that we, we are doing today, it's for you to craft a program of action for those who are coming in the seventh parliament, perhaps would be the ones who are advising them on how to design their program for the next five years. Because Sinanom Parko to say that the seven administrations should do one, two, three in terms of recommendations. I've been uh, 11 years in, as a public administrator in the office of the mayor. And I've served three mayors. One thing that one has learned is that people think that they, when they assume a position of responsibility, they must come with new things. Hence, today we are experiencing instability and inconsistency. It's because of when you come in, in position of authority, you want to throw everything out while there's few things that you can take note of and continue with them or do them better than the one who came before. So I want to advise you that all of you who came here from all these sectors, it is important that you craft a program of action based on these recommendations for the seventh administration so that everybody in your space must be able to have the work that they need to do. As the portfolio committee, all of you, you have noted that we are the ones who have actually uh, made the TVET an institution of choice fashionable as the sixth parliament. We are the ones who have, when people are saying, hey, skills audit in departments, well, now we didn't uh, take it as just a narrative, but we made sure that when you come before us, we know who we are speaking to and what is that particular person capable of. The word of fit for purpose, honorable members, I don't think we were just using it as a slogan. But we made sure that where there's necessity of relevant people, we raise those particular people to be appointed. And it is because of our work that we are in this number as male, females, different age cohort, that we can own up at this work. One thing that uh, we have emphasized as well as this portfolio committee through the narration of the chairperson is the issue of educating, training, and learning, not for the street, but for work. And we can own up that indeed, WIL is happening because of us. Uh, the involvement of local municipality through DDM, we are the ones who have made sure that we push it because we thought and we believe that as the sector, we are a cost-cutting institution that can support everybody in terms of advancing development. 
I think, Honorable Mkachua, you said it loud to say that here we're speaking facts. It is a fact that indeed people are starting to see uh, education, training, and learning as one of the key tools to ensure that they liberate themselves from any oppression. And it is a fact that every time when the president says that institutions of higher learning are opened for everybody, it's a fact. Just by the look of this room, you can see that those that didn't have those opportunities, today they are here and some are leading councils, some are leading boards. It's a fact. People, they like uh, wanting to speak a uh, bit about the story of Tinsualo. But that story, it doesn't need you to look it at the lens of race, or gender, or age, or belief, or culture. But you just need to look it from the transformational agenda and diversity of, the, of South Africa. Then you would realize that all of us, we are Tinsualo somewhere. So without uh, wasting time, colleagues, as we'll be breaking for tea, before our good storytellers of Dinzualo, I would want to give you a, a, a break because one wants you to become refreshed so that you are able to see yourself when this Dinzualo person is speaking, whether it's, it is real or, <laughs> or it's just fake. Because all of us here, we believe in the issue of uh, Dinsualo. Uh, one thing that one would want to, as well, appreciate from all of you here as sectors is the fact that when we were very serious about the database or demographics in terms of the gender agenda, you, you didn't say, but this thing, does, it's not us. Hey, go to women ministry and stuff. You actually complied and made it a point that you own up this, that, that transformation part of demographics and ensuring that we transform the space. The issue of uh, sectoral interrelations, as this portfolio committee, as we were dealing with peace at sector, we made sure that it is fashionable that when departments have seven, a, a certain common interest, they sit together, plan together, and ensure that they come with a solid program. We are the ones who have actually made it fashionable that we need to plan together as entities who are having a common agenda. And I think we cannot speak more about the issue of corruption as we celebrate this 30 years of democracy, uh, all of us, we need to cleanse ourselves. Uh, for me, I believe development and renewal, it starts with an individual. Some of us here, we are entrusted with re these responsibilities on the basis that people think that we can do better and best. However, since the off ramp, since I'm a U10, because of our self interest. So I want to say to all of you as this committee, we have made sure that all of you who are uh, charged with making sure that uh, tender or beats go well, keep, please, please keep doing what is right. The PMFMA is very prescriptive. The Constitution is prescriptive in terms of what you need to, to do. And our regulations, legislation, and policies are clear in terms of what you need to do. However, we don't do that because of its business as usual. But I want to say to yourselves, it's upon yourselves, those who would be there for the sixth, seventh administration, that Lichikiza is into. They color every day. You can't even think about other things when you wake up, eh, 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 Judy. In my area, I don't know now, I know each and every household eh, in terms of how much the, the, the mother and father are earning because of NSF's work. And I don't think eh, we would want to actually do that to our communities, that they would have to prove to us that I'm rejected, but I don't have one, two, three. 
So please, please, can you sing it? And we want to live life and look youthful forever. So you could imagine if whatever that you are debating uh, in parliament, that NSFAS, they have improved, da, 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 da. And then you go out, when you just get into your house, there's a queue there. One day I must take a peek, perhaps, and show you guys, uh, those that I have contacted. I, would, I, I stay in a township. So I, I can't even go to a mall, come in and out. Because of, I know people will be saying, hey, NSFAS, hey, appeal, hey, what and what. So I think we need to do better so that we don't actually diminish the gains of democracy. So I want to employ to NFSA to say, at least they, they, from today, they know what is it that they need to, to do and continue doing it better. Uh, with that being said, uh, colleagues, we can now break for five minutes so that we... Five. Ten. Yo, 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 oh, zia kala. Oh, five minutes, buffet. Now you are co-sharing, huh? You are co-sharing. The, the rules of the house says that when you are a presiding officer, you, you've got point of privileges. You can chop and change and do what you want. So at the end of this session, I want to say that I'm giving you five minutes and then after five minutes you come back. I thank you.
It's 15 minutes, Honorable Manani. 15. Can five minutes be five minutes? Opening a meeting outside. Yeah, colleagues, let's come in. Uh, let's sit down. Thank you, colleagues. Can each one of you check if the person who was next to her or him is back? And if not, go and grab that particular person. But what is the guy? Oh, my God, Moto Moto. Moto Moto. Um, Dem Twin. Colleagues, mutu mutu, go and grab your person and bring the person inside. Mutu mutu. Mutu mutu, mbaka yeshu. Eh, Tichi, 
Ungatunga weep, but because you can see your colleagues are outside. Moto moto mbafet. Uncle, but I'm in Kuala Lumpur. I'm in Yangoleyo. A parliament, they don't open these doors forever. So you must know we open and close. Yeah. Nkalo fale na le. I'm trying to prepare you in case you happen to be on the side. You must know there's no lo 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 lo. We start, we end. So uh, thank you, colleagues. Now I'm about to call our tent in Zualo. In terms of uh, this session, I will call your name and then you will come and stand in front of us, the 10 of you. Then we'll be handing over the roving mic to yourselves so that at least you tell us who you are, what is your field of study, and where are you now? So that those who are online and those who are following us on some platforms, they are able to see, hear, and feel this thing of Dinsuhalo, which is real. I call it stories of my election. I call it slogan. So I will start with Mithe Velakubi. Yeah. And then the next one is Lukima Leni. And Chat Erasmus, uh, Anele, get them a mic, Rovi mic. So. Okuse, Teche. Zusi Pe, Nkulwana. Sanke Sakwe Mauritia Mula Dylan Olivier and Full I, I think a Kulu fellow Muravi. Yeah, uh, as I said, can we have uh, the mic from our first Dintualo up until our last one? Uh, you can see, uh, colleagues, that the development of South Africa doesn't have any specific lens, race, sex, belief, culture, or disability. So these are our people. Yeah, this is our Dintualo. Uh, you can start Mise, and then after you just move the Rovi mic up until to the last speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What's the afternoon? Good afternoon. Afternoon, Papa. Um, my name is Mise Mvelakubi. I am a bricklayer. I'm a qualified artisan. Am I audible? A sound, sound. Okay. I'll start over. My name is Michel Zulakobi. I am a qualified bricklayer. I am a facilitator at the College of Cape Town. And I am a World Skills Champion Trust representative representing South Africa and Africa as a whole. I trade tested in I tried tested in 2019 
And my apologies, I'm not used to reading speeches, but I will, I will try. <laughs> I twice, tested, I twice tested in 2019, and my twice test was funded by CIDB, Construction Industry Development Board. And I think it would be wise for me to take this opportunity as well to thank the CIDB for always supporting me um, from the time I started with the World Skills up until now. And um, also thank the CITP for their consistency in supporting skills and skills development as a whole. They have supported my journey from the time I started participating with the World Skills, and they are still supporting me today. So thank you to them. I'm currently working as a practicing facilitator at the College of Cape Town, training apprentices to become artisans. World Skills has a slogan that says skills change lives through the power of skills and passion for my trade i am a world skills champion trust representative as i have said we are three representatives from africa 11 from all around the world that are representing skills and skills development we met in Lyon, france for our first meeting where we did our training on meet, social media, speech writing, and um, me, what is the other thing? It was uh, content creation. And we met again in Dublin, where we had a chance to network with all the World Skills board members, sponsors, global partners, and investors, as well as World Skills, other World Skills uh, member countries. Our mission in the movement is to be the voice of World Skills and skills at large. We tell young people around, we tell young people all around the world why skills are important and why we should, why they should enroll for at TZ colleges. My motto says, when you have a skill, you will never go hungry. And that is evident in my life. I travel all around the world in Jango, Pakistan, and other people will take e bricklaying for granted, will take plumbing for granted and all other skills. Not knowing what skills can do. Skills change lives. Young people consider learning a skill. I invite you to enroll at a Tibet College. Make Tibet College your first choice to step into the real world. In conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity to wish all the world skills competitors that will be competing in Leon 2024 the best. As you will be competing, remember that this is not just about winning. It's about collaborating. It's about learning and growth. Every challenge you face is an opportunity to refine your skill, to learn from others, and to, and to emerge, not just as a winner, but as a better version of yourself. Let us not just compete, but collaborate. Collaborate. Let us not just succeed, but inspire. Go forth with, encourage, go forth with courage, skill, and determination. The world needs your skills, expertise, and passion. Thank you. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lukwa Naleni, a PhD candidate from the University of the Western Cape. As a born free, Tinswalo born post apartheid South Africa, my path to higher education was fueled by the support of Sasa Child Support Grant, which sustained me until the age of 18. With the aid of NASWIS, I enrolled. With the aid of NASWIS, I enrolled at the University of the Western Cape for a BCom degree, which was laying a foundation for my academic journey. Little did I know that was the beginning. My journey was not only confined to the borders of South Africa. During my master's studies, I represented my university for an, for an innovation camp in design thinking in Germany, which broadened my global understanding of global perspective and honed my problem solving skills. Later, I then went on an exchange program in Norway, which then put me 
on an environment that is of a different culture and of a different academic background. Now, as a PhD candidate, I am grateful to Nessus for opening the door to my first degree. And now I am a candidate in information systems specializing in ethical and sustainable AI for marginalized communities. I am dedicated to leveraging my knowledge and skills to contribute positively to society. Additionally, my work in project management within software development allows me to further, in, further impact the intersection of technology and social development. Today, I stand before you not only as a product of the transformative power of education and governmental support through initiatives like NASRAS, but also as a global citizen whose horizons have been expanded through international experiences. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cherry Rasmus. I represented World Skills uh, for Western Province. I am from Northland College, Bella. I matriculated in 2020, the year of COVID. At the time, I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. All I knew at the time was that I, should, I wanted to be part of the engineering field. I then did my research and I discovered that electrical engineering is best suited for me. And obviously I narrowed it down to electrical engineering. It was not always easy and it was something I wanted to do. I started my studies in the year of 2021. I completed my native course along with my phases. While doing my phases, two of my lecturers, Bradley Jones and Sifley Gansho, they recognized my skill and they made me compete in the World Skills Competition. Along with um, Sebran Pester at College of Cape Town, who prepared me for the final stage of World Skills in South Africa. My experience at World Skills, I was very nervous and excited, as I did not know what to expect during this competition and how high the standards were set. And one in my field representing Cape Town. During the competition, I met a lot of new people and also getting to know those I compete against. How I felt winning the gold medal, I couldn't believe it. I had no idea I'd be selected for the gold medal. It was hard to believe because it was an unreal moment at the time and it was overwhelming. I stand here today because of TVET lecturer staff who identified my potential to compete in the world skills, parents who supported me uh, when I had to train, and experts who tirelessly mentored me. And thank our team leader who cheered us on and took care of us during the national competition. Thank you to everyone who played a part in making this journey an unforgettable one. And thank you, world skills and the national government for helping artisans like me showcase our skills. Thank you. Uh, greetings to the committee and the house at large. My name is Obusle Ndeke. I was born and raised in Stexpert in the Eastern Cape. After metric, I got enrolled at Northland College Wingfield Campus where I did N1 to N6 in mechanical engineering and I did phases one to four in fitting and training. Whilst we were busy doing the phases, the COS program, Center of Specialization in Fitting and Training, was launched. I was fortunate enough to be one of their first 32 students they recruited at the time. I then got a three-year apprentice with Nova Sprint through COS. Uh, since it was a new program, we had a rotation that we were doing, so we would spend three months at the college learning the practical and the theory, and then you go back to the workplace, uh, implement everything that you have been taught at the at the college and actually get to see and learn more about the industry in a broader way. Uh, after the three years was done, uh, we then trade tested and qualified. I think QCTO, there's, there's a new trade test that we're doing now. Yeah, so I, I am proud to stand here today and say I'm a qualified fitter and trainer in HSN. Yeah. So my, my journey with, with COS didn't just end there. They didn't just train me. 
Uh, last year, they, uh, they employed me as one of their facilitators. I am now, <laughs> I am now training uh, a very new uh, mechanical fitter student from COS as well. So I feel like I'm a good testimony for them. When they see me, they get encouraged that they can also do it if I could do it. So I would like to thank everybody that was involved in making this program a success that it is today. Uh, may God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, um, warm greetings everyone, warm greetings, yeah, I'm so nervous, you make me nervous, okay, I would love to greet everyone, our Northlink our principal, Mr. Pique, um, Mr. Owens right the back, see you sir, um, and the um, NSFAS people here, yeah? Um, the, um, what else is yeah? All of us, everybody, man, everybody. Um, all right. Uh, standing before you is Zusipem Gulwana, all the way from Eastern Cape, uh, from Engobo town. I was born and bred. Uh, but half of my life I spent, I was raised in uh, Stellenbosch, Kayamandi, in the dust streets of Kayamandi. But now I currently reside at Kailicha. Uh, another dusty streets, if I tell you. Um, I am an apprentice at the Northland College uh, doing uh, spray painting. Actually, I'm an upcoming artisan, I would love to believe, because soon I'll be qualified, which is less than a year. Um, my journey as, as a spray painter, I would say, uh, it has been a roller coaster. It, it has been a roller coaster, and being a, a woman in a male domesticated industry is very challenging. Not everyone can actually uh, take it through and actually be there for themselves, and actually because there's 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 a there's a shift between there's there's male and there's a, the, there's female. So, and it is male dominated. So yeah, I would love to say. Um, to the NSFAS and uh, the NSF, I am very appreciative of the funds because I was once a beneficiary of the NSFAS. I was doing N1 at Northlink and N2 motor body work. I don't want to lie, when I started, I didn't know anything about this trade because I remember there was a time they were speaking about uh, pistons and I'm thinking to myself, what does a piston have to do with a car? Because in, in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, peace on, you know what I mean? So I'm like, no, this can't be, this can't be. So it has been a journey, and I am very thankful to everyone who has played a role in making me to be here. And I would love if there were more of these programs, because we need more of artisans, right? And I think there could be more, uh, but it's just that people are not aware of this uh, industry and what it, 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 it brings to, to, to the students, to people, and also that if um, the, the Department of Higher Education could raise um, awareness, uh, it would make it much easier for people to actually go to the colleges, go to the universities, all the institutions that offers this training, so yeah, I, I would love to say also again, thank you for allowing me to be here, uh, giving me the platform to, to speak, you know. Not, not, it's, not, it's not an everyday thing that someone gets to speak about themselves and the journey that they've taken. Uh, but I would love to say what has been keeping me sane is the discipline. You have to be disciplined. You have to be respectful, you know. And you have to be driven, self-driven, you know, if you understand what I mean. Okay, and also that, in my closing, I am not standing here for myself. I am standing here for everyone that is still to undertake the, the, this path that I've taken. And also that I cannot, I cannot be the only success story in the corner of the world that I come from. Because if then that is the case, I cannot hit myself on the chest and say I've achieved anything in life. So I'm not only standing here for myself, 
but for everyone else that is still should be standing here. And again, thank you to the Northern Colleges, um, the Department of Higher Education, and my mentors. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone. My name is Sangya Sakwe, and I'm originally from the Eastern Cape, in Tata. I'm here to tell you about my journey with the National Skills Fund, Vasari. So my journey with NSF started back in 2019 when I was accepted at GCT for civil engineering. Um, so when my journey started, it was um, hearing the news that I had received the award, uh, the Basri Award was very amazing to me because in my metric, I'd worked really hard um, trying to obtain a Basri when I got into varsity. So then fast forward, um, after receiving the Basri, I started receiving my allowances, so that was uh, for study material, which is something that um, I need to highlight because as a student, um, financial stress can be uh, like um, such an issue and if you um, have financial stress, it likely um, equates to academic stress. So the fact that um, NSF was there for me in helping me um, and making sure that I didn't experience any uh, financial stress was really helpful in my academic journey. Um, it also um, made me, um, so in 2021, I managed to get into uh, Dean's Merit List. Then in 2022 as well, I managed to get into Dean's Merit List. Mm -hmm. Then um, on top of that, uh, in 2022, I was part of the top 25 performing students in my residence, which has, um, <laughs> which has uh, over 400 students. So all of these um, highlights during my degree have been uh, because of the role NSF has played uh, in my career, basically. And I'm really thankful for everything that they've done. Uh, in closing, I am currently studying my master's in civil engineering. And um, that would not have been possible if it wasn't for NSF. So I'd like to say um, continue the amazing work that you're doing. You are changing so many people's lives in the process. And we also hope to um, bring forward a change um, in society. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, honorables, um, the stakeholders, everybody. <laughs> you are, um, I'm greeting you. Um, my name is Marisha Miller. I'm from Delft CLC uh, under the umbrella of CET colleges. I started um, my journey by working at Wolfweg Primary School. And that's where I heard about the CET College um, Wobech, by, that is by Wobech Learning Center. So I wanted to do my computer course. When I applied, they said to me, but I need my um, last school report, but I couldn't, I was unsuccessfully. So I th thought, no, I want to study, I want to do something, I want to better my life. And um, I do the full course, ABET level four. And I was successfully, I passed all six subjects. I, was, I had an A symbol in um, INCT. I did not stop there. In the meanwhile, at the satellite that I was studying, I was also volunteering, doing admin duties for the lecturers and the center manager. And uh, in a later stage, she um, employed me. I was on a claim system. No, a stipend, sorry. And um, later on, that was Miss Bridget Robertson that employed me, that see me. And um, then Mr. Vermaak came. And he teaches me a lot. He um, teaches me to be in, the, in vigilator in um, examinations, the protocols of examinations. He had COVID, there was nobody to do the, to be a chief invigilator and I had to stand in. Um, I was employed in 2021 as a caretaker by DHCT. Um, I'm on the Purcell system. I'm also um, soon, very soon, to be standardized as a permanent employee for DHCT. I'm not stopping there, I'm also doing my matric I started in 2022 with my trick. And when last year it was difficult for me, 
To finish my examinations, my father passed away three months after my father, my mother passed away. Three days after my mother, my brother passed away. I could not go on. I, um, I heard people said, students said, they, they go blank, but that day in the exam no room, it was economics, I got blank. I couldn't go further on with my studies. But it, my, the death of my family didn't stop me. I registered this year again for three subjects, and yesterday I got a notice that I was success, six, successfully registered. I'm, I just want to encourage everybody. I'm also doing caretaker admin work, sometimes standing in for center managers, but I am also recruiting students, and the time when I was doing my ABED level four year, it was God's grace. My daughter was, was also in grade nine, and at the school, for two, three months, she got another lecturer to give her maths, and I had to assist her with maths, <laughs> because I'm also doing grade nine, it was equal. <laughs> she passed at the end of the year, I said to her, yeah, we uplifted each other. <laughs> so I'm always telling parents in the community, upskill yourself. Be on the same level as your children so that you can speak the language that they are speaking and equip yourself. And I want to say thank you to CAET colleges um, for honorables. You're doing a good job, really. There was a time it was hard in my life and the principals provided even me with money without me asking them. We are like one family and that's, that is how we must be. Even for the students, we must um, uplift them. We must motivate them. We must talk to them. Not you are a student, I'm the principal or I'm the administrator. We must be like one family. So, I thank you. <laughs> um, good morning all. Um, my name is Dylan Olivier and I'm a second year for the internal apprentice at Damon Shipyards Cape Town. I'm currently in the Center of Specialization program. This program has taught me many things in just two years. And, and I still continue to learn and grow within this program. Through the skills development program, I have not only learned mechanical skills, but many life skills as well. And I learned and experienced how this program has changed my life. With the training I've received, not only at Damon Shipyards Cape Town, but the training at Northlink College, I am able to expand my knowledge and learn from multiple sources. I'm very grateful to be a part of this program as it has inspired me to work harder to achieve my goals in life. Thank you. Good day, Chair, good day, honorable members, and good day, colleagues. I was hoping I'd get to say you saved the best for last until this gorgeous lady in a lilac suit walked past. Uh, my name is Furuperu Morovi. I am the CEO of Educatory Electro Services, an artisan development center in the Free State. I was born and bred in a very small village called Silom in Jerele Limpopo. Um, today, I stand here in front of you with so much pride and confidence, uh, knowing and seeing that young people are in the forefront within the government structures and representing the youth. Like the Honorable uh, Bay or Gon Gil, I am also still very much a youth. I've uh, got a couple of more years to go before I can fall onto the other category. We are a beneficiary of the NSF, and today I stand here representing a different kind of Tinsualo on behalf of the service providers. We are funded for the Electrical Artisan Program for 200 learners. Um, by the way, this is the smallest allocation that we have ever had. Um, and, the work integrated <laughs> and the work integrated training for 500 learners. As we begin our third year in our Electrical Artisan Program, we have 196 learners still in the program. Our structure is slightly different from the norm with 67% being female in the program and 32% being male and 1% one person, one person for persons with disability. This industry is male dominant and we are trying to change the narrative. Um, I'd like to take credit for all the milestones, but I believe that if this will not be fair to my team at EE Services, which ensures that we implement these projects successfully from recruitment, training and placements. 
Um, I'd like to also just to observe our host employers. We've got over 200 electrical contractors that we work with nationwide that support our dream and our goal. They do not only assist us with placements, but they also assist us in mentoring and ensuring that these learners are trained according to what their skills qualification requires. Um, if you may allow me, I'd like to brag a little bit uh, by mentioning that in 2019, I won the Feb Women IDC Award for Job Creation. Right. Our mandate, our mandate, um, our mandate as a training center, as part of our exit strategy for these learners, it's not just to train these learners and qualify them and put them back in the streets. It is to give them a hope and an opportunity for them to be employable through the other different learning streams that we've got within our center. Of course, I'm not gonna share our strategy with you guys. <laughs> um, uh, lastly, I was also featured on the Business Quarterly Magazine for being a game changer in the Artisan Skills Development Center under the theme Decade of the Artisan. I'd like to further thank the NSF Project Management Team uh, in the Free State led by Mr. Norman Sitole the NSF project management team has dedicated their time in training us in their policies and uh, all their processes in terms of implementing and reporting on all their programs. Um, if it was not for that, uh, I don't think we would have made as much progress as we have made thus far. And I'd also like to thank the finance team, obviously, at the NSF for processing our invoices timelessly. Um, <laughs> The Free State has had a high number of unemployment rates and the stats last year indicated that there was a slight decrease of less than 5%. 5% is a lot if you look at the unemployment rates at this point. Like many other institutions in the higher education sector, I believe that we are a beacon of hope in the skills development sector in our communities. We change lives on a daily and we give hope to the community of the Free State. I'd like to thank the, F, uh, the NSF for affording us an opportunity to M impact these lives of the free state through these interventions, one artisan at a time. We look forward to more collaborations in the future. I thank you. Yeah, I'm the best because I'm the last. <laughs> Good day, everyone. My name is Amanda Pudana, born and bred in Tata in the Eastern Cape. Um, moved to King Williamstown when I was 12 years old, um, when I was about to go to high school. And I attended my high school in Panolwazi Agricultural High School in Alice Dale, which was a boarding school. Um, so today, I'll be just sharing my little journey with um, the bursary that was funding me throughout my varsity, which is Health and Welfare Sita Bursary. Um, so it is an honor to be here to just share my little journey. Um, I was founded by Health and Welfare CETA in 2019 when I was doing my first year and it, they continued to fund me throughout my final year which was last year. And standing here in front of you today, I am a professional nurse who graduated with cum laude, top five of my class. Um, I just want to say thank you to House Center for funding me um, for, because I didn't have funding in 2019. So you can imagine when I got a call from financial aid to say you are funded. I was, I was really excited because I come from a household with unemployed parents. So you can imagine what the funding did to me. Um, today, uh, in the near future for my plans, I want to study dentistry. I want to go back to school and study dentistry because nursing, I didn't choose nursing, it chose me. So <laughs> I wanna go back to school and study dentistry and hopefully um, health and welfare CETA, our journey will continue because I don't wanna let go of you. <laughs> or I wanna go back, study masters because currently I am doing my community service at Lendakhe Hospital. I am very passionate about mental health so I want to pursue masters in that as well. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. You may be seated, our Dean Swallows. You know, as they were telling us their stories, 
I reminded myself uh, on one interview that was done by Ineleng Mulite. And she was being asked about skills development revolution. What is it all about? And as they were narrating their stories, you are able to take trace that what we have promised that in this sixth parliament we would do, we have done it. However, we need to do it in a bigger volume so that it have a positive impact that we always speak about. Honorable uh, Mkacho, during this term, Honorable uh, Bafuze, the president always liked to speak about social compact. And what you see today is the results of that social compact. It's, it is not a, a, a slogan. He was criticized when he was saying that government is not responsible for hiring people, right? But those who have heard these stories can tell that as government, we've been doing what we are supposed to be doing in terms of creating an enabling environment. So the president was right by saying that we are not responsible for creating job opportunities. Because some of you, as you go through this skills development program, you are able to be job creators. And now uh, we've, we've had a testimony that one of our own will be awarded IBC for being a job creator. So this is what we always say that if we focus deliberately so and objectively so in terms of skills revolution, who would indeed better the country. But lastly, Chairperson, as I hand over to you, I've actually counted women who are here, and one can tell that it is not a myth that if you train a woman or develop or educate a woman, you build a nation. We have seen it in Amanda. Thank you very much, Honorable Mananiso. I think you can keep it at this level now because DG and I are fairly tall. Um, so if the colleagues from audio can come and assist us with the mic, please. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Mananiso, for steering the first half of our engagements this morning. Um, and I really want to appreciate all the Dintualos that uh, can someone from sound come and adjust the mic, please? Um, and I really want to appreciate um, the, co the colleagues who came out today to share their stories of how this government has contributed to their livelihoods. Um, we know that with what you have shared, we can definitely do better. And that is exactly what we plan to do um, as government, that is exactly what we want as this committee, we want government to continue doing. There's lots of areas of improvement. Because one, okay, maybe not because of one. If out of a hundred Dinswalos, if 80 get their NASFAS on time, it will still make us unsettled when the 20 don't get their NASFAS on time. So, if we think that uh, by wanting to highlight the good that is being done, we are disregarding the areas of improvement that are needed, no, no. That's not it. Um, we, we absolutely acknowledge the fact that we could be doing much better. I'm so happy that the department was able to find uh, a legacy, a great legacy as we framed it in the program of someone who has been given the responsibility of training uh, you know, young people. Because we often don't look at service providers as people who are also beneficiaries. But when we say that we want people who are given procure procurement opportunities, we want them to be service providers, we're gender mainstreaming, this is what we're talking about. Because otherwise we will not see 
the economic transformation that we want to see in society, if we're not deliberate about saying we must have more young women, more young black women who are given opportunities to render particular services to government and support government. So I really want to acknowledge that input that was given today and we wish you all the best, Swami. Uh, we really hope that, you know, we're only seeing the few that are here, but we're really hoping that there are more. And um, it's, it's through the annual reports of the department and its various entities where uh, we will see that. But it's also really great to see, you know, evidence, live evidence. Because I think So today we got a sense of the fact that they are here. I'd like to, at this point, colleagues, call for the Director General of the Department of Higher Education and Training, Dr. Nkosnati Sishi, to come forth and give us his reflections on the work that we've done collectively as the department and the committee in the last, well, five years, DG, of course it's three years, but we are from whoever was there before you, you take it with you. So, We've worked with you for about three years, correct? Um, and it's been an absolute honor. Um, we know that when you speak, either in your opening remarks or in your closing remarks, you are not shy to acknowledge areas where, the where you have been able to make strides as a department because of the recommendations that came from the committee. Um, sometimes I don't know if you said because you're managing us, or if, uh, you know, you really want to build good cooperative governance. Um, but we appreciate the fact that um, you have been honest uh, and that you, you, you have responded to the various recommendations brought to the department by the committee. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can you help me in welcoming the Director General, Dr. Nkosnati Sish. It's, uh, it's quite unusual that uh, an oversight body responsible um, as parliament of our country, um, right towards the end of the, their term, they call us to account to us about the work they've been doing. I don't think that I've experienced this in my 37 years in government. I think that uh, it's one of its kind, it's exemplary, it's set new standards for all of us that no matter where you are located in the system, you should be accountable to those you work with. And I think for me, this is one important uh, lesson that I'm gonna take back to my office and share with my colleagues because I think it's a stepping stone for us to move forward and grow better all the time. Um, thank you. In fact, I think uh, I would request that we give the chair of the portfolio committee and members of the portfolio committee a big round of applause for the work. That Secondly, I also wish to say that after these young lads, these young ladies and gentlemen, um, we called it Dinsualos, have spoken. I did not think that it was necessary that anyone comes here and address you on anything. A big round of applause to all of them. I take this opportunity to recognize the chair of our portfolio committee and all the honorable members of the portfolio committee um, who have been working with us over this period of time 
And um, I think many of us who are fortunate to have been closer in our working relations with them uh, have taken with us lessons that will help us grow uh, in future and we are grateful for that opportunity. We wish you well and uh, we think that there's a lot more work that South Africa can expect from the leadership you have provided. And many of you are young. I've got shoes older than some of you. Um, uh, so I think uh, the future of our country is uh, truly uh, bright. I wish to just uh, cite You know, from the UNESCO Global Data Report for 2022, um, I actually thought that what the report says captures the work we are doing today. When it says education is a top priority because it is a basic human right and a foundation for peace and sustainable development. If you go to our constitution, uh, the preamble of our constitution uh, also, you know, speak to uh, the very same, you know, um, around the potential or freeing the potential of each person. And I feel that uh, together, all of us, with all the stakeholders uh, present, this is what we've been trying to do, to free the potential of many in our country. I take this opportunity to recognize my colleagues and amongst the colleagues that are here present, and some of them have joined us uh, uh, virtually, uh, our vice chancellors of our universities, that are here with us, and I wish to take this opportunity to recognize them, and some also uh, represent the offices of the vice chancellors of our universities. There are also CEOs of uh, CETAs that are here. Uh, when I look at the list, and I always put by name for that uh, we have them here today. Uh, we also have principals of our TVET colleges that are with us, including principals of uh, our CET colleges. And that includes chairpersons of councils, chairpersons of councils of uh, CET colleges, chairpersons of councils of our TVET colleges and universities, including council members that are with us here, joining us physically, but also who, are, uh, who have joined us, um, you know, uh, uh, virtually. Uh, you are recognized and uh, we appreciate the contribution and the leadership you are providing in the sector. Any of the achievements that have been cited here today is directly a result of your, of your contribution. And uh, I trust that uh, this inspires you. This makes you recognize that this was not your waste of, of time, but it was actually a valuable opportunity to reflect on the work that we have done collectively. Uh, Chair, one of the weaknesses of the system is that uh, we tend to work in silos. And because of this, we don't see what is happening beyond the areas that you are responsible for. And because of it, therefore, we do not have a sense of what is the actual impact of the work that we are doing collectively. And these opportunities to sit like this and reflect on the journey we travel together are really, really important. Ours is to provide leadership. Ours is to drive progress. It is to strengthen the resilience and the capacity of our system. It is to serve our students, our learners, and we must you know, continue to lead the effort and respond to the contemporary challenges through transformative you know, you know, leadership 
and, uh, and, and with a special focus to the vulnerable, uh, you, know, you know, learners in the system, workers in the system, especially women. And I wish to stress this in the month that we celebrate internationally women and also a day before we celebrate the Human Rights Day. Uh, how uh, appropriate that we come at such a, you know, a time in our lives to reflect on the work that we do. Our sincere appreciation for the opportunity to share our perspective on the work of our department and that of the entire post-school education and training sector with the portfolio committee. May I also take this opportunity to recognize the sterling work that Parliament has been doing and continues to do uh, during term six and, uh, and as we come towards the end of the term and we are fully aware that the Portfolio Committee is finalizing the legacy report for higher education and training and today the Chair shared this report with us. We are looking forward to accessing uh, this report because we would like, as we plan, uh, to usher in the seventh administration to be informed by such uh, you know, work as it has been pre presented to, to, to us uh, today. Our endeavors uh, towards the development of a skilled and capable workforce and the skills base of our country and to support an inclusive growth path are always reflective of this, uh, you know, imperative to further education, uh, which uh, in terms of section 29 of our constitution should be made available as the state develops the capacity to do so. These outcomes are realized despite the socioeconomic turbulences that, uh, you know, uh, the country has experienced during the period under the review. And therefore, as the chair of the portfolio committee was reading and, and sharing with us the progress that has been made, we would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the sector to recognize this work, but also not to be complacent uh, on areas where we might have done well at a time when many of our people uh, are crying for better service delivery in the corners of our country and we feel that it is our responsibility to work together towards ensuring that uh, we help to fulfill the, the dream of many of our countries so that we produce more than swallows uh, than a handful that we might have uh, seen in our lifetime. The past three years proved to be challenging years as the pandemic remained a major disruption to the economy and service delivery. Surely the PSET system was not spared of this. The national state of disaster and the national wide or the nationwide lockdowns necessitated the campus closures. And in some cases, it has led to declining admissions and enrollments in our institutions. We had to adopt a risk adjusted strategy informed by the National Command Council to combat the spread of the virus and limit its impact on the PSET sector. Our determination and commitment was not to leave any student behind through the Save the Academic Year initiative, through the Save Lives, through similar initiatives, and all of these were linked to each level of the lockdown and as we implement the targeted interventions that were geared towards curbing the spread of the pandemic uh, in the system. I take this opportunity to recognize the work that all of us did together to save lives of many in our country. And I think in any record and reflection of the work we did uh, during the sixth administration, one of the biggest and the greatest achievements was our contribution in saving the lives of thousands of South Africans, notwithstanding the fact that we also lost many uh, in, uh, in, in, you know, uh, many lives as well. But uh, we must not uh, forget uh, to recognize this fact. 
I also wish to take this opportunity to recognize the work that we did through higher health, you know, a vital role, you know, particularly in the program called Save the Academic Year and Save Lives. As early as 2020, through our entity, Higher Health, we actually uh, re uh, released PSET COVID-19 guidelines that we developed and uh, through these uh, initiatives uh, enabled you know, our institutions to manage uh, you know, the pandemic at such difficult uh, periods. In the public universities, TVET and CET subsectors alone, we, through this project, you know, trained more than 17,000 staff members, more than 5,000 student volunteers on COVID uh, protocols. And I take this opportunity to recognize all of this work. And over this period, health checks had issues about, issued about 20,000 daily passports reflecting its continued use in the important tool in monitoring and preventing the possible spread of the virus amongst our staff, students, uh, in all our campuses. The health check platform was adopted to record vaccination statuses and between and, um, and a total of uh, you know, 20,000 vaccination responses were captured. And of these, a total of 2.4 million individual, individuals reported that they were either partially you know, um, you know, uh, vaccinated or fully uh, vaccinated. This represents about 67% of the total health check vaccines that were issued. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the CETA landscape was also affected by this uh, you know, uh, you know, pandemic. And uh, I think uh, the point we would like to make here is that it's one period during the sixth administration that challenged us but working together, we learned that uh, it was possible for us, you know, to, um, you know, uh, uh, combat a possible disaster that could have led to worse, you know, uh, re um, you know, outcomes as we have seen. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to share with you a few of the areas that have inspired us in the post-school education uh, and training system. Uh, during the sixth administration. We believe without doubt that uh, the PSET landscape has improved over the years. The PSET system has 342 institutions comprising of 26 public higher education institutions, 124 private higher education institutions, of which 50 are technical vocational education and training colleges, of which 133 are private colleges, nine community colleges, uh, including 21 CETAs, funding support institutions, including NSF as well as NSFAS, SAQA and quality councils, including QCTO and CHE, the NSA, HRDC, and NHISS, uh, which amongst others show that this particular department has the most entities in government. And this must be taken into account in the assessment of the work that is done by the, one of the largest departments in our government. This makes South Africa's PSET system one of the big, biggest in Africa with highly developed institutions that feature in the global arena of international education, training, research, technical development, and innovation. Further, making South Africa the single largest research infrastructure and systems in the African continent. It is important that at the end of the sixth administration, as we reflect on the work that we do, we understand that we are doing so on the basis of a, a very complex system uh, that uh, continues to serve our people. Government continues to spend a large share of its national budget on education. 
that is both basic and post-education and training. For instance, during the financial year 2019-20, the country's spending on education as a proportion of the overall government expenditure was 22.7%, uh, which is 7.2% of the GDP, far exceeding the benchmark set by UNESCO, which uh, recommends or which recommends allocating between 50 to 20 percent of public spending on education, or at least up to 6 percent of the GDP of each country. So if you wanted to, 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 to uh, 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 an answer to a question of how serious are we about education, at a time that we said education is an apex priority of our country, what did we do to make sure that we succeed in this regard? Today we are saying we, our expenditure on education by far exceeding, um, it exceeded the benchmarks that are set by UNESCO. We continue to intensify our efforts towards expanding access to post-school education and training opportunities. Our department has succeeded to establish the central application service pilot through a policy published in 2017 to support the applications for undergraduate studies to any post-school education and training institution in, in our country. It's still work in progress, but we've already started to see uh, the benefits of um, you know, putting in place such a system. In 2019, there were about 2.1 million students that were enrolled in our universities, TVET colleges, and CET colleges. The largest share of these enrollments were in the university sector, which is around 60.3%. It's important to me that I warn that uh, when we uh, publish our budget uh, that we spend at our universities, you understand that they have the biggest share in terms of the number of students that uh, goes to our universities. And I don't think uh, that it is uh, correct to then say this is, this, or to compare the share of university budget to CET and TVET college budgets. I think what we need to, to do if we want to improve education in our country, it is to proper, properly do an assessment of the needs of each of our sectors and fund them accordingly. And this is what we are prepared to do. Since 2019, um, you know, since 2019, about 31.6%, uh, you know, which is about 673,000, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, enrollments, you know, were recorded, which is about 8.1%. That is 172,000 of the enrollments in TVET and CET sectors, respectively. Of the total, about 1.2 million enrollments in the university sector, public universities accounted for a bulk proportion, which is about 83.7%, and our private universities accounted for the remainder, which is about 16.3%, which is about 208,000 students. In 2021, about 1.3 million students enrolled in public and private higher education institutions. And once again, our public higher education institutions accounted for the majority of enrollments. And therefore, our, the resource allocation to our institutions must take into account uh, you know, you know, those uh, dynamics that we are managing in the sector. For the 2024 academic year, all public universities have fulfilled their spaces and others exceeded their set targets to accommodate more students. Through this, um, uh, although this is a stretch, it augurs well for the National Development Plan that is targeting an enrollment of 1.6 million students per year by 2030. In the same year, our colleges have enrolled slightly above 500,000 students, reflecting a 30.2% or 136,000 increase, increase uh, when compared to uh, the numbers that we reported in 2020. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, it is important that we uh, take into account that uh, the targets that we set for the National Development Plan, notwithstanding the fact that we are lagging behind in a number of those targets, but a lot of work has been done uh, uh, to ensure that uh, by 2030 we achieve these targets. Student funding has drastically grown over the years. NSFAS funding has grown since 1991, dispersing 21.4 million to almost 48 billion to fund children of the working class and poor seeking to further their studies in public universities and TVET colleges. Between 2019 and 2022, NSFAS dispersed 123 billion rands, benefiting close to 3 million students. Uh, and in this regard, in 2023, academic year alone, NSFAS has funded 1.1 million students with a budget allocated of close to 47.6 billion. Of these allocations, universities were allocated 38.6 billion and TVET colleges 8.9 billion. And for the first time, the sector has passed the 1 million mark with SASA beneficiaries, accounting 49% of the funded students in 2023. This is a clear indication chairperson of the portfolio committee and honorable members of this committee that our government has been prioritizing education and broadening access to those sections of our communities who had no access to post-school education and training in the past. Under the leadership of the Minister of Higher Education, Minister Nzimande and the department uh, and, and the, our Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Manamela, the department introduced a comprehensive student funding model, an intervention that has assisted to support all the categories of, of students, including those who were currently not funded by the NSFAS bursary in the past. The funding model will be implemented in phases with the first phase commencing this year. In this regard, government has committed an initial capitalization fund totaling 3.8 billion rands. And I think this is the beginning, uh, you know, and, and this work that we are doing is the first phase of the implementation of the comprehensive student funding model. Well done to many who have brought us to where we are today. Professor Mdose, uh, Professor Peterson, uh, who have really, you know, assisted, assisted us in putting this model together, which uh, is going to take us time to perfect. It's absolutely not perfect. Many of our critics say that we are rushing the implementation of uh, the implementation of the first phase. But if you were to interview the three, uh, the, or the three point. Um, uh, let me say 36,000 students that we have funded already right now, they will tell you that uh, you have changed their lives and that of many in their families. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important uh, that uh, in dealing with the issues uh, that confronted us during the sixth administration, we also take into account that over the last five years, our department has been implementing an integrated post-school in, uh, infrastructure program to support our drive to expand access. In, ad in addition to the two new universities, Seoul Blackie universities, how proud are we to see the two post-apartheid universities built uh, by the people of South Africa through the governments they have elected into power? thriving already, beginning to produce large number of uh, publications in research. And uh, may I also mention the University of Mpumalanga, which we have established as two comprehensive universities since 2013. The department has concluded now, and I'm happy to say, a feasibility for two additional universities. One is to be established at Eguruleni 
um, 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 as the University of Science and Innovation. Of course, this is not the name of the university, but it is a focus at its initial you know, you know, plan. We are going to rename these institutions appropriately so that uh, we um, uh, reflect on the history and, and the evolution uh, of uh, our, our history as a people. Uh, this also includes the University of Policing and Crime Detection in Hammanskral. The feasibility is finalized and uh, the final work is towards its completion and we wish to indicate that the construction will commence uh, sooner than later and upon securing, uh, securing um, you know, and finalizing what is left of the feasibility work that has been done. Our department, as I conclude, has invested over three billion rands for the maintenance and repairs of our institutions, especially TVET colleges, uh, uh, TVET college infrastructure through the Capital Infrastructure Efficiency uh, Grant that has benefited many college campuses that we have completed. Pro program director and chairperson we are not talking about colleges that we are planning to build. We are talking about colleges that we have completed, that are ready uh, for use. And these include a campus in Umsinga uh, for Umkungundlo Vutivet College, a campus in Umzimkulu, a site Tivet College, a campus called Umtana College, at Nongoma and Guatregazi, a campus in Eastern Cape Midlands, a campus in Ingwe Tivet College, a campus in Umfolozi Tivet College, a campus at Bambanani, at Ikala Sterkspreit Campus, Graf Reinet Campus, Gersibande in Pumalanga, Balfo Campus. A number of these campuses that I'm talking about have been completed and they are ready. And this is the work that we have done through collaboration with our CETAs. The work that we have done through collaboration uh, with our institutions in the post-school education and training system. Chairperson, we have made significant strides towards improving efficiency of the PSET system. The sector is already demonstrating positive returns of investment on a number of, of, of areas. In the overall, a million students have graduated from our universities between 2019 to 2022. Our universities have managed to exceed graduate targets for 2018, 2019, and 2020. For the 2021 academic year, more than 6,000 graduates were produced over the targeted period, considering that the 2020-2021 academic years were impacted by COVID, you can actually see the potential of this sector to do better than what we have done already. As we know, the high-end PhD level human capabilities are important for the national development. The notion of a PhD as a driver of innovation is generally accepted. With only 737 doctoral graduates in 1994, the number of PhD graduates produced annually more than doubled between 2010 and 2021. We are still far from the NDP targets of 5,000 graduates, but we are on track and this will always be on our radar. Data in respect of the scarce skills always show that we continue to make positive strides. We have also introduced a number of groundbreaking initiatives to improve the quality of programs provisioning in the sector and in response to the white paper on post-school education and training. Our department has adopted a policy on professional qualifications for lecturers in TVET colleges. 14 universities were selected and appointed to develop TVET specific professional qualifications. The CHE has thus far accredited professional qualifications from 10 of the 14 universities. This is work that never gets reported. And today I'm happy to share 
this work with you, uh, Chairperson, and say we are, it's work in progress. There are two post-professional pro, post, uh, qualifications, namely the postgraduate diploma in TVET offered by the University of Western Cape and uh, the PG Dip in TVET Educational Leadership offered by the University of Pretoria. I am glad to indicate that over 500 TVET college lecturers have since improved their qualifications. We have also explored over ventures in our pursuit of professional development and management uh, you know, ca capacity building programs in our colleges. In this regard, we have been collaborating with local and international partners, including CETAs, and have achieved a number of, in a number of areas. I am proud to share with you that the ETDP CETA, MERS CETA, and FACET, and the Intel South Africa has, have to date established the fourth industrial revolution centers of excellence and artificial intelligence labs in 14 TVET colleges in South Africa. A further seven by ETDP CETA and about five by MERCETA are in the process of being established. In collaboration with the Alan Gray Foundation, we have thus far trained over 400 lecturers in entrepreneurship and over a thousand students were trained and are participating in entrepreneurship competitions. A lot can be said, a lot of work has been done. It is important also to indicate that uh, digital transformation readiness, uh, you know, report that we have published uh, in collaboration with the GIZ has given us a sense of direction with regards to how we move the system or how we, pr we, we drive digital transformation uh, going for forward. It's important that we say so. The Nurturing Imaging Scholars Program, which recruits postgraduate students with demonstrated academic ability who are interested in following an academic career, provide them with an attractive, structured study and development of opportunities which prepare them to apply for academic positions at our universities. So far, Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, a total of about 113 million has been allocated to our It's really, really important that I share this with you. There aren't many opportunities like this to tell South Africa that we do have many problems in our country, but we have leadership like you who continue to inspire the sector and therefore are a resource to continue to drive the dreams of our young people in ensuring that uh, we achieve the goals that we have set for ourselves. The new generation of academics program, which recruits new academics against a carefully designed and balanced equity considerations and disciplinary areas of greatest needs into permanent posts and universities to, uh, is a program that seeks to support them through an intensive development program that includes acquiring PhDs and the development towards a fully-fledged academic. To date, this program has allocated 872 posts to universities, which amounts to a total of investment of 2.2 million rands. 772 lecturers have been recruited and appointed to universities on permanent basis. This is the contribution of the sixth administration that we have led 
chairperson of the portfolio committee and members of the portfolio committee. And I don't hear about this in the reports that seek to assess the progress of our sector. The staff development program, which support the existing permanent academics and professional staff at our university to achieve doctoral degrees is one important program. We have allocated 183 million rands uh, in the program uh, that started in 2018. And right now, how far are we, uh, uh, Chair? I wish to indicate that 324 academics are currently pursuing their PhDs, and of them, 196 are female um, uh, academics, and, and black academics supported also in this program. Uh, it's, the number is about 290 um, of them all. The Future Professors Program, which involved an innovation approach to growing a representative professorate, so far has seen a total amount of 135 million rands being invested. And uh, the, this has led to 171 senior lecturers into structured programs to develop them towards prof professorship positions. Currently, 114 lecturers are supported in these programs, with the rest to be onboarded in the next financial year. We do not get to hear about this in the critics uh, about the work that the sixth administration is doing. We also do not hear about the entrepreneurship development program, which is intended to developing entrepreneurship capacity in all of our TVET colleges, our CT, CET colleges, and our universities. We also do not hear about the higher education leadership and management program that has identified and is responding to the leadership and management development of the university system. We do not hear about this. We don't hear about the responsiveness of our system that continues to improve. Since 2012, our minister has launched the labor market intelligence program, which has supported, which is supported by the National Skills Fund. Following the successful implementation uh, of this program, we have seen many beneficiaries. And uh, today is not the day for me to take you through it but it is important to cite this as one of the milestones uh, of the work that you have done during the sixth administration. There are CEOs of our CETAs here with us today. CETAs have also been massively investing in constructing skills development centers, with two main ones being the one that uh, uh, Professor Pusisi, um, the principal of Moteo, um, you know, in Otivet College, have launched in the last week one of the best. In the past, for trade testing to happen, you needed to go to Pretoria to access one trade center. Today, there are more than 37 centers of such, and uh, the recent one that we have launched at Moteo College is the state of the art, and I do uh, encourage many of you to go and see that center. And uh, when you get there, you will be proud to be a South African. You will also be proud of the work that is being done by this sector as a whole. Uh, I cannot uh, continue any further because of the time that is allocated uh, to me, but uh, uh, I'm only 50% in terms of the... Um, <laughs> All I can say towards the end uh, of this uh, you know, input, I will make uh, this report available to each and every one of you, and I'll sh share with you. But allow me to just say one thing, that I came to um, the Portfolio Committee to request their support uh, because we had developed a program um, for soft skills uh, because it's important for us to also attend to the issue of wellness and soft skills. 
I am happy to say that program not only was supported by the portfolio committee, but that program was also uh, supported by parliament. And today that program is being tabled to, the, to UNESCO uh, for adoption by the rest of the world as a blueprint to inspire the whole world when it comes to soft skills in the country. South Africa continues to inspire, but South Africa do have challenges, and we continue to work together with this leadership towards ensuring that uh, the dreams of the people of South Africa are realized. Thank you very much for your leadership and for your contribution. You know, as, as part of my reflections, uh, if people say to me, so how was it to be a young woman chairing? I think some colleagues would have observed the, the table. On this side, I have my brothers who are like, ay, 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 be like Duma. Go and uh, take the mic there from Tichi. <laughs> On this side, I have my sisters who are just as diplomatic as I, as cordial as I, a little bit frustrated, but we're going to do it in according. He's going to finish, you know. So I'm so glad that I've had this balance, you know, because if I only had my brothers, oh, I think uh, we would be anarchy. Um, but thank you so much, DG. I know what it feels like. There is so much to report on. And I think maybe a recommendation we can give to the seventh administration, perhaps just to take colleagues into understanding. I think it's the first time that a portfolio committee deals with a legacy report in the manner in which we are. The framework from parliament is very, it's about admin. How many meetings did you have on what? And that's it. But we really tried to get to the crux of the matter, which is, okay, you had this meeting, and then what, what happened? What, what change did it make to the sector? Was well, that matter resolved and so forth? And so we are also finding our feet in terms of how we're trying to do it. And so DG will really appreciate your report for it to form part of an addendum, uh, NASFAS, for it to be an addendum to uh, our report. And I'd also like, like to request the same from stakeholders. So if there are areas where colleagues feel we have perhaps missed out on key achievements of the sixth administration, particularly if colleagues are able to make it link into the areas of interest of the committee. So we know that the committee has been worried about infrastructure, transformation, um, give me others, certification backlog. Uh, I had a list that I left at the table there. But we'll give you those areas of focus and maybe we'll email that to you. And if you feel that there's something that your institution, your uh, CETA is really wanting for us to highlight as something the committee recommended um, or raises a concern and that you have addressed, um, then we can put that as part of the, the legacy report so that the, the seventh administration has an idea of what progress we've been able to make uh, between each other. At this point, thank you very much, um, DG, for your continued leadership. At this point in time, um, I am, so there's a boys choir, and the boys choir would tell me that I must completely rule out stakeholders. That's what they would say. Uh, and move to inputs from members. But the, diplom the diplomat in me feels uh, it would be an injustice if we didn't at least get a minute or minute and a half comment from two people on this side of the room and two people on this side of the room, from the floor. So I would like to open up literally a minute and a half colleagues. Um, in parliament, there's a timer. We literally, the chairperson says, your time is up and then we have to stop talking. Um, it's not worked in the committee to say you have 10 minutes. I, we once tried it, we made a pact as members that, okay, going into the next term, um, everyone only speaks for 10 minutes. I tried it on Honorable Yabo, and he looked at me like I had committed the gravest crime in society or in humanity. So that didn't work for us as a committee. But I would like to, as the presiding officer, 
afford colleagues, just two hands from this side and two hands from this side, to make any comments. It could be what you'd like to recommend for us to add into the legacy report, um, what you're committing to add to the legacy report, um, or just a reflection on how you have found working with the portfolio committee um, in, in, in the sixth administration, or even a recommendation that you think is important for the seventh administration. Can I please note two hands on this side? One, okay, one hand. Prof Lenkabula, you don't want to lobby the seventh administration on any matter. <laughs> Prof Putsisi, okay, I've got my two hands on this side. And then um, Lord Dra. sorry sir, I don't know your name, but you're noted, sure. Okay, um, the roving mic can sort this side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. And the mic is, that roving mic can't be heard. Thank you, Chairperson and um, members of the committee. Let me appreciate this opportunity and pass my gratitude to you for the sterling work that we have done as our leaders. Um, I would be talking on behalf of college principals and um, reflect on the work that you have done and the contribution and impact of your participation in the sector. For having given us that limelight as a sector, it's quite remarkable for, for parliament or government to visit our institutions mm -hmm. means a lot to us. And for you to impact on the operations the decision making, the policies of our institutions mm -hmm. cannot go unnoticed. Um, I, I heard you and looked at you as you were reflecting on your visits to different institutions. That level of detail, we appreciate. And just to take it forward to the seventh administration, I know funding for Tibet colleges, you deliberated upon, but we, it would need more emphasis for us to realize those institutions of choice and for institutions that can make that impact that is expected of us. We would appreciate that funding be given and uh, attention. And lastly, the, 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 the capacity at the level of leadership of Tibet colleges need to be t taken into consideration. We won't be able to attract um, leaders of a particular nature, if we are not resourcing them accordingly. Mm. Um, as, the, as, the, as the committee support our department, mm. our minister, our deputy minister, our DG are doing a sterling work mm. in supporting institutions. But as, as leaders in parliament, please take that into consideration. As Thank I you. submit, my students would say, as I submarine. <laughs> as you submarine. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, the next colleague, the gentleman next to Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, let me just start to say... Uh, sorry, please introduce yourself. Oh, th thank you. I am... Uh, uh, David Mohobo, a deputy principal corporate at Motel Tibet College. Uh, in the college council, I am a secretary of the college council. I like to appreciate um, what I observed in two occasions I interacted with you, Chairperson Katra. Uh, I really have to say from the bottom of my heart that you have done a good job and you were very impressive. You really uh, became an ambassador of youth in reality. I have two comments to make. I will be very much short. Um, COVID-19 has tested um, the capacity and capability of, um, uh, of the sector. And the sector managed to survive through that. And uh, what is important 
is uh, to consider, as the input I made, to say, uh, let the sector uh, proceed with uh, the uh, technology that was put in place um, uh, to effect uh, online teaching. This is supported by my view that uh, every year or every cycle when students um, approach institutions for registrations, you find long queues mm -hmm. and uh, mostly institutions making also example with my, uh, the institution I come from, motel. You find that the capacity of the institution can take uh, up to a quarter of all applications that have been uh, submitted of students. So um, it's, this can even be witnessed by um, parliamentarians um, who visited uh, the institution at the beginning of the year. Mm. Uh, this year it was uh, EFF, last year it was DA. Um, uh, they observed the situation which is there. And at the end of the day, uh, we all agree that capacity we have is not enough to accommodate everybody. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, as my input, resort to uh, online teaching. The issue of uh, performance assessment of students will be a challenge, but it's something that uh, doctor can also research uh, for, um, uh, for consistency. Okay. This, Nyakbala, uh, TP. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. But we've captured it. Let's continue with the lessons learned from COVID, um, particularly in ensuring increased access to education. Bambi. Um, then on this side, we had uh, Babum Lodra and the, the colleague that you're looking at. Yeah, it's the two of you. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson, the members of a committee. DG and the rest of the protocol observed. My minute will go too quickly, DG, if um, I start to mention everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for the a very informative session this morning. I do represent um, Mesita Accounting Authority. I'm Louis van Eistien. I'm also with the retail multi-industry organization. So literally looking at the vehicles, especially after they've been manufactured, affected, right until where we put in the fuel, do panel beating, et cetera, et cetera. So we look at that part of the industry. A chairperson, I think we do need to recognize the work that the two DDGs under Dr. Sishi has been doing from last year, November. Uh, you might or might not be aware, but from the side of industry, we find it encouraging that the DDGs are looking at the sectors, industry sectors, to find exactly out where are our challenges in thinking and our minds with regards to the transition to occupational qualifications specifically. Uh, we've had a session in November. We have recently had a session, DG, uh, which we really appreciate. And it's under the auspices of a NADAP a chairperson. NADAP is a national Apprentice Artisan Development Advisory Board. It has been legislated. It is a regulation. Um, and if you might, if I can ask that you might include it in your uh, final, final report. Um, it's something that I would like to see and he didn't see in your, in your report specifically. If I can make that suggestion, it's a very important piece where that structure can, for the seventh administration, inform mm -hmm. um, on a regular basis. We meet on a quarterly basis, the CITAS, and there's also a whole layout how that advisory board must be constituted. Okay. And who needs to be there and who needs to attend. Um, attendance at this point in time is not all that hot, um, I must say, so it can be improved. I think what I would like to highlight to you, a chairperson and to DGG. In your last uh, 20 seconds. Yes, quickly. So we need to stay on track to achieve 30,000 artisans per year. We are not there. We're about halfway. 
So how do we achieve it? We need to recognize existing uh, delivery methods with CETAs as quality assurers and see what worked. Then we also need to embrace for occupational qualification sub-framework mm -hmm. and we need to run things in parallel in order to stay on track and also to assist the CETAs to achieve their service level agreements with the department. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I could kindly ask that um, you, Anele, I don't know if you have, yeah, can you just get in contact with Anele, please, so that we can make sure we capture some of the recommendations you had, but also there's something you wanted to share with us and wanted to add, so just speak to Anele. Thank you so much. I'm not sure. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, uh, and, and the honorable members. Uh, the protocol do not allow, does not <laughs> allow me after the president has spoken. But, Chair, I, I thought I, I wouldn't be doing justice if I do not uh, appreciate uh, the, 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 the passion and the, the respect you are according to our college, as well as to Tibet colleges and the principals themselves. I just wanted to appreciate, as you are coming to an end of the term, I came before Prof the engagements that we have, I see the fruits mm. now when you report that where we started, now we have gone so far. So thank you very much, I won't wait any more time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Babu Mlodra. Thank you very much to all our colleagues. The TVET industry the sector was dominating. Um, oh, okay. I'm just going to be allowed to be bullied by my former dean of students. Because uh, I said two hands here, two hands there. I'm sure all those are going to take a kuluma, but it's going to be a kuluma. So I'm going to take uh, Prof. Lenkawula. And then on the online platform, we have a chairperson from NMU, uh, a chairperson of the council. So this, those would be the last two. Thank you. Thank, th thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mkachwa, and all members of the portfolio committee the Director General of the Department of Higher Education, the Chairs of Council here for universities, Tivet colleges, community colleges, the Chairs of the Science Councils that may be here. I'm truly honored to have come to this meeting. We appreciate the expansive report, and I would like to echo the words of our Director General, Dr. Sishi when he affirmed the imperative for the value and philosophy that you as the portfolio committee have shared with us, that of transparency and accounting for the work that you have done. I think this is commendable, mm -hmm. and all of us who are in leadership positions are called to ensure that transparency, participation, openness, and accounting for the trajectories that have been undertaken mm -hmm. in the pursuit of scientific agenda of our country. Mm -hmm. The second point that I thought was important from listening to the report that has been shared is the fact that as we celebrate the sixth accountability report from the portfolio committee on the scientific agenda that is articulated by universities, CITAS, TVET colleges, community colleges, or the PSET sector. It's very important that we remember that the PSET sector will not be a successful chairperson if it is not entwined with civic society, industry, but also with the corporate sector. This is an area of limitation that we as a sector need to work with and in our pursuit for strengthening, especially employability, it will be a greater point in question. The second point that I thought was quite important is for us not to have a bifurcation of a TVET system and a university mm -hmm. system. The articulation is quite an important point that pivots the imperative for the PSET sector to be seen as a conjoined sector that feeds of each other and strengthens the scientific system. Mm -hmm. Finally, Chair, I'm very appreciative in your acknowledgement for the improvements that the higher education system or PSET sector has made and the transformations on gender, 
on people living with disabilities, on other areas that prior to 1994 would not have been established as, excellent, as sites of excellence for our university or peace at sector. We are very appreciative. We are also appreciative that we have recognized the contradictions and fault lines in spaces where women lead, sure. where sometimes they are silenced or made to feel apologetic for leadership trajectories that help the sector. And therefore, we request the DHET and the Portfolio Committee in the next, the seventh uh, iteration to really looking at how we use the processes, systems, and financing of higher education to creating competitiveness for the country in the global arena. Thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Prof. I, I let her speak, I think, for three minutes because you understand she was my dean of students when I was SRC president. And we had a complimentary, contradictory relationship. She was a force when she needed to be a force, and she was mm, management when she needed to be management. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. Can we please check Mamu uh, Chanuari on the virtual platform? Can't hear me. Um, am I audible? I don't, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. Awesome. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to start by really congratulating the chairperson and the portfolio committee for the extensive work that you've done in the last five years and for reporting it all back in such an expansive way as, as, as Vice Chancellor Puleng has just said. Um, I think from the point of view that as a council member, where we look only at our, uh, our, at our own institutions, where we, where we head the councils and the oversight functions and the accountability mechanism, whatever you want to use, uh, it, it, it has been very invaluable to look at the whole, at the whole um, uh, 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 sector of higher education from your perspective and to understand some of the very fundamental transformations that you have engaged with. Uh, uh, Chairperson, I was just thinking in terms of next steps for the future uh, and to be constructive around this, uh, I really appreciate the slides 84, 85, 86 and slides 100 in which you talk about strategic leadership uh, and in which you talk about the institutional autonomy and I think that this is an area that really we could do with more engagement with, with chairpersons of councils. Uh, my experience has sometimes been that uh, councils are, it is assumed that councils are doing okay, uh, but I think there's, there's a lot more we need to do to organize ourselves as council chairpersons so that you can also get feedback on how we're experiencing uh, uh, corporate governance in our different institutions. So to the extent that um, you are passing your legacy on, and to the extent that you have invited us to make some comments, uh, I might write you a more uh, a detailed uh, um, kind of recommendation uh, from my experience, because my term on the council is also ending in August mm -hmm. this year. Uh, and I wouldn't want you all to think that, you know, we come and go out of councils without necessarily having an opinion about the experience that we've had. So thank you once again to all of you and to all the, all the, all the stakeholders, all the university vice chancellors, the heads of our colleges, the heads of our TVETs, and so on. It, it is hard work. It's very challenging work, and I must say I feel very, very proud of being a South African right now. And and it's been worth sitting for several hours at my computer listening to your uh, report, but also to the interactions from others. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the chair of council at NMU, Mamu Januari. Also, yes, I'm giggling. We're giggling this side because, yes, that is dedication to be seated at home, uh, but uh, paying attention. Um, on the issue of organized councils or finding a way to organize council, I think DG, apparently there used to be a structure where council would organize in the same way well, the councils of universities would organize in the same way the councils of TVET colleges are organized. 
Um, and, and there seems to be, with all the governance challenges that we're having, there seems to be a need for us to find a way to resuscitate that. So I think that's something that the, the, the seventh administration would have to take over. Thank you very much to all the stakeholders that made their inputs, and we look forward to the written submissions from yourselves. Um, we can give you 14 working days, okay, because so uh, we can give you 14 working days for you to make your submissions. A one-pager, um, you know, two pages should be good. I'd like to at this point hand over to members of the committee for their amendments and comments and uh, uh, um, additions to the legacy report as we move towards the adoption of the legacy report. Honorable Pele, Honorable Litsie, Honorable Yabo, Honorable Shikwambana, Honorable King, Honorable Mananiso. So, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to cut all the protocols because we have limited time. Uh, but firstly, thank you to all of you for spending the day with us. Um, the one thing I've learned when I came into this committee is that it never finishes on time. Uh, so I got used to it. Uh, and I also realize that it's because of the length of work. But I want to just thank you, Chair, firstly, for the exceptional report, uh, not just this one, but also the DSI one, and the way in which it was captured. It leaves us with very less to say when the report has covered everything. Um, but I'm proud to be, have been a part of the sixth administration, especially in this portfolio committee, that has made such an impact uh, in society, and that's what we are here for. Uh, and my parting comment is that I'm also a Dinswalo uh, and a PhD candidate, Hello. so I would uh, graduate hopefully by next year. Thank you. Uh, good day. I'm not a PhD student. <laughs> um, my name is Tebo Kholitsiye. When I was outside, I, I made a bad chairperson with somebody there that I'm going to be the shortest person in terms of speaking today. Uh, I'm now just to protect him. I'm not going to say his name. I think um, just one point that I want to make, um, and it will be to the citizens and not yourself. I think we, we our relationship with uh, with Yusuf VCs who are here is not nice. And it's not nice because universities don't like being told they are wrong. And these ones here, yeah, they like telling people they are wrong. <laughs> so we don't have a good relationship with Yusuf. We are hoping that the seventh parliament will have a good relationship because it's in the best interest of the sector to have that. The um, only point I want to make to the sitters is that, or maybe before, DG, is that when we came in in 2019, NSF was on the news every week for wrong things. And immediately after we came in, there was a five billion scandal. The following year, it was 2.6 billion. And in the past two and a half years, I think we must commend NSF for holding the fort, even though they're still not, in, in my view, doing what they should be doing, the impact that they should be having in society. They are not yet there. Uh, they are working on skeleton uh, workforce. Uh, they must, in my view, not have, I think it's, it's, they are still leading in terms of having vacancy rates. Doesn't make sense, but I think we must commend them for, for really turning the tide and we are hoping that some of our city services, uh, in terms of performance, in terms of uh, AG, uh, will, will improve. I know there are people who um, again, I'm not going to say their names, but who we'll say they are not necessarily ch chasing clean audits, they are ta chasing impact. 
uh, with good governance. I don't know what does that mean, but uh, I'm also not going to mention their names. Um, to the CITES, we've got board members and executive members who, I think we try to capture it um, on our report, who are accused of wrongdoings in one seat. They are charged, they resign before, either before the case or after, uh, during the case, but before they are fired, they then jump ship. Then they vumbuga somewhere in another seat. Eh? Um, so we've asked, that one, Yone, shame, we're going to stop it. Because we really can't afford this tagline for the sitters to be known as uh, uh, sure. looting spaces. Sure. Sitters, I mean, those of you who, who listen to Stats A, they always tell us about the unemployed young people in this country. Yeah. And AG said, you sitters had a combined reserves of 12 billion. Why would we have 12 billion when we have so many young people who are not in employment, not in education, uh, not in training. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so we've asked the DDG, DG, uh, to compile a list of all executives from the CITES who would have been charged in the past three, four years. And we want to know what happened. If they jumped ship, where did they go? And uh, you know, if you have done so and you are charged, then uh, good for you. But it's not going to happen moving forward. Because I know, you know, uh, there, there are those who are charged somewhere and they've got the nerve to even attend interviews elsewhere, including some board members of this news, others, or these other sitters who then recommend those people for critical positions when they know that they've been charged. So that, uh, that's the only comment I wanted to make, just to emphasize what we are saying on the report. We're going to do that for executives and board members. Uh, so we have a chance from now on, your term as board ends on the 31st of March. You have uh, time from now until the 31st of March to try and improve. If you don't, Hack for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I will also dispense of um, the greetings and pleasantries to save time. Um, but the business of the day, Chair, has been to look at the legacy report. And it is a baton that we are handing over to the next administration, to those who will come and execute the mandate of the people on behalf of the people. It may not be these faces that uh, sit on this table. It may be totally different faces, but we needed to paint a clear picture of where we took this piece at sector to where it is now, five years later. And I think we would be remiss of us if we were not clear on the business of the day and to what we are expecting from those we are speaking to today who may remain uh, post uh, the 2024 general elections. Of course, some have, may have their terms ending uh, also in this year, but there needs to be a communication about what it is that we are leaving behind and what it is that we want to see as a baseline being taken over by the next uh, crop of leaders who will take over this work. On the Council for Higher Education, Chair, I want to, to speak of uh, an addition or an insertion in the legacy report that uh, by our own observation, and I think this is uh, due to the a UNISA situation that we're able to pick this up. 
you need to allow for a cooling off period for any senior executive or council member whose term comes to an end or resigns from the Council for Higher Education before being added to the panel of assessors. It creates a problem uh, of, of conflict of interest when you have a senior executive or a council member in whatever capacity whose term ends or they resign and within a very short space of time they are added to the panel of assessors. Remember, according to the Higher Education Act, it is the Council for Higher Education which appoints the panel of assessors. And so it seems, it looks like throwing yourself a javelin when you resign or your term ends and immediately post your resignation or your term ending, we see you on a panel that is appointed by an institution that you are leading or an entity that you are leading. It is uh, very unscrupulous in my opinion. We need to change that and I think that's what we need to leave in the legacy report that the Higher Education Act needs to be amended where that is concerned. On university councils, I have very great respect for uh, auto, uh, um, institutional autonomy. I have great respect for that. However, I feel that there are certain areas of conflict of interest that cannot be managed within the current statutory framework. And one of the areas that is of interest to me is to insert a clause in the Higher Education Act that in, in instances where counsel is conflicted on any matter, there needs to be an intervention by an independent body where appointment of panels, whether it be independent panels of judges, independent panels of investigation, someone independent of the situation needs to be tasked with the duty of appointing an arbiter. Because you can't be a referee and a player. Our democracy doesn't allow for that. And so councils um, in our uh, country are able to be delinquent, and I'll use the word loosely. They're able to be delinquent, mm -hmm. uh, not perform their fiduciary duties, mismanage a university, and then be expected to be the ones who investigate themselves. They appoint a panel that they pay. It's paid by them to investigate them. I've never seen such a, a conflict of interest, if ever there was any. And so the, in our legacy report, we need to leave a message to the coming administration to look at amending the act so that this institutional autonomy does not become prone and open to abuse by people who are openly delinquent in their dealings with our ideational space, spaces and centers of knowledge production. When there's a mess someone else needs to deal with, how to investigate, who is going to investigate, when is the investigation going to happen, not the university council themselves. Also, Chair, I want to make a, a suggestion that in our legacy report, also add, and I think this is something you also mentioned that might be at the risk of repeating you, that the process, and I think uh, it was spoken by Professor here on the screen, the process of putting together councils needs to be clarified in how it's done. Because what we see is that councils have become a field of jostling for power. So when terms are close to ending, you see a lot of uh, power jostling. And so the academic program of the university stands still because people are now focused on who's going to take over this thing, who's going to be chair, who's going to be deputy chair, who's going to be running the show, who's going to have the quorum, the majority. And that brings politics in a space that should be rid of politics. And it, it is my take that we should, 
we should we should remove politics from universities by ensuring that there is a standardized process of the appointment of councils. And if you ask me, it should be handled external of the universities so that there's no politics. There's start knowledge all the way. I think on NSFAS, I'm covered uh, with, uh, with the legacy report, uh, Chair. And I would want to say before I sit down, that in, in lieu of the report, the legacy report we've just presented, and I want to juxtapose it with the public perception out there. The public perception is that we are not doing anything much. And I want to ask the question that do we as the house here representing the whole PZ sector agree with the public perception that we have done nothing much over the last 30 years? Do we agree with, the, with that view? And I'm asking this to people who are the converted, people who are tasked with the responsibilities of authority in the sector. If your answer is a doubtful yes, then it means wherever you are placed in the corner of the peace sector, you are failing to deliver that which the people, including yourself, are looking for from us. I say we are public representatives here. We are elected, we are not appointed. And we sit here at the behest of the people of South Africa. On the other hand, you who are seated on the floor are appointed presumably on the basis of merit. We presume that you are there because you qualified better than the other person who went to the interview with you. And because of our legal framework, the bulk of, and, and I will say this here for record, the bulk of the power to implement programs that we as public representatives agree on from a policy position, the power sits with you. Signatures on anything that has to do with the movement of money is yours. Procurement is done by you. Administration is done by you. In actual fact, the law calls many of you accounting officers, recognized by law. You are the first person the Auditor General writes to. They, they don't write to the minister, they write to you. And therefore, public perception says when government is messed up, it's us. It's the representatives they elect. But pragmatically, Chair, the mess happens at arm's length from us. And I want to give this example. When we started, and the Chair was Honorable Philemon Mapula, we had a lot of resistance, especially from the university sector, in respecting the committee. And it, it almost was a, a common thing that if people had their diaries set on something and parliament called them, they, they would inadvertently not move their diary uh, appointments because they are being called by parliament. And we had to apply extraordinary mechanisms allowed for by law to subpoena people who you think should know the authority of parliament and how the state organized. I want to say that, Chair, maybe in the legacy report, we must leave this message 
that anyone who falls under the ambit of parliamentary oversight respects parliament. And two, maybe we need to have teeth put into the acts that allow for oversight of parliament over departments and over entities and organs of state in whatever capacity. We need to, be, to have teeth put into the act because the resistance and the disrespect we have experienced, and I will say this for record keeping, the disrespect we have experienced from the sector is precisely because parliament has been treated as a by the way leg of the state. It's as if it's not equal to the court. It's as if it's not equal to, ex to the executive. It's as if we are some stepchild of some uh, uh, of, of some uh, mistake when the legislators for the organizing of the state were concerned. It's as if parliament was just a by the way. It needs to be communicated in no uncertain terms that parliament needs to be recorded, accorded respect the same way respect is accorded to ministers, the president. The same way that people accord respect to the courts and the orders of court, they must accord respect to parliament. Because we don't want to move to, a, to an era where we are punitive in conducting our oversight work. Just Judge Zondo, the, 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 the now Chief Justice, in the Zondo Commission was clear that many things happened because parliament was either asleep or it was, it has relegated its duty to somewhere else. And so I want to express that, Chair, in the legacy report, these are things I would want to see. But those who have done well, we thank you for your work. Those who are trying, please do better. Those who are failing, please try and get better. Those who are obstinately refusing to change and do better, please pack and go home. We are unapologetic. We have paid too much for the sins of the administration as public representatives. We are now sitting on knife's edge, some of us, from where we are deployed, on how we are going to perform. Because the, per the, the perception is that we are failing, Honorable Lizzie. But we know that it's not us. It's not us. I've never signed for a budget. I've only ever voted for it. I don't spend money. We only hold people who spend the money accountable. And it is those who do so who mess us up egregiously. It doesn't matter who takes over. If this thing persists, we are not going to go anywhere fast enough. Thank you very much, Chair President. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Honorable Yabo, he was warning me that I must speak for five minutes. I was surprised when he goes on for, <laughs> for more than 30 minutes. So in fact, he was actually saying to me, I'm going to take some of your minutes and use them. <laughs> so good enough. So th uh, I won't take time when I chair, uh, as we are uh, approaching the closer or the end of our term. Indeed, there are good things that we have done as a portfolio committee. And then also there are good, some of the things that we should have done and we did not do them. And we must acknowledge and appreciate the good work that has been done because we are here for that. We are not here for many, for many things. But we must highlight some of the things that we think we, uh, the next... Um, uh, uh, parliament must look at. You know, in our institutions of violating, we've got a serious problem of gender-based violence. And if you check in that process, the issue of gender-based violence is overlooked. And when it's overlooked, every day we've got incidents and we've got issues happening in our campuses, Tibet colleges and universities regarding the issue of gender-based violence. And it is not only students to a student who are actually abusing each other. Sometimes it goes beyond to find that lecturers or professors 
are also the ones that are actually doing these things to our students. Because I've got a case at uh, UCT of a, a student who was raped by a professor. And if there's UCT here, they will know what I'm talking about. Who was raped by a professor, and she went to open a case. Then UCT management, in protection of the, of the, of the professor, approached the student and said to the student, can you please withdraw the case? And even went to an extent of wanting to offer money to the students, for the students to withdraw the case. And they even went further to go and open a counter case against the students, knowing very well that it's this professor who's actually uh, at wrong. So these are the, some of the things that the next parliament must look at these things of uh, 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 professors, lecturers, and teachers, everyone abusing students and management becomes the be the ones that are protecting the staff for that matter when it is the students who are actually suffering on the ground so also we must look at the issue of the comprehensive student funding that is responsive to the skills needed in south africa and that everything in all these things in the center of everything we must be able to speak about free, quality, and well-resourced education in the next uh, parliament. Because education, when we speak of free education, chair, we must speak of free education for all. Everyone deserves free education. And one will be sitting there to say, but these people, they always speak of free education, but education must be funded. Uh, there must be money that comes from somewhere to fund education. We are well aware. But to begin with, nationalize the banks, the mines, and all strategic sectors of the economy, you'll have money to fund education. Expropriate the land without compensation. You'll have money to fund education. And for that, if we want to go for extreme, all these public reps that which are for government, all the people who are doing business with government, who are doing business with the institutions of higher learning. There must be taxed a certain amount, and that money must be taken to fund ed I mean, free education that we are speaking of. I want to believe that the next parliament will also look at those things as we are about to leave ourselves. The students' accommodation, we've got a stress issue when it comes to the students' accommodation. We are speaking now, we've got students, they were striking. In fact, there was a crisis at uh, Etegweni Tivet College where students, almost if they did not sleep outside because uh, there was no enough or there's no enough uh, students' accommodation for the students and also because of NSFAS, which I'm still coming for them, whom they did not pay for this accommodation of these students. And majority of our students, they find themselves sleeping outside uh, uh, without accommodation. They are exposed to crime. They are exposed to all manner of things that you can imagine of. If they don't get raped, they, they get killed. If they don't get killed, they get robbed. And many things are happening to these students because there's no accommodation available for them. So we need to also look at that one. Before I come to NSFAS, I want to also speak about this chair that I was so painful or hurt when I went to Mutewa Tivet College beginning of the year. I arrived there. There's a long queue of first years who want to go and uh, get acceptance letters and be accepted by the institution. There. When I get there, I ask, why is this queue not moving? But no, they've closed the gate. They are no longer allowing anyone to get inside. I went inside, I wanted to understand what is the issue, why did he close the gate when we've got a lot of students outside who are not uh, being assisted, but we don't have space anymore to accommodate these people. Our space is actually full. I asked, but what, these people did not, they did not apply or they just come here uh, uh, without applying, but no, some of these people have applied. And when they've applied like that, we don't have space for them. The problem of them not having space for these people, and which they will agree with me because they are here at Muteo College, is that metric results came very late. 
And when these kids receive the metric results, Mutewa Tivet College, at some point, they've already started with what? With their registration process. There are some intakes that they are busy taking. There are some people whom they applied last year and graduated maybe last year or last of last year and could not get a space. And now they are busy getting a space and they're taking a space of these kids who have applied. But now they can't go to Mutewa and register because they are still awaiting their metric what? results. So I want this uh, 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 higher education to work together hand in hand with the basic education chair. And we must be very strict that when the metric results comes out, let's go back to the previous system that was used to say, let's get back the metric results early and let the students get their metric result early so that we don't face these things that institutions open the registration while we are waiting for students to receive their metric results. And by the time they go to universities, the space is already full for them to get the space. And then I'm, I'm, I'm coming to my last point of NSFAS. You know, NSFAS is a problem. Uh, and they will remain a problem like that because they don't listen and they don't want to be led. And they actually undermine everyone sitting here. But we want to warn you that uh, in the next parliament, if you continue the way you are continuing, we are going to have serious problems. It's good because this year we are going for elections now. Maybe there will be change of government. And let me assure you that if that change of government comes, we won't be having NSFAS here because this thing of NSFAS is not assisting. It's not assisting in a way that you speak to these people today. They pretend as if they hear you today. They go back and sit at home and do the same thing that you want them not to do to our student. And you ask yourself, but who are we talking to here? Maybe when we come to the issue of free education, we are going to resolve this issue of NSFAS. There won't be NSFAS if we've got free education. Because this NSFAS, it was meant to resolve the issue of free education. But it becomes a problem to our kids. We are speaking now. There are students who haven't actually uh, 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 registered. And they were blocked to register because NSFAS haven't paid their last year uh, 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 tuition fees, accommodation fees. Even food for that matter, some of the students even went home without them being paid for anything that which is actually due to them. So, NSFAS, we know you are led by uh, uh, incompetent people. And they will remain incompetent like that because they don't listen when they get advices from other people. So, please, go back and see yourself. And Chair, these things of NSFAS having acting, 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 it will be, a, it's becoming a problem now in NSFAS. Those things must be resolved. We must have a CEO. We must have all uh, uh, managerial positions be the people who are appointed when stop these things of acting because if you act, you are not sure whether you've got a job or not. And you may want to remain acting forever because you don't know who's going to come and take over that position of yours. And you won't do anything better to better the, li I mean, to better the lives of our students on the ground. So let's get the real people there appointed permanently so to be the ones working there. Maybe the problems we are having at NSFAS will be resolved because we've got too much acting people there at NSFAS. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long session, so I won't take your time. Um, Chairperson, when we talk about the legislation that was not before this committee, that is actually concerning. And I would recommend for the seventh parliament that they also get involved with the amendments of any legislation that takes place, because that is the role of who we are as members of parliament. Um, also, Chairperson, um, I would recommend that we make a committee report of the draft policy on higher education institutional types. Um, I listened to most of the stakeholders, and that would actually also address the issue when we are going to say we must have an overview of um, the Higher Education Act and the Continuous Education and Training Act because that would then link the two as in one act if that 
policy should actually be brought before Parliament. Um, Chairperson, what I would also like to see in the report is that we should mention that there must be a better relationship that must be built between the De Department of Higher Education and USEF. Um, because I feel that's the, the issue that needs to be addressed um, for them to have an amicable relationship going forward. Then also, Chair, what I would like to see in the report, OTAS was very instrumental in ensuring that we have an in-depth understanding of certain issues going on at NESVAS. I actually then would like to suggest that the Seventh Parliament needs to look at also inviting advocacy groups in the higher education space in also to get their point of view on how to move forward. Um, then you've, we've spoken at length about the AG and all of that, so I'm not going to mention it. Then one thing that is of interest for, to me, Chair, um, we are forgetting that we have a 12th language in South Africa, which we've approved. Every time we go on television, we do not even see a sign language interpreter. And I think that section um, needs to be included um, as a suggested way forward. And then lastly, Chairperson, um, I would like to say that because we see there is capacity challenges in terms of enrollment, applications received um, at higher education, at public institutions, um, it's important that we should also then mention the strengthening of private higher education institutions in order to fill the gap that is being left by public institutions and also then to fill the gap because when it comes to the racial composition, we do know that the minority groupings are not really much um, absorbed into public institutions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and let me greet the House again. Uh, I think one would want to say that I was mostly covered by members, and indeed, NESFAS is a problem. I would leave it at that, so that I don't actually, you know, uh, disturb the meeting and the minds, because if you speak about NESFAS, you would think about the disadvantaged people at the rural, there are so many things. Uh, that are disturbing. But DG, one would want to say that let your home be known by everybody, that it is a responsive uh, department in terms of crisis because it is only known by us, not the country. So if the whole country knows about the war room, uh, Honorable Mkacho, people won't give you emails time and again, but they would know specifically who they have to speak to. I think colleagues, from my side, I want to actually appreciate and acknowledge your participations as uh, sectors that some of us here, you actually urged us to make sure that we read your reports and we interrogate you. It is because of yourselves putting efforts, DG, and your collective that we couldn't come just unprepared and say that I'm going to ask one, two, three. Some of us, we even tested uh, things that we could have studied, like your public management, in terms of how to operationalize it. Because we couldn't understand when an AG report comes and says that there's repetitive offenders in terms of a uh, lack of records, incompetency, compliance, and stuff. Because we believe that all of us, as we are here, it is possible to be constructive institutionalist and revolutionarist in terms of advancing the country. So I want to employ to yourself to say that not all is lost. I want you, as you will be continuing doing your work, put yourselves in the shoes of a politician. Because as Honorable Bafuse would have said, you don't feel the pinch that you are feeling as we get door to door and say, vote for one, two, three. So put yourselves just in our shoes so that you would be able to just do the justice. I, I, I believe you, you managed to do the uh, zero pack lock that we actually sold as an idea that it's possible. Now we don't have people who have pending issues in terms of the pack lock. 
So with corruption, it's possible. And I believe that, uh, Honorable Bafuze, DG, uh, we can still have public servant that are anti-corruption generally. And if we can have that, I don't think we would have whistleblowers, we would have outer, we would have a sensational SIU that keeps on dropping things as it when they want to. Because people would be just doing their just, not stealing, uh, dealing with these issues that uh, you get a ghost, a person who has long passed away benefiting, I mean, it's not on. But again, I want to acknowledge and thank you for understanding that when the president said that GBVF is a pandemic, you adapted to it and made it a point that higher health becomes responsive in terms of issues of mental health and other issues, DG. Uh, Member Fuchan, I think you must note this thing that we are doing as a proposal that let us look at the feasibilities of a CET social support that would actually deal with the uh, necessities like your sanitary towels. Be be because we know as a girl child, uh, if you would have a challenge on that part, you would really m miss a lot. You would even give yourself to these uh, uh, sugar daddies and, and uh, you know, result to other social ills. So it is important that things that we think that they can help Jane to stick in the classroom and otherwise let us do it. We cannot speak uh, too much about issue here, articulation, uloya, basic education up until to uh, universities. I think it's something that leadership must do. Agree and see what is it that you, you, you can do. Some of us, we became the champion of this sector, DG. Honorable Lizzi adopted VUT. Uh, Honorable Mkaja adopted Southwest uh, College. You know, I'm a regular as well at West Call because of we wanted to see things happening because of we understood that ourselves as, as partners, we would be able to change uh, uh, the turnaround uh, 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 time in terms of the response of driving service delivery. So we, I don't want to say much, but one would want to say, Honorable Mkacha, with all that has been said here, uh, I want to move and fully adopt the, this particular report with the amendments and annexures that will be submitted by yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mananisa. Um, and thank you very much to all honorable members for your comments, your recommendations. Um, for Honorable King, I'd see we must, how's it seen? I'm a private institutions. We're already struggling to hold these universities that call themselves public universities to account. I don't know uh, what we're going to do <laughs> when we then venture into something with private universities. But nonetheless, her concern is understood and the concern is that the, the demand is massive and the space is not enough. Um, Thank you very much, members, for all your comments. I think Memudiba has, has captured them, and Anele, I think they've both captured them, so they will be somehow, some of them, I mean, are in the, are in the report already. I think colleagues were just emphasizing. Uh, some of them, like what, what Honorable Yabo spoke to around um, some of the changes we could make, amendments we could make to the act. Uh, even Honorable King, you, you, you've spoken to the fact that we haven't been able to do legislative work under the PSET uh, portfolio, so that needs to be looked into. Um, yeah, I think there's nothing else for me to repeat, uh, but those, those recommendations and comments from members are well acknowledged. Colleagues, we also note that there are some members or colleagues who are on the Zoom platform, so we note uh, the comments that they have made. I think it's the, the VC of uh, NMU, but it was a colleague from the NMU who made a comment. We acknowledge that as well. 
This brings us to the end of our meeting. I want to thank all of you who've been able to stay way beyond the time of which we had said we would end. Um, your commitment is really appreciated. Um, huh? Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to, since Honorable Mananiso moved for the adoption of the legacy report, I would like to note a hand. Um, we will take that, we'll take the quorum we had from the start of the meeting, because we did have quorum right at the beginning. I know Honorable Shukwamban is in the restroom. I know that we have one or two members on the virtual platform. So, um, can I please note a hand that seeks to adopt, to second the adoption of the legacy report, Honorable Litsie. Um, so it is adopted as it stands at this point in time by Honorable Mananiso and seconded by Honorable Litsie. Um, but of course we look for the contributions that colleagues are going to make to the report. Um, and, and, and that is really in strengthening the work of the seventh administration. But so for us to also, as, as the collective of the sixth administration, to show off about the work that we have done. Colleagues have spoken about issues relating to infrastructure. I actually don't think the infrastructure in our sector is bad. After you, you know when you go on oversight, we went to Forte recently, and I've always received such bad r r reports on what's happening at Forte. Forte just needs maintenance. The infrastructure is solid. Solid, solid, solid. The, the older races, the new ones are actually more problematic. And we also need to be so careful about the people we give opportunities to build infrastructure in our sector. We are stuck now with those jail-like uh, residences there at Forte. But in essence, really, the infrastructure is solid. I mean, even if I think of Coastal Tivet College, I think of Capricorn Tivet, um, think of all our universities, Unizulu, uh, I think of, which is the one we went to recently? Um, uh, Mangosutu University, no, no, not Mangosutu, Walter Sisulu University. Um, solid infrastructure. Yes, the residences are old and they need an overhaul. That's all they need. Some paint, some plumbing, some, you know, and then it's back to how they were in 19 um, and what really also is inspiring is for us to see with that in the case of Walter Susulu, we saw some renovations have been done and they've been done well. You know, they, you, I don't think there's gonna be a leakage. Of course, students haven't taken occupation yet, but maybe they have now that institutions are open. But when we went to do our oversight, the renovations looked like they were done well. And I generally am confident that they, there's not going to be a leakage at any, you know. Of course, when you build, you know, there's new, new infrastructure problems and old infrastructure problems. So they might pick up on one or two things, but overall, we, are, we were brought into confidence that the renovations were done on time and that there's something concrete that we can see. Um, NASFAS will continue to work with yourselves, colleagues. We will meet the day in which we don't see the problems that we see at NASFAS, because it's those little problems that make us feel like we're not doing a lot of work at NASFAS, but to fund over 1.1 million students with the billions we're allocating towards NASFAS is something we must not take for granted, and we do want to see the day in which free education for the poor and the missing middle is realized. We want to see our strengthened governance and management structures. We want to see increased stakeholder relations. We want to learn from our COVID responses. We want to see increased gender transformation, not a transformation that wants to just change the look of the sector, but a transformation that will sustain the, tra the look of the sector that is transformed. We are not okay with the fact that women come in and out of our sector, and we don't even understand why exactly non-disclosure agreements for me now because how do we then learn from lessons of the past? How do we then know what should not happen in the future to ensure that the transformation we want to see in the sector um, does take place? We um, we want to, of course, acknowledge the great work done by CETAs in some regard, but say, colleagues, you can do much more. That includes NASFAS. Um, we want to see the 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 seventh administration give alternative forms of dealing with challenges as opposed to putting institutions under administration. That is not what we find to be the ultimate solution and we know the minister has been struggling with this. Um, 
And we note that the TVETs also have their own legislation changes or amendments that they want to make. They want a little bit more autonomy for them to be able to be responsive to their day-to-day -day needs. Um, we, we note, of course, the issues around uh, the uh, investigating Investiga external investigators that are appointed by those that are being investigated being a really big problem. And I want to say, colleagues, I don't think politics is the problem. Young people, you know, say, yeah, I'm not into politics, but politics is everywhere. What's a problem is factionalism, what's a problem is patronage, what's a problem is toxic politics. Um, but we should not move towards an, a, a society that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, removes politics from the day-to-day -day realities of life. We live in a political world. Um, so colleagues, thank you so much. Thank you to the Tinsualos. Thank you to members of the committee, every single one of you. Thank you to DG and his team. Thank you to the principals, the council chairs, the uh, CEOs, the board chairpersons, and to the entire sector, to the students to the students, to the students who make sure that we are able to have the responsibilities. I'm not gonna call it jobs. I'm gonna call it the responsibilities that we have. We have come to the end of our meeting. I'd like to request that if there are any uh, colleagues that are left, uh, chairpersons of CETA, CEOs and so forth, if we could take a picture before we leave with those members who are still here. Um, and then lunch is served, um, I think I'm told in the cafeteria, this side. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.